Captain Black had boundless faith in the wisdom, power, and justice of Major de Coverley, even though he had never spoken to him before and still found himself without the courage to do so. He deputized Milo to speak to Major de Coverley for him and stormed about impatiently as he waited for the tall executive officer to return. Along with everyone else in the squadron, he lived in profound awe and reverence of the majestic, white-haired major with craggy face and Jehovian bearing, who came back from Rome finally with an injured eye inside a new celluloid eye patch and smashed his whole glorious crusade to bits with a single stroke. Milo carefully said nothing when Major de Coverley stepped into the mess hall with his fierce and austere dignity the day he returned and found his way blocked by a wall of officers waiting in line to sign loyalty oaths. At the far end of the food counter, a group of men who had arrived earlier were pledging allegiance to the flag, with trays of food balanced in one hand in order to be allowed to take seats at the table. Already at the tables, a group that had arrived still earlier was singing the Star-Spangled Banner in order that they might use the salt and pepper and ketchup there. The hubbub began to subside slowly as Major... De Coverley paused in the doorway with a frown of puzzled disapproval, as though viewing something bizarre. He started forward in a straight line, and the wall of officers before him parted like the Red Sea. Glancing neither left nor right, he strode indomitably up to the steam counter, and in a clear, full-bodied voice that was gruff with age and resonant with ancient eminence and authority, said, Gimme eat! Instead of eat, Corporal Snark gave Major de Coverley a loyalty oath to sign. Major de Coverley swept it away with mighty displeasure the moment he recognized what it was, his good eye flaring up blindingly with fiery disdain, and his enormous old corrugated face darkening in mountainous wrath. Gimme it, I said, he ordered loudly in harsh tones that rumbled ominously through the silent tent like claps of distant thunder. Corporal Snark turned pale and began to tremble. He glanced toward Milo pleadingly for guidance. For several terrible seconds there was not a sound. Then Milo nodded. Give him eat, he said. Corporal Snark began giving Major de Coverley eat. Major... De Coverley turned from the counter with his tray full and came to a stop. His eyes fell on the groups of other officers gazing at him in mute appeal, and with righteous belligerence he roared, Give everybody eat! Give everybody eat! Milo echoed with joyful relief, and the glorious loyalty oath crusade came to an end. Captain Black was deeply disillusioned by this treacherous stab in the back from someone in high place upon whom he had relied so confidently for support. Major de Coverley had let him down. Oh, it doesn't bother me a bit, he responded cheerfully to everyone who came to him with sympathy. We completed our task. Our purpose was to make everyone we don't like afraid and to alert people to the danger of Major Major, and we certainly succeeded at that. Since we weren't going to let him sign loyalty oaths anyway, it doesn't really matter whether we have them or not. Seeing everyone in the squadron he didn't like afraid once again throughout the appalling, interminable great big siege of Bologna reminded Captain Black nostalgically of the good old days of his glorious loyalty oath crusade, when he had been a man of real consequence, and when even big shots like Milo Minderbender, Dr. Nika, and Pilchard and Wren had trembled at his approach and groveled at his feet. To prove to newcomers that he really had been a man of consequence once, he still had the letter of commendation he had received from Colonel Cathcart. Chapter 12 Bologna Actually, it was not Captain Black, but Sergeant Knight who triggered the solemn panic of Bologna, slipping silently off the truck for two extra flak suits as soon as he learned the target and signaling the start of the grim procession back into the parachute tent that degenerated into a frantic stampede finally before all the extra flak suits were gone. Hey, what's going on? Kid Sampson asked nervously. Bologna can't be that rough, can it? Nately, sitting trance-like on the floor of the truck, 
held his grave young face in both hands and did not answer him. It was Sergeant Knight and the cruel series of postponements, for just as they were climbing up into their planes that first morning, along came a jeep with the news that it was raining in Bologna and that the mission would be delayed. It was raining in Pianosa, too, by the time they returned to the squadron, and they had the rest of that day to stare woodenly at the bomb line on the map under the awning of the intelligence tent and ruminate hypnotically on the fact that there was no escape. The evidence was there vividly in the narrow red ribbon tacked across the mainland. The ground forces in Italy were pinned down 42 insurmountable miles south of the target and could not possibly capture the city in time. Nothing could save the men in Pianosa from the mission to Bologna. They were trapped. Their only hope was that it would never stop raining, and they had no hope because they all knew it would. When it did stop raining in Pianosa, it rained in Bologna. When it stopped raining in Bologna, it began again in Pianosa. If there was no rain at all, there were freakish, inexplicable phenomena like the epidemic of diarrhea or the bomb line that moved. Four times during the first six days they were assembled and briefed and then sent back. Once they took off and were flying in formation when the control tower summoned them down. The more it rained, the worse they suffered. The worse they suffered, the more they prayed that it would continue raining. All through the night men looked at the sky and were saddened by the stars. All through the day, they looked at the bomb line on the big wobbling easel map of Italy that blew over in the wind and was dragged in under the awning of the intelligence tent every time the rain began. The bomb line was a scarlet band of narrow satin ribbon that delineated the forwardmost position of the Allied ground forces in every sector of the Italian mainland. The morning after Hungry Joe's fistfight with Hoople's cat, the rain stopped falling in both places. The landing strip began to dry. It would take a full 24 hours to harden, but the sky remained cloudless. The resentments incubating in each man hatched into hatred. First they hated the infantrymen on the mainland because they had failed to capture Bologna. Then they began to hate the bomb line itself. For hours they stared relentlessly at the scarlet ribbon on the map and hated it because it would not move up high enough to encompass the city. When night fell, they congregated in the darkness with flashlights, continuing their macabre vigil at the bomb line in brooding entreaty, as though hoping to move the ribbon up by the collective weight of their sullen prayers. I really can't believe it, Clevenger exclaimed to Yossarian in a voice rising and falling in protest and wonder. It's a complete reversion to primitive superstition. They're confusing cause and effect. It makes as much sense as knocking on wood or crossing your fingers. They really believed that we wouldn't have to fly that mission tomorrow if someone would only tiptoe up to the map in the middle of the night and move the bomb line over Bologna. Can you imagine? You and I must be the only rational ones left. In the middle of the night, Yossarian knocked on wood, crossed his fingers, and tiptoed out of his tent to move the bomb line up over Bologna. Corporal Kolodny tiptoed stealthily into Captain Black's tent early the next morning, reached inside the mosquito net, and gently shook the moist shoulder blade he found there until Captain Black opened his eyes. Oh, what are you waking me up for? whimpered Captain Black. Oh, they captured Bologna, sir, said Corporal Kolodny. I thought you'd want to know. Is the mission cancelled? Captain Black tugged himself erect and began scratching his scrawny, long thighs methodically. In a little while, he dressed and emerged from his tent, squinting, cross and unshaven. The sky was clear and warm. He peered without emotion at the map. Sure enough, they had captured Bologna. Inside the intelligence tent, Corporal Kolodny was already removing the maps of Bologna from the navigation kits. Captain Black seated himself with a loud yawn, lifted his feet to the top of his desk, and phoned Colonel Korn. What are you waking me up for? whimpered Colonel Korn. They captured Bologna during the night, sir. Is the mission cancelled? What are you talking about, Black? Colonel Korn growled. Why should the mission be cancelled? Because they captured Bologna, sir. Isn't the mission cancelled? Of course the mission is cancelled. Do you think we're bombing our own troops now? Oh, what are you waking me up for? Colonel Cathcart whimpered to Colonel Korn. They captured Bologna, Colonel Korn told him. I thought you'd want to know. Who captured Bologna? We did. Colonel Cathcart was overjoyed. 
for he was relieved of the embarrassing commitment to bomb Bologna, without blemish to the reputation for valour he had earned by volunteering his men to do it. General Dreedle was pleased with the capture of Bologna, too, although he was angry with Colonel Mudas for waking him up to tell him about it. Headquarters was also pleased and decided to award a medal to the officer who captured the city. There was no officer who had captured the city, so they gave the medal to General Peckham instead, because General Peckham was the only officer with sufficient initiative to ask for it. As soon as General Peckham had received his medal, he began asking for increased responsibility. It was General Peckham's opinion that all combat units in the theater should be placed under the jurisdiction of the Special Service Corps, of which General Peckham himself was the commanding officer. If dropping bombs on the enemy was not a special service, he reflected aloud frequently with the martyred smile of sweet reasonableness that was his loyal confederate in every dispute, then he could not help wondering what in the world was. With amiable regret, he declined the offer of a combat post under General Dreedle. Flying combat missions for General Dreedle is not exactly what I had in mind, he explained indulgently with a smooth laugh. I was thinking more in terms of uh, replacing General Dreedle, or perhaps of something above General Dreedle, where I could exercise supervision over a great many other generals, too. You see, my most precious abilities are mainly administrative ones. I have a happy facility for getting different people to agree. He has a happy facility for getting different people to agree what a prick he is. Colonel Cargill confided invidiously to XPFC Wintergreen in the hope that XPFC Wintergreen would spread the unfavorable report along through 27th Air Force headquarters. If anyone deserves that combat post, I do. It was even my idea that we ask for the medal. You really want to go into combat? XPFC Wintergreen inquired. Combat? Colonel Cargill was aghast. Oh, no! You misunderstand me. Of course, I wouldn't actually mind going into combat, but my best abilities are mainly administrative ones. I, too, have a happy facility for getting different people to agree. He, too, has a happy facility for getting different people to agree what a prick he is, XPFC Wintergreen confided with a laugh to Yossarian after he had come to Pianosa to learn if it was really true about Milo and the Egyptian cotton. If anyone deserves a promotion, I do. Actually, he had risen already to ex-corporal, having shot through the ranks shortly after his transfer to 27th Air Force headquarters as a mail clerk and been busted right down to private for making odious, audible comparisons about the commissioned officers for whom he worked. The heady taste of success had infused him further with morality and fired him with ambition for loftier attainments. Do you want to buy some Zippo lighters? he asked Yossarian. They were stolen right from quartermaster. Does Milo know you're selling cigarette lighters? What's it his business? Milo's not carrying cigarette lighters too now, is he? He sure is, Yossarian told him. And his aren't stolen. Hmm. That's what you think, XPFC Wintergreen answered with a laconic snort. I'm selling mine for a buck a piece. What's he getting for his? A dollar and a penny. XPFC Wintergreen snickered triumphantly. Eh, I'd beat him every time, he gloated. Say, what about all that Egyptian cotton he stuck with? How much did he buy? All. In the whole world? Well, I'll be damned, XPFC Wintergreen crowed with malicious glee. What a dope. You were in Cairo with him. Why'd you let him do it? Me? Yossarian answered with a shrug. I have no influence on him. It was those teletype machines they have in all the good restaurants there. Milo had never seen a stock ticker before, and the quotation for Egyptian cotton happened to be coming in just as he asked the head waiter to explain it to him. Egyptian cotton, Milo said with that look of his. How much is Egyptian cotton selling for? The next thing I knew, he had bought the whole goddamn harvest. And now he can't unload any of it. He has no imagination. I can unload plenty of it in the black market if you'll make a deal. Well, Milo knows the black market. There's no demand for cotton. But there is a demand for medical supplies. I can roll the cotton up on wooden toothpicks and peddle them as sterile swabs. Will he sell to me at a good price? He won't sell to you at any price, Yossarian answered. 
He's pretty sore at you for going into competition with him. In fact, he's pretty sore at everybody for getting diarrhea last weekend and giving his mess hall a bad name. Say, you can help us. Yossarian suddenly seized his arm. Couldn't you forge some official orders on that mimeograph machine of yours and get us out of flying to Bologna? XPFC Wintergreen pulled away slowly with a look of scorn. Sure I could, he explained with pride. But I would never dream of doing anything like that. Why not? Because it's your job. We all have our jobs to do. My job is to unload these Zippo lighters at a profit, if I can, and pick up some cotton from Milo. Your job is to bomb the ammunition dumps at Bologna. But I'm going to be killed at Bologna, Yossarian pleaded. We're all going to be killed. Then you'll just have to be killed, replied XPFC Wintergreen. Why can't you be a fatalist about it the way I am? If I'm destined to unload these lighters at a profit and pick up some Egyptian cotton cheap from Milo, then that's what I'm going to do. And if you are destined to be killed over Bologna, then you're going to be killed, so you might just as well go out and die like a man. I hate to say this, you Syrian, but you're turning into a chronic complainer. Clevenger agreed with XPFC Wintergreen that it was Yossarian's job to get killed over Bologna, and was livid with condemnation when Yossarian confessed that it was he who had moved the bomb line and caused the mission to be cancelled. Why the hell not? Yossarian snarled, arguing all the more vehemently because he suspected he was wrong. Am I supposed to get my ass shot off just because the colonel wants to be a general? What about the men on the mainland? Clevenger demanded with just as much emotion. Are they supposed to get their asses shot off just because you don't want to go? Those men are entitled to air support. But not necessarily by me. Look, they don't care who knocks out those ammunition dumps. The only reason we're going is because that bastard Cathcart volunteered us. Oh, I know all that, Clevenger assured him, his gaunt face pale and his agitated brown eyes swimming in sincerity. But the fact remains that those ammunition dumps are still standing, you know very well that I don't approve of Colonel Cathcart any more than you do. Clevenger paused for emphasis, his mouth quivering, and then beat his fist down softly against his sleeping bag. But it's not for us to determine what targets must be destroyed, or who's to destroy them, or... Or who gets killed doing it, and why? Yes, even that. We have no right to question... You're insane. No right to question... Do you really mean that it's not my business how or why I get killed, and that it is Colonel Cathcart's? You really mean that? Yes, I do, Clevenger insisted, seeming unsure. There are men entrusted with winning the war who are in a much better position than we are to decide what targets have to be bombed. We are talking about two different things, Yossarian answered with exaggerated weariness. You are talking about the relationship of the Air Corps to the infantry, and I am talking about the relationship of me to Colonel Cathcart. You are talking about winning the war, and I am talking about winning the war and keeping alive. Exactly, Clevenger snapped smugly. And which do you think is more important? To whom? Yossarian shot back. Open your eyes, Clevenger. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference who wins the war to someone who's dead. Clevenger sat for a moment as though he'd been slapped. Congratulations, he exclaimed bitterly, the thinnest milk-white line enclosing his lips tightly in a bloodless, squeezing ring. I can't think of another attitude that could be depended upon to give greater comfort to the enemy. The enemy, retorted Yossarian with weighted precision, is anybody who's going to get you killed, no matter which side he's on, and that includes Colonel Cathcart. And don't you forget that, because the longer you remember it, the longer you might live. But Clevenger did forget it, and now he was dead. At the time, Clevenger was so upset by the incident that Yossarian did not dare tell him he had also been responsible for the epidemic of diarrhea that had caused the other unnecessary postponement. Milo was even more upset by the possibility that someone had poisoned his squadron again, and he came bustling fretfully to Yossarian for assistance. Please find out from Corporal Snark if he put laundry soap in the sweet potatoes again, he requested furtively. Corporal Snark trusts you, and will tell you the truth if you give him your word you won't tell anyone else. As soon as he tells you, come and tell me. Of course I put laundry soap in the sweet potatoes, Corporal Snark admitted to Yossarian. That's what you asked me to do, isn't it? Laundry soap is the best way. He swears to God he didn't have a thing to do with it, Yossarian reported back to Milo. 
Milo pouted dubiously. Dunbar says there is no God. There was no hope left. By the middle of the second week, everyone in the squadron began to look like Hungry Joe, who was not scheduled to fly and screamed horribly in his sleep. He was the only one who could sleep. All night long, men moved through the darkness outside their tents, like tongueless wraiths with cigarettes. In the daytime, they stared at the bomb line in futile, drooping clusters, or at the still figure of Doc Danica sitting in front of the closed door of the medical tent beneath the morbid, hand-lettered sign. They began to invent humorless, glum jokes of their own and disastrous rumors about the destruction awaiting them at Bologna. Yossarian sidled up drunkenly to Colonel Korn at the officers' club one night to kid with him about the new Lepage gun that the Germans had moved in. What Lepage gun? Colonel Korn inquired with curiosity. The new 344 millimeter Lepage glue gun, Yossarian answered. It glues are all formation of planes together in midair. Colonel Korn jerked his elbow free from Yossarian's clutching fingers in startled affront. Let go of me, you idiot! He cried out furiously, glaring with vindictive approval as Nately leaped upon Yossarian's back and pulled him away. Who is that lunatic, anyway? Colonel Cathcart chortled merrily. That's the man you made me give a medal to after Ferrara. You had me promote him to captain, too, remember? It serves you right. Nately was lighter than Yossarian and had great difficulty maneuvering Yossarian's lurching bulk across the room to an unoccupied table. Are you crazy? Nately kept hissing with trepidation. That was Colonel Korn. Are you crazy? Yossarian wanted another drink and promised to leave quietly if Nately brought him one. Then he made Nately bring him two more. When Nately finally coaxed him to the door, Captain Black came stomping in from outside, banging his sloshing shoes down hard on the wood floor and spilling water from his eaves like a high roof. Boy, are you bastards in for it, he announced exuberantly, splashing away from the puddle forming at his feet. I just got a call from Colonel Corn. Do you know what they've got waiting for you at Bologna? Ha, ha, ha. They've got the new Lepage glue gun. It glues a whole formation of planes together in midair. Oh, my God, it's true! Yossarian shrieked and collapsed against Nately in terror. There is no God, answered Dunbar calmly, coming up with a slight stagger. Hey, give me a hand with him, will you? I've got to get him back in his tent. Says who? Says me. Gee, look at the rain. We've got to get a car. Steal Captain Black's car, said Yossarian. That's what I always do. We can't steal anybody's car. Since you began stealing the nearest car every time you wanted one, nobody leaves the ignition on. Hop in, said Chief White Halfout, driving up drunk in a covered jeep. He waited until they had crowded inside and then spurted ahead with a suddenness that rolled them all over backward. He roared with laughter at their curses. He drove straight ahead when he left the parking lot and rammed the car into the embankment on the other side of the road. The others piled forward in a helpless heap and began cursing him again. I forgot to turn, he explained. Be careful, will you? Nately cautioned. You'd better put your headlights on. Chief White Halfout pulled back in reverse, made his turn, and shot away up the road at top speed. The wheels were sibilant on the whizzing black top surface. Not so fast, urged Nately. You'd better take me to your squadron first so I can help you put him to bed. Then you can drive me back to my squadron. Who the hell are you? Dunbar. Hey, put your headlights on, Nately shouted, and watch the road. They are on. Isn't you Sarian in his car? That's the only reason I let the rest of you bastards in. Chief White Halfout turned completely around to stare into the back seat. Watch the road! You sorry honor. Is your sorry in here? I'm here, Chief. Let's go home, huh? What makes you so sure? You never answered my question. You see? I told you he was here. What question? Whatever it was we were talking about. Was it important? I don't remember if it was important or not. I wish to God I knew what it was. There is no God. That's what we were talking about, Yossarian cried. 
What makes you so sure? Hey, are you sure your headlights are on? Nately called out. They're on. They're on. What does he want from me? It's all this rain on the windshield that makes it look dark from back there. Beautiful, beautiful rain. I hope it never stops raining. Rain, rain, go away. Come again some other day. Little Yo-Yo wants to play in the meadow, in... Chief Whitehaver missed the next turn in the road and ran the jeep all the way up to the crest of a steep embankment. Rolling back down, the jeep turned over on its side and settled softly in the mud. There was a frightened silence. Is everyone all right? Chief Whitehaver inquired in a hushed voice. No one was injured, and he heaved a long sigh of relief. You know, that's my trouble. He groaned. I never listened to anybody. Somebody kept telling me to put my headlights on, but I just wouldn't listen. I kept telling you to put your headlights on. I know. I know. And I just wouldn't listen, would I? I wish I had a drink. I do have a drink. Look, it's not broken. It's raining in, Nately noticed. I'm getting wet. Chief White Halfout got the bottle of rye open, drank and handed it off. Lying tangled up on top of each other, they all drank but Nately, who kept groping ineffectually for the door handle. The bottle fell against his head with a clunk, and whiskey poured down his neck. He began writhing convulsively. Hey, we've got to get out of here, he cried. We'll all drown. Is anybody in there? asked Clevenger with concern, shining a flashlight down from the top. It's Clevenger, they shouted and tried to pull him in through the window as he reached down to aid them. Look at them, Clevenger exclaimed indignantly to McWatt, who sat grinning at the wheel of the staff car. Lying there like a bunch of drunken animals. You too, Nately, you ought to be ashamed. Come on, help me get them out of here before they all die of pneumonia. You know... That don't sound like such a bad idea, Chief White Halfout reflected. I think I will die of pneumonia. Why? Why not, answered Chief White Halfout, and lay back in the mud contentedly with a bottle of rye cuddled in his arms. Oh, now look what he's doing, Clevenger exclaimed with irritation. Will you get up and get into the car so we can all go back to the squadron? Oh, we can't all go back. Someone has to stay here to help the chief with this car he signed out of the motor pool. Chief White Halfout settled back in the staff car with an ebullient, prideful chuckle. That's Captain Black's car, he informed them jubilantly. I stole it from him at the officers' club just now with an extra set of keys he thought he lost this morning. Well, I'll be damned. That calls for a drink. Haven't you had enough to drink? Clevenger began scolding as soon as McWatt started the car. Look at you. You don't care if you drink yourselves to death or drown yourselves to death, do you? Just as long as we don't fly ourselves to death. Hey, open it up. Open it up, Chief White Halfout urged McWatt. And turn off the headlights. That's the only way to lower it. Dr. Nika is right, Clevenger went on. People don't know enough to take care of themselves. I really am disgusted with all of you. Okay, Fatmouth, out of the car, Chief White Halfout ordered. Everybody get out of the car but Yosarian. Where's Yosarian? Get the hell off me, Yosarian laughed, pushing him away. You're all covered with mud. Clevenger focused on Nately. You're the one who really surprises me. Do you know what you smell like? Instead of trying to keep him out of trouble, you get just as drunk as he is. Suppose he got in another fight with Appleby. Clevenger's eyes opened wide with alarm when he heard Eusarian chuckle. He didn't get in another fight with Appleby, did he? Not this time, said Dunbar. No, not this time. This time I did even better. This time he got in a fight with Colonel Korn. 
He didn't, gasped Clevenger. He did, exclaimed Chief White Halfout with delight. That calls for a drink. But that's terrible, Clevenger declared with deep apprehension. Why in the world did you have to pick on Colonel Corn? Say, what happened to the lights? Why is everything so dark? I turned them off, answered McGuart. You know, Chief White Halfout is right. It's much better with the headlights off. Are you crazy? Clevenger screamed and lunged forward to snap the headlights on. He whirled around upon Yossari in a near hysteria. You see what you're doing? You've got them all acting like you. Suppose it stops raining and we have to fly to Bologna tomorrow. You'll be in fine physical condition. It won't ever gonna stop raining. No, sir, it ran like this really might go on forever. It has stopped raining, someone said, and the whole car fell silent. You poor bastards, Chief White Halfout murmured compassionately after a few moments had passed. Did it really stop raining? Yossarian asked meekly. McWatt switched off the windshield wipers to make certain. The rain had stopped. The sky was starting to clear. The moon was sharp behind a gauzy brown mist. Oh, well, sang McWatt soberly. What the hell? Don't worry, fellas, Chief White Halfout said. The landing strip is too soft to use tomorrow. Maybe it'll start raining again before the field dries out. You goddamn stinking lousy son of a bitch! Hungry Joe screamed from his tent as they sped into the squadron. Oh, Jesus, is he back here tonight? I thought he was still in Rome with the courier ship. Oh! 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 Hungry Joe screamed. Chief White Halfout shuddered. That guy gives me the willies, he confessed in a grouchy whisper. Hey, whatever happened to Captain Flume? Oh, there's a guy that gives me the willies. I saw him in the woods last week eating wild berries. He never sleeps in his trailer anymore. He looked like hell. Hungry Joe's afraid he'll have to replace somebody who goes on sick call, even though there is no sick call. Did you see him the other night when he tried to kill Havermeyer and fell into Yossarian's slit trench? Oh, oh, screamed Hungry Joe. Oh, oh, oh. It sure is a pleasure not having Flume around in the mess hall anymore. No more of that pass the salt, Walt. Or pass the bread, Fred. Or shoot me a beat, Pete. Keep away. Keep away. Hungry Joe screamed. I said, keep away. Keep away, you goddamn stinking lousy son of a bitch. Well, at least we found out what he dreams about, Dunbar observed wryly. He dreams about goddamn stinking lousy sons of bitches. Late that night, Hungry Joe dreamed that Hoople's cat was sleeping on his face, suffocating him. And when he woke up, Hoople's cat was sleeping on his face. His agony was terrifying, the piercing, unearthly howl with which he split the moonlit dark, vibrating in its own impact for seconds afterward like a devastating shock. A numbing silence followed, and then a riotous din rose from inside his tent. Yossarian was among the first ones there. When he burst through the entrance, Hungry Joe had his gun out and was struggling to wrench his arm free from Hoople to shoot the cat, who kept spitting and fainting at him ferociously to distract him from shooting Hoople. Both humans were in their G.I. underwear. The unfrosted light bulb overhead was swinging crazily on its loose wire, and the jumbled black shadows kept swirling and bobbing chaotically so that the entire tent seemed to be reeling. Yossarian reached out instinctively for balance and then launched himself forward in a prodigious dive that crushed the three combatants to the ground beneath him. He emerged from the melee with the scruff of a neck in each hand, Hungry Joe's neck and the cat's. Hungry Joe and the cat glared at each other savagely. The cat spat viciously at Hungry Joe, and Hungry Joe tried to hit it with a haymaker. A fair fight, Yossarian decreed, and all the others who had come running to the uproar in horror began cheering ecstatically in a tremendous overflow of relief. We'll have a fair fight, he explained officially to Hungry Joe and the cat, after he had carried them both outside, still holding them apart by the scruffs of their necks. Fists, fangs, and claws, but no guns he warned Hungry Joe, and no spitting, he warned the cat sternly. When I turn you both loose, go. Break clean in the clinches and come back fighting. Go. There was a huge, giddy crowd of men who were avid for any diversion, 
but the cat turned chicken the moment Yazarian released him and fled from Hungry Joe ignominiously like a yellow dog. Hungry Joe was declared the winner. He swaggered away happily with the proud smile of a champion, his shriveled head high and his emaciated chest out. He went back to bed victorious and dreamed again that Hoople's cat was sleeping on his face, suffocating him. Chapter 13 Major de Coverley Moving the bomb line did not fool the Germans, but it did fool Major de Coverley, who packed his musette bag, commandeered an airplane, and under the impression that Florence, too, had been captured by the Allies, had himself flown to that city to rent two apartments for the officers and the enlisted men in the squadron to use on rest leaves. He had still not returned by the time Yossarian jumped back outside Major Major's office and wondered whom to appeal to next for help. Major de Coverley was a splendid, awe-inspiring, grave old man with a massive leonine head and an angry shock of wild white hair that raged like a blizzard around his stern, patriarchal face. His duties as squadron executive officer did consist entirely, as both Dr. Nika and Major Major had conjectured, of pitching horseshoes, kidnapping Italian laborers, and renting apartments for the enlisted men and officers to use on rest leaves, and he excelled at all three. Each time the fall of a city like Naples, Rome, or Florence seemed imminent, Major de Coverley would pack his musette bag, commandeer an airplane and a pilot, and have himself flown away, accomplishing all this without uttering a word by the sheer force of his solemn, domineering visage and the peremptory gestures of his wrinkled finger. A day or two after the city fell, he would be back with leases on two large and luxurious apartments there, one for the officers and one for the enlisted men, both already staffed with competent, jolly cooks and maids. A few days after that, newspapers would appear throughout the world with photographs of the first American soldiers bludgeoning their way into the shattered city through rubble and smoke. Inevitably, Major de Coverley was among them, seated straight as a ramrod in a jeep he had obtained from somewhere, glancing neither right nor left as the artillery fire burst about his invincible head, and lithe young infantrymen with carbines went loping up along the sidewalks in the shelter of burning buildings, or fell dead in doorways. He seemed eternally indestructible as he sat there surrounded by danger, his features molded firmly into that same fierce, regal, just and forbidding countenance which was recognized and revered by every man in the squadron. To German intelligence, Major de Coverley was a vexatious enigma. Not one of the hundreds of American prisoners would ever supply any concrete information about the elderly, white-haired officer with the gnarled and menacing brow and blazing, powerful eyes who seemed to spearhead every important advance so fearlessly and successfully. To American authorities, his identity was equally perplexing. A whole regiment of crack CID men had been thrown into the front lines to find out who he was while a battalion of combat-hardened public relations officers stood on red alert twenty-four hours a day, with orders to begin publicizing him the moment he was located. In Rome, Major de Coverley had outdone himself with the apartments. For the officers, who arrived in groups of four or five, there was an immense double room for each in a new white stone building, with three spacious bathrooms with walls of shimmering aquamarine tile, and one skinny maid named Michaela, who tittered at everything and kept the apartment in spotless order. On the landing below lived the obsequious owners. On the landing above lived the beautiful, rich, black-haired countess and her beautiful, rich, black-haired daughter-in-law, both of whom would put out only for Nately, who was too shy to want them, and for Arfie, who was too stuffy to take them and tried to dissuade them from ever putting out for anyone but their husbands, who had chosen to remain in the North with the family's business interests. They're really a couple of good kids, Arfie confided earnestly to Yossarian, whose recurring dream it was to have the nude, milk-white female bodies of both these beautiful, rich, black-haired good kids lying stretched out in bed erotically with him at the same time. The enlisted men descended upon Rome in gangs of twelve or more with gargantuan appetites and heavy crates filled with canned food for the women to cook and serve to them in the dining room of their own apartment on the sixth floor of a red brick building with a clinking elevator. There was always more activity at the enlisted men's place. There were always more enlisted men to begin with, and more women to cook and serve and sweep and scrub, 
and then there were always the gay and silly, sensual young girls that Yossarian had found and brought there, and those that the sleepy enlisted men returning to Pianosa after their exhausting seven-day debauch had brought there on their own and were leaving behind for whoever wanted them next. The girls had shelter and food for as long as they wanted to stay. All they had to do in return was hump any of the men who asked them to, which seemed to make everything just about perfect for them. Every fourth day or so, Hungry Joe came crashing in like a man in torment, hoarse, wild, and frenetic, if he had been unlucky enough to finish his missions again and was flying the courier ship. Most times he slept at the enlisted men's apartment. Nobody was certain how many rooms Major de Coverley had rented, not even the stout, black-bodiced woman in corsets on the first floor from whom he had rented them. They covered the whole top floor, and Eusarian knew they extended down to the fifth floor as well, for it was in Snowden's room on the fifth floor that he had finally found the maid in the lime-colored panties with a dust mop the day after Bologna, after Hungry Joe had discovered him in bed with Luciana at the officer's apartment that same morning and had gone running like a fiend for his camera. The maid in the lime-colored panties was a cheerful, fat, obliging woman in her mid-thirties, with squashy thighs and swaying hams in lime-colored panties that she was always rolling off for any man who wanted her. She had a plain, broad face and was the most virtuous woman alive. She laid for everybody, regardless of race, creed, color, or place of national origin, donating herself sociably as an act of hospitality, procrastinating not even for the moment it might take to discard the cloth or broom or dust mop she was clutching at the time she was grabbed. Her allure stemmed from her accessibility. Like Mount Everest, she was there, and the men climbed on top of her each time they felt the urge. Yossarian was in love with the maid in the lime-colored panties, because she seemed to be the only woman left he could make love to without falling in love with. Even the bald-headed girl in Sicily still evoked in him strong sensations of pity, tenderness, and regret. Despite the multiple perils to which Major de Coverley exposed himself each time he rented apartments, his only injury had occurred, ironically enough, while he was leading the triumphal procession into the open city of Rome, where he was wounded in the eye by a flower fired at him from close range by a seedy, cackling, intoxicated old man who like Satan himself, had then bounded up on Major de Coverley's car with malicious glee, seized him roughly and contemptuously by his venerable white head, and kissed him mockingly on each cheek, with a mouth reeking with sour fumes of wine, cheese, and garlic, before dropping back into the joyous celebrating throngs with a hollow, dry, excoriating laugh. Major De Coverley, a Spartan in adversity, did not flinch once throughout the whole hideous ordeal, and not until he had returned to Pianosa, his business in Rome completed, did he seek medical attention for his wound. He resolved to remain binocular, and specified to Dr. Nika that his eye patch be transparent, so that he could continue pitching horseshoes, kidnapping Italian laborers, and renting apartments with unimpaired vision. To the men in the squadron, Major De Coverley was a colossus, although they never dared tell him so. The only one who ever did dare address him was Milo Manderbender, who approached the horseshoe pitching pit with a hard-boiled egg his second week in the squadron and held it aloft for Major De Coverley to see. Major De Coverley straightened with astonishment at Milo's effrontery and concentrated upon him the full fury of his storming countenance with its rugged overhang of gullied forehead and huge crag of a humpbacked nose that came charging out of his face wrathfully like a Big Ten fullback. Milo stood his ground, taking shelter behind the hard-boiled egg raised protectively before his face like a magic charm. In time, the gale began to subside and the danger passed. What is that? Major de Coverley demanded at last. An egg, Milo answered. What kind of an egg? Major de Coverley demanded. A hard-boiled egg, Milo answered. What kind of a hard-boiled egg? Major de Coverley demanded. A fresh hard-boiled egg, Milo answered. Where did the fresh egg come from? Major de Coverley demanded. From a chicken, Milo answered. Where is the chicken? Major de Coverley demanded. The chicken is in Malta, Milo answered. 
How many chickens are there in Malta? Enough chickens to lay fresh eggs for every officer in the squadron at five cents apiece from the mess fund, Milo answered. I have a weakness for fresh eggs, Major de Coverley confessed. If someone put a plane at my disposal, I could fly down there once a week in a squadron plane and bring back all the fresh eggs we need, Milo answered. After all, Malta's not so far away. Malta's not so far away, Major de Coverley observed. You could probably fly down there once a week in a squadron plane and bring back all the fresh eggs we need. Yes, Milo agreed. I suppose I could do that, if someone wanted me to and put a plane at my disposal. I like my fresh eggs fried, Major de Coverley remembered, in fresh butter. I can find all the fresh butter we need in Sicily for twenty-five cents a pound, Milo answered. Twenty-five cents a pound for fresh butter is a good buy. There's enough money in the mess fund for butter, too, and we could probably sell some to the other squadrons at a profit and get back most of what we pay for our own. What's your name, son? asked Major de Coverley. My name is Milo Minderbender, sir. I am twenty-seven years old. You're a good mess officer, Milo. I'm not the mess officer, sir. You're a good mess officer, Milo. Thank you, sir. I'll do everything in my power to be a good mess officer. Bless you, my boy. Have a horseshoe. Thank you, sir. What should I do with it? Throw it. Away? At the peg, there. Then pick it up and throw it at this peg. It's a game, see? You get the horseshoe back. Yes, sir. I see. How much are horseshoes selling for? The smell of a fresh egg snapping exotically in a pool of fresh butter carried a long way on the Mediterranean trade winds and brought General Dreedle racing back with a voracious appetite, accompanied by his nurse, who accompanied him everywhere, and his son-in-law, Colonel Moodus. In the beginning, General Dreedel devoured all his meals in Milo's mess hall. Then the other three squadrons in Colonel Cathcart's group turned their mess halls over to Milo and gave him an airplane and a pilot each so that he could buy fresh eggs and fresh butter for them, too. Milo's planes shuttled back and forth seven days a week as every officer in the four squadrons began devouring fresh eggs in an insatiable orgy of fresh egg-eating. General Dreedel devoured fresh eggs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner— between meals, he devoured more fresh eggs, until Milo located abundant sources of fresh veal, beef, duck, baby lamb chops, mushroom caps, broccoli, South African rock lobster tails, shrimp, hams, puddings, grapes, ice cream, strawberries, and artichokes. There were three other bomb groups in General Dreedle's combat wing, and they each jealously dispatched their own planes to Malta for fresh eggs, but discovered that fresh eggs were selling there for seven cents apiece. Since they could buy them from Milo for five cents apiece, it made more sense to turn over their mess halls to his syndicate, too, and give him the planes and pilots needed to ferry in all the other good food he promised to supply as well. Everyone was elated with this turn of events, most of all Colonel Cathcart, who was convinced he had won a feather in his cap. He greeted Milo jovially each time they met, and in an excess of contrite generosity, impulsively recommended Major Major for promotion— the recommendation was rejected at once at 27th Air Force headquarters by ex-PFC Wintergreen, who scribbled a brusque, unsigned reminder that the Army had only one Major, 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 and did not intend to lose him by promotion, just to please Colonel Cathcart. Colonel Cathcart was stung by the blunt rebuke and skulked guiltily about his room in smarting repudiation. He blamed Major Major for this black eye and decided to bust him down to Lieutenant that very same day. They probably won't let you. Colonel Korn remarked with a condescending smile, savoring the situation, for precisely the same reasons that they wouldn't let you promote him. Besides, you'd certainly look foolish trying to bust him down to lieutenant right after you tried to promote him to my rank. Colonel Cathcart felt hemmed in on every side. He had been much more successful in obtaining a medal for Yossarian after the debacle of Ferrara when the bridge spanning the Po was still standing undamaged seven days after Colonel Cathcart had volunteered to destroy it. Nine missions his men had flown there in six days, and the bridge was not demolished until the tenth mission on the seventh day. 
when the Usarian killed Kraft and his crew by taking his flight of six planes in over the target a second time. The Usarian came in carefully on his second bomb run because he was brave then. He buried his head in his bomb site until his bombs were away. When he looked up, everything inside the ship was suffused in a weird orange glow. At first he thought his own plane was on fire. Then he spied the plane with the burning engine directly above him and screamed to McWatt through the intercom to turn left hard. A second later, the wing of Kraft's plane blew off. The flaming wreck dropped, first the fuselage, then the spinning wing, while a shower of tiny metal fragments began tap-dancing on the roof of Usarian's own plane, and the incessant ka-chung, ka-chung, ka-chung of the flak was still thumping all around him. Back on the ground, every eye watched grimly as he walked in dull dejection up to Captain Black outside the green clapboard briefing room to make his intelligence report, and learned that Colonel Cathcart and Colonel Korn were waiting to speak to him inside. Major Danby stood barring the door, waving everyone else away in ashen silence. Yasarian was leaden with fatigue and longed to remove his sticky clothing. He stepped into the briefing room with mixed emotions, uncertain how he was supposed to feel about Kraft and the others, for they had all died in the distance of a mute and secluded agony, at a moment when he was up to his own ass in the same vile, excruciating dilemma of duty and damnation. Colonel Cathcart, on the other hand, was all broken up by the event. Twice? he asked. I would have missed it the first time, Yossarian replied softly, his face lowered. Their voices echoed slightly in the long, narrow bungalow. But twice, Colonel Cathcart repeated in vivid disbelief. I would have missed it the first time, Yossarian repeated. But Kraft would be alive. And the bridge would still be up. A trained bombardier is supposed to drop his bombs the first time, Colonel Cathcart reminded him. The other five bombardiers dropped their bombs the first time. And missed the target, Yossarian said. We'd have had to go back there again. And maybe you would have gotten it the first time then. And maybe I wouldn't have gotten it at all. But maybe there wouldn't have been any losses. And maybe there would have been more losses with the bridge still left standing. I thought you wanted the bridge destroyed. Don't contradict me. Colonel Cathcart said. We're all in enough trouble. I'm not contradicting you, sir. Yes, you are. Even that's a contradiction. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Colonel Cathcart cracked his knuckles violently. Colonel Korn, a stocky, dark, flaccid man with a shapeless paunch, sat completely relaxed on one of the benches in the front row, his hands clasped comfortably over the top of his bald and swarthy head. His eyes were amused behind his glinting, rimless spectacles. We're trying to be perfectly objective about this, he prompted Colonel Cathcart. We're trying to be perfectly objective about this, Colonel Cathcart said to Usarian with the zeal of sudden inspiration. It's not that I'm being sentimental or anything. I don't give a damn about the men or the airplane. It's just that it looks so lousy on the report. How am I going to cover up something like this in the report? Why don't you give me a medal, Usarian suggested timidly. For going around twice? You gave one to Hungry Joe when he cracked up that airplane by mistake. Colonel Cathcart snickered ruefully. You will be lucky if we don't give you a court-martial. But I got the bridge the second time around, Yossarian protested. I thought you wanted the bridge destroyed. Oh, I don't know what I wanted, Colonel Cathcart cried out in exasperation. Look, of course I wanted the bridge destroyed. That bridge has been a source of trouble to me ever since I decided to send you men out to get it, but... Why couldn't you do it the first time? I didn't have enough time. My navigator wasn't sure we had the right city. The right city? Colonel Cathcart was baffled. Are you trying to blame it all on Arfie now? No, sir, it was my mistake for letting him distract me. All I'm trying to say is that I'm not infallible. Nobody is infallible, Colonel Cathcart said sharply, and then continued vaguely with an afterthought. Nobody is indispensable, either. There was no rebuttal. Colonel Korn stretched sluggishly. We've got to reach a decision, he observed casually to Colonel Cathcart. We've got to reach a decision, Colonel Cathcart said to Usarian. And it's all your fault. Why did you have to go around twice? Why couldn't you drop your bombs the first time like all the others? 
I would have missed the first time. It seems to me that we're going around twice, Colonel Korn interrupted with a chuckle. But what are we going to do? Colonel Cathcart exclaimed with distress. The others are all waiting outside. Why don't we give him a medal? Colonel Korn proposed. For going around twice? What can we give him a medal for? For going around twice, Colonel Korn answered with a reflective, self-satisfied smile. After all, I suppose it did take a lot of courage to go over that target a second time with no other planes around to divert the anti-aircraft fire. And he did hit the bridge. You know, that might be the answer. To act boastfully about something we ought to be ashamed of. That's a trick that never seems to fail. Do you think it'll work? I'm sure it will. And let's promote him to captain, too, just to make certain. Don't you think that's going a bit farther than we have to? No, I don't think so. It's best to play safe. And a captain's not much difference. All right, Colonel Cathcart decided. We'll give him a medal for being brave enough to go around over the target twice. And we'll make him a captain, too. Colonel Korn reached for his hat. Exit smiling, he joked, and put his arm around Eusarian's shoulders as they stepped outside the door. Chapter 14 Kid Samson By the time of the mission to Bologna, Yossarian was brave enough not to go around over the target even once, and when he found himself aloft finally in the nose of Kid Samson's plane, he pressed in the button of his throat mic and asked, Well, what's wrong with the plane? Kid Samson let out a shriek. Is something wrong with the plane? What's the matter? Kid Samson's cry turned Yossarian to ice. Is something the matter? He yelled in horror. Are we bailing out? I don't know. Kid Sampson shot back in anguish, wailing excitedly. Someone said we're bailing out. Who is this anyway? Who is this? This is Yossarian in the nose. Yossarian in the nose. I heard you say there was something the matter. D didn't you say there was something the matter? I thought you said there was something wrong. Everything seems okay. Everything is all right. Yossarian's heart sank. Something was terribly wrong if everything was all right and they had no excuse for turning back. He hesitated gravely. I can't hear you, he said. I said everything is all right. The sun was blinding white on the porcelain blue water below and on the flashing edges of the other airplanes. Yossarian took hold of the colored wires leading into the jackbox of the intercom system and tore them loose. I still can't hear you, he said. He heard nothing. Slowly, he collected his map case and his three flak suits and crawled back to the main compartment. Nately, sitting stiffly in the co-pilot's seat, spied him through the corner of his eye as he stepped up on the flight deck behind Kid Sampson. He smiled at Yossarian wanly, looking frail and exceptionally young and bashful in the bulky dungeon of his earphones, hat, throat mic, flak suit, and parachute. Yossarian bent close to Kid Sampson's ear. I still can't hear you, he shouted above the even drone of the engines. Kid Sampson glanced back at him with surprise. Kid Sampson had an angular, comical face with arched eyebrows and a scrawny, blonde mustache. What? he called out over his shoulder. I still can't hear you, Yossarian repeated. You'll have to talk louder, Kid Sampson said. I still can't hear you. I said, I still can't hear you, Yossarian yelled. I can't help it, Kid Sampson yelled back at him. I'm shouting as loud as I can. I couldn't hear you over my intercom, Yossarian bellowed in mounting helplessness. You'll have to turn back. For an intercom? asked Kid Sampson incredulously. Turn back, said Yossarian, before I break your head. Kid Sampson looked for moral support toward Nately, who stared away from him pointedly. Yossarian outranked them both. Kid Sampson resisted doubtfully for another moment and then capitulated eagerly with a triumphant whoop. That's just fine with me, he announced gladly and blew out a shrill series of whistles up into his mustache. Yes, sirree, that's just fine with old Kid Sampson. He whistled again and shouted over the intercom. Now hear this, my little chickadees. 
This is Admiral Kid Sampson talking. This Admiral Kid Sampson squawking, the pride of the Queen's Marines. Yes, siree. We're turning back, boys. By cracky, we're turning back. Nately ripped off his hat and earphones in one jubilant sweep and began rocking back and forth happily like a handsome child in a high chair. Sergeant Knight came plummeting down from the top gun turret and began pounding them all on the back with delirious enthusiasm. Kid Sampson turned the plane away from the formation in a wide, graceful arc and headed toward the airfield. When Yossarian plugged his headset into one of the auxiliary jack boxes, the two gunners in the rear section of the plane were both singing La Cucaracha. Back at the field, the party fizzled out abruptly. An uneasy silence replaced it, and Yossarian was sober and self-conscious as he climbed down from the plane and took his place in the jeep that was already waiting for them. None of the men spoke at all on the drive back through the heavy, mesmerizing, quiet, blanketing mountains, sea, and forests. The feeling of desolation persisted when they turned off the road at the squadron. Yossarian got out of the car last. After a minute, Yossarian and a gentle, warm wind were the only things stirring in the haunting tranquility that hung like a drug over the vacated tents. The squadron stood insensate, bereft of everything human but Doc Danica, who roosted dolorously like a shivering turkey buzzard behind the closed door of the medical tent, his stuffed nose jabbing away in thirsting futility at the hazy sunlight streaming down around him. Eusarian knew Dr. Nika would not go swimming with him. Dr. Nika would never go swimming again. A person could swoon or suffer a mild coronary occlusion in an inch or two of water and drown to death be carried out to sea by an undertow, or made vulnerable to poliomyelitis or meningococcus infection through chilling or overexertion. The threat of Bologna to others had instilled in Dr. Nika an even more poignant solicitude for his own safety. At night now, he heard burglars. Through the lavender gloom clouding the entrance of the operations tent, Yossarian glimpsed Chief White Half-Oat diligently embezzling whiskey rations, forging the signatures of non-drinkers and pouring off the alcohol with which he was poisoning himself into separate bottles rapidly in order to steal as much as he could before Captain Black roused himself with recollection and came hurrying over indolently to steal the rest himself. The jeep started up again softly. Kid Sampson, Nately, and the others wandered apart in a noiseless eddy of motion and were sucked away into the cloying yellow stillness. The jeep vanished with a cough. Yossarian was alone in a ponderous primeval lull in which everything green looked black and everything else was imbued with the color of pus. The breeze rustled leaves in a dry and diaphanous distance. He was restless, scared, and sleepy. The sockets of his eyes felt grimy with exhaustion. Wearily, he moved inside the parachute tent with its long table of smoothed wood, a nagging bitch of a doubt burrowing painlessly inside a conscience that felt perfectly clear. He left his flax suit and parachute there and crossed back past the water wagon to the intelligence tent to return his map case to Captain Black, who sat drowsing in his chair with his skinny long legs up on his desk, and inquired with indifferent curiosity why Yossarian's plane had turned back. Yossarian ignored him. He set the map down on the counter and walked out. Back in his own tent, he squirmed out of his parachute harness and then out of his clothes. Orr was in Rome, due back that same afternoon from the rest leave he had won by ditching his plane in the waters off Genoa. Nately would already be packing to replace him. Entranced to find himself still alive and undoubtedly impatient to resume his wasted and heartbreaking courtship of his prostitute in Rome. When Yossarian was undressed, he sat down on his cot to rest. He felt much better as soon as he was naked. He never felt comfortable in clothes. In a little while, he put fresh undershorts back on and set out for the beach in his moccasins, a cocky-colored bath towel draped over his shoulders. The path from the squadron led him around a mysterious gun emplacement in the woods. Two of the three enlisted men stationed there lay sleeping on the circle of sandbags, and the third sat eating a purple pomegranate, biting off large mouthfuls between his churning jaws and spewing the ground roughage out away from him into the bushes. When he bit, red juice ran out of his mouth. Eusarion padded ahead into the forest again, caressing his bare, tingling belly adoringly from time to time as though to reassure himself it was all still there. 
He rolled a piece of lint out of his navel. Along the ground, suddenly, on both sides of the path, he saw dozens of new mushrooms the rain had spawned, poking their nodular fingers up through the clammy earth like lifeless stalks of flesh, sprouting in such necrotic profusion everywhere he looked that they seemed to be proliferating right before his eyes. There were thousands of them swarming as far back into the underbrush as he could see, and they appeared to swell in size and multiply in number as he spied them. He hurried away from them with a shiver of eerie alarm and did not slacken his pace until the soil crumbled to dry sand beneath his feet and they had been left behind. He glanced back apprehensively, half expecting to find the limp white things crawling after him in sightless pursuit or snaking up through the treetops in a writhing and ungovernable mutative mass. The beach was deserted. The only sounds were hushed ones. The bloated gurgle of the stream, the respirating hum of the tall grass and shrubs behind him, the apathetic moaning of the dumb, translucent waves. The surf was always small, the water clear and cool. Yossarian left his things on the sand and moved through the knee-high waves until he was completely immersed. On the other side of the sea, a bumpy sliver of dark land lay wrapped in mist, almost invisible. He swam languorously out to the raft, held on a moment and swam languorously back to where he could stand on the sandbar. He submerged himself head first into the green water several times until he felt clean and wide awake, and then stretched himself out face down in the sand and slept until the planes returning from Bologna were almost overhead and the great cumulative rumble of their many engines came crashing in through his slumber in an earth-shattering roar. He woke up blinking, with a slight pain in his head, and opened his eyes upon a world boiling in chaos in which everything was in proper order. He gasped in utter amazement at the fantastic sight of the twelve flights of planes, organized calmly into exact formation. The scene was too unexpected to be true. There were no planes spurting ahead with wounded, none lagging behind with damage. No distress flares smoked in the sky. No ship was missing but his own. For an instant he was paralyzed with a sensation of madness. Then he understood, and almost wept at the irony. The explanation was simple. Clouds had covered the target before the planes could bomb it, and the mission to Bologna was still to be flown. He was wrong. There had been no clouds. Bologna had been bombed. Bologna was a milk run. There had been no flak there at all. Chapter 15 Pilchard and Wren Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren, the inoffensive Joint Squadron Operations Officers, were both mild, soft-spoken men of less than middle height who enjoyed flying combat missions and begged nothing more of life and Colonel Cathcart than the opportunity to continue flying them. They had flown hundreds of combat missions and wanted to fly hundreds more. They assigned themselves to every one. Nothing so wonderful as war had ever happened to them before, and they were afraid it might never happen to them again. They conducted their duties humbly and reticently with a minimum of fuss and went to great lengths not to antagonize anyone. They smiled quickly at everyone they passed. When they spoke, they mumbled. They were shifty, cheerful, subservient men who were comfortable only with each other and never met anyone else's eye, not even Yossarian's eye, at the open-air meeting they called to reprimand him publicly for making Kid Sampson turn back from the mission to Bologna. Fellas, said Captain Pilchard, who had thinning dark hair and smiled awkwardly, when you, you turn back from a mission, try to make sure it's for something important, will you? Uh, not for something unimportant. Like a, a defective intercom uh, or something like that. Okay, uh, Captain Wren has more he wants to say to you on that subject. Captain Pilchard's right, fellas, said Captain Wren, and that's all I'm going to say to you on that subject. Well, we finally got to Bologna today, and we found out it's a milk run. We were all a little nervous, I guess, and didn't do too much damage. Well, listen to this. Colonel Cathcart got permission for us to go back. And tomorrow, we're really gonna pace those ammunition dumps. Now, what do you think about that? 
and to prove to Yossarian that they bore him no animosity, they even assigned him to fly lead bombardier with McWatt in the first formation when they went back to Bologna the next day. He came in on the target like a Havermeyer, confidently taking no evasive action at all, and suddenly they were shooting the living shit out of him. Heavy flack was everywhere. He had been lulled, lured, and trapped, and there was nothing he could do but sit there like an idiot and watch the ugly black puffs smashing up to kill him. There was nothing he could do until his bombs dropped, but looked back into the bomb site, where the fine crosshairs in the lens were glued magnetically over the target exactly where he had placed them, intersecting perfectly deep inside the yard of his block of camouflaged warehouses before the base of the first building. He was trembling steadily as the plane crept ahead. He could hear the hollow boom, 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 boom of the flak pounding all around him in overlapping measures of four, the sharp, piercing crack of a single shell exploding suddenly very close by. His head was bursting with a thousand dissonant impulses as he prayed for the bombs to drop. He wanted to sob. The engines droned on monotonously like a fat, lazy fly. At last, the indices on the bomb site crossed, tripping away the eight 500-pounders one after the other. The plane lurched upward buoyantly with a lightened load. Yossarian bent away from the bomb site crookedly to watch the indicator on his left. When the pointer touched zero, he closed the bomb bay doors and over the intercom at the very top of his voice shrieked, Turn right hard! McWatt responded instantly. With a grinding howl of engines, he flipped the plane over on one wing and wrung it around remorselessly in a screaming turn away from the twin spires of flak Yossarian had spied stabbing toward them. Then Yossarian had McWatt climb and keep climbing higher and higher until they tore free finally into a calm diamond blue sky that was sunny and pure everywhere and laced in the distance with long white veils of tenuous fluff. The wind strummed soothingly against the cylindrical panes of his windows and he relaxed exultantly only until they picked up speed again and then turned McWatt left and plunged him right back down noticing with a transitory spasm of elation the mushrooming clusters of flak leaping open high above him and back over his shoulder to the right, exactly where he could have been if he had not turned left and dived. He leveled McWatt out with another harsh cry and whipped him upward and around again into a ragged blue patch of unpolluted air just as the bombs he had dropped began to strike. The first one fell in the yard exactly where he had aimed, and then the rest of the bombs from his own plane and from the other planes in his flight burst open on the ground, in a charge of rapid orange flashes across the tops of the buildings, which collapsed instantly in a vast, churning wave of pink and gray and coal-black smoke that went rolling out turbulently in all directions and quaked convulsively in its bowels as though from great blasts of red and white and golden sheet lightning. Well, will you look at that? Arfie marveled sonorously right beside Yossarian, his plump, orbicular face sparkling with a look of bright enchantment. There must have been an ammunition dump down there. Yossarian had forgotten about Arfie. Get out, he shouted at him. Get out of the nose! Arfie smiled politely and pointed down toward the target in a generous invitation for Yossarian to look. Yossarian began slapping at him insistently and signaled wildly toward the entrance of the crawlway. Get back in the ship, he cried frantically. Get back in the ship! Arfi shrugged amiably. I can't hear you, he explained. Yossarian seized him by the straps of his parachute harness and pushed him backward toward the crawlway just as the plane was hit with a jarring concussion that rattled his bones and made his heart stop. He knew at once they were all dead. Climb! He screamed into the intercom at McWatt when he saw he was still alive. Climb, you bastard! Climb! 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 The plane zoomed upward again in a climb that was swift and straining until he leveled it out with another harsh shout at McWatt and wrenched it around once more in a roaring, merciless 45-degree turn that sucked his insides out in one enervating sniff and left him floating fleshless in mid-air until he leveled McWatt out again, just long enough to hurl him back around toward the right, and then down into a screeching dive. Through endless blobs of ghostly black smoke he sped, the hanging smut wafting against the smooth plexiglass nose of the ship, like an evil, damp, sooty vapor against his cheeks. 
His heart was hammering again in aching terror as he hurtled upward and downward through the blind gangs of flak charging murderously into the sky at him, then sagging inertly. Sweat gushed from his neck in torrents and poured down over his chest and waist with the feeling of warm slime. He was vaguely aware for an instant that the planes in his formation were no longer there, and then he was aware of only himself. His throat hurt like a raw slash from the strangling intensity with which he shrieked each command to McWatt. The engines rose to a deafening, agonized, ululating bellow each time McWatt changed direction. And far out in front, the bursts of flak were still swarming into the sky from new batteries of guns poking around for accurate altitude as they waited sadistically for him to fly into range. The plane was slammed again suddenly with another loud, jarring explosion that almost rocked it over on its back, and the nose filled immediately with sweet clouds of blue smoke. Something was on fire. Eusarian whirled to escape and smacked into Arfi, who had struck a match and was placidly lighting his pipe. Eusarian gaped at his grinning, moon-faced navigator in utter shock and confusion. It occurred to him that one of them was mad. Jesus Christ, he screamed at Arfie in tortured amazement. Get the hell out of the nose, are you crazy? Get out! Or, said Arfie, get out! Yossarian yelled hysterically and began clubbing Arfie backhanded with both fists to drive him away. Get out! I still can't hear you, Arfie called back innocently with an expression of mild and reproving perplexity. You'll have to talk a little louder. Get out of the nose, Yossarian shrieked in frustration. They're trying to kill us, don't you understand? They're trying to kill us. Which way should I go, goddammit? McWatt shouted furiously over the intercom in a suffering, high-pitched voice. Which way should I go? Turn left. Left, you goddamn dirty son of a bitch. Turn left hard. Arfie crept up close behind Yossarian and jabbed him sharply in the ribs with the stem of his pipe. Yossarian flew up toward the ceiling with a winning cry, then jumped completely around on his knees, white as a sheet and quivering with rage. Arfie winked encouragingly and jerked his thumb back toward McWatt with a humorous moo. What's eating him? he asked with a laugh. Yossarian was struck with a weird sense of distortion. Will you get out of here? He yelped beseechingly and shoved Arfi over with all his strength. Are you deaf or something? Get back in the plane! And to McWatt he screamed, Dive! Dive! Down they sank once more into the crunching, thudding, voluminous barrage of bursting anti-aircraft shells as Arfi came creeping back behind Yossarian and jabbed him sharply in the ribs again. Yossarian shied upward with another whinnying gasp. I still couldn't hear you. Arfie said. I said, get out of here! Yossarian shouted and broke into tears. He began punching Arfie in the body with both hands as hard as he could. Get away from me! Get away! Punching Arfie was like sinking his fists into a limp sack of inflated rubber. There was no resistance, no response at all from the soft, insensitive mass. And after a while, Yossarian's spirit died and his arms dropped helplessly with exhaustion. He was overcome with a humiliating feeling of impotence and was ready to weep in self-pity. Uh, what did you say? Arfi asked. Get away from me, Yossarian answered, pleading with him now. Go back in the plane. I still can't hear you. Never mind, wailed Yossarian. Never mind, just leave me alone. Never mind what? Yossarian began hitting himself in the forehead. He seized Arfi by the shirt front and, struggling to his feet for traction, dragged him to the rear of the nose compartment and flung him down like a bloated and unwieldy bag in the entrance of the crawlway. A shell banged open with a stupendous clout right beside his ear as he was scrambling back toward the front, and some undestroyed recess of his intelligence wondered that it did not kill them all. They were climbing again. The engines were howling again as though in pain, and the air inside the plane was acrid with the smell of machinery and fetid with the stench of gasoline. The next thing he knew, it was snowing. 
Thousands of tiny bits of white paper were falling like snowflakes inside the plane, milling around his head so thickly that they clung to his eyelashes when he blinked in astonishment and fluttered against his nostrils and lips each time he inhaled. When he spun around in his bewilderment, Arfi was grinning proudly from ear to ear like something inhuman as he held up a shattered paper map for Yossarian to see. A large chunk of flak had ripped up from the floor through Arfi's colossal jumble of maps and had ripped out through the ceiling inches away from their heads. Arfi's joy was sublime. Will you look at this? he murmured, waggling two of his stubby fingers playfully into Yossarian's face through the hole in one of his maps. Will you look at this? Yossarian was dumbfounded by his state of rapturous contentment. Arfi was like an eerie ogre in a dream, incapable of being bruised or evaded, and Yossarian dreaded him for a complex of reasons he was too petrified to untangle. Wind whistling up through the jagged gash in the floor kept the myriad bits of paper circulating like alabaster particles in a paperweight and contributed to a sensation of lacquered, waterlogged unreality. Everything seemed strange, so tawdry and grotesque. His head was throbbing from a shrill clamor that drilled relentlessly into both ears. It was McWatt, begging for directions in an incoherent frenzy. Yossarian continued staring in tormented fascination at Arfi's spherical countenance, beaming at him so serenely and vacantly through the drifting whirls of white paper bits, and concluded that he was a raving lunatic, just as eight bursts of flak broke open successively at eye level off to the right, then eight more, and then eight more. The last group pulled over toward the left so that they were almost directly in front. Turn left hard! He hollered to McWatt as Arfie kept grinning. And McWatt did turn left hard, but the flak turned left hard with them, catching up fast, and Yossarian hollered, I said hard, 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 you bastard, hard! And McWatt bent the plane around even harder still. And suddenly, miraculously, they were out of range. The flak ended. The guns stopped booming at them. And they were alive. Behind him, Men were dying. Strung out for miles in a stricken, tortuous, squirming line, the other flights of planes were making the same hazardous journey over the target, threading their swift way through the swollen masses of new and old bursts of flak, like rats racing in a pack through their own droppings. One was on fire and flapped lamely off by itself, billowing gigantically like a monstrous blood-red star. As Yossarian watched... The burning plane floated over on its side and began spiraling down slowly in wide, tremulous, narrowing circles, its huge, flaming burden blazing orange and flaring out in back like a long, swirling cape of fire and smoke. There were parachutes. One, two, three, four. And then the plane gyrated into a spin and fell the rest of the way to the ground fluttering insensibly inside its vivid pyre like a shred of colored tissue paper. One whole flight of planes from another squadron had been blasted apart. Yossarian sighed barrenly, his day's work done. He was listless and sticky. The engines crooned mellifluously as McWatt throttled back to loiter and allow the rest of the planes in his flight to catch up. The abrupt stillness seemed alien and artificial, a little insidious, Yossarian unsnapped his flak suit and took off his helmet. He sighed again, restlessly, and closed his eyes and tried to relax. Where's Orr? someone asked suddenly over his intercom. Yossarian bounded up with a one-syllable cry that crackled with anxiety and provided the only rational explanation for the whole mysterious phenomenon of the flak at Bologna. Orr. He lunged forward over the bomb site to search downward through the plexiglass for some reassuring sign of Orr, who drew flak like a magnet, and who had undoubtedly attracted the crack batteries of the whole Hermann Goering division to Bologna overnight from wherever the hell they had been stationed the day before, when Orr was still in Rome. Arfi lunged himself forward an instant later and cracked Yossarian on the bridge of the nose with the sharp rim of his flak helmet. Yossarian cursed him as his eyes flooded with tears. There he is. Arfi orated funereally, pointing down dramatically at a hay wagon and two horses standing before the barn of a grey stone farmhouse. 
Smashed to bits. Well, guess their numbers were all up. Yossarian swore at Arfi again and continued searching intently, cold with a compassionate kind of fear now for the little bouncy and bizarre buck-toothed tentmate who had smashed Appleby's forehead open with a ping-pong racket and who was scaring the daylights out of Yossarian once again. At last, Yossarian spotted the two-engine, twin-ruddered plane as it flew out of the green background of the forests over a field of yellow farmland. One of the propellers was feathered and perfectly still, but the plane was maintaining altitude and holding a proper course. Yossarian muttered an unconscious prayer of thankfulness, and then flared up at Orr savagely in a ranting fusion of resentment and relief. That bastard, he began, that goddamn stunted, red-faced, big-cheeked, curly-headed, buck-toothed, rat-bastard son of a bitch! A what? said Arfie. That dirty, goddamn, midget-assed, apple-cheeked, goggle-eyed, undersized, buck-toothed, grinning, crazy, son of a bitch and bastard! Yossarian sputtered. What? Never mind! I still can't hear you, Arfi answered. Yossarian swung himself around methodically to face Arfi. You prick, he began. Me? You pompous, rotund, neighborly, vacuous, complacent. Arfi was unperturbed. Calmly he struck a wooden match and sucked noisily at his pipe with an eloquent air of benign and magnanimous forgiveness. He smiled sociably and opened his mouth to speak. Yossarian put his hand over Arfi's mouth and pushed him away wearily. He shut his eyes and pretended to sleep all the way back to the field so that he would not have to listen to Arfi or see him. At the briefing room, Yossarian made his intelligence report to Captain Black and then waited in muttering suspense with all the others until Orr chugged into sight overhead finally, with his one good engine still keeping him aloft gamely. Nobody breathed. Orr's landing gear would not come down. Yossarian hung around only until Orr had crash-landed safely, and then stole the first jeep he could find with a key in the ignition and raced back to his tent to begin packing feverishly for the emergency rest leave he had decided to take in Rome, where he found Luciana and her invisible scar that same night. Chapter 16 Luciana He found Luciana sitting alone at a table in the Allied officers' nightclub, where the drunken Anzac Major who had brought her there had been stupid enough to desert her for the ribald company of some singing comrades at the bar. All right, I'll dance with you she said, before Yossarian could even speak. But I won't let you sleep with me. Who asked you? Yossarian asked her. You don't want to sleep with me? She exclaimed with surprise. I don't want to dance with you. She seized Yossarian's hand and pulled him out on the dance floor. She was a worse dancer than even he was, but she threw herself about to the synthetic jitterbug music with more uninhibited pleasure than he had ever observed until he felt his legs falling asleep with boredom and yanked her off the dance floor toward the table, at which the girl he should have been screwing was still sitting tipsily with one hand around Arfie's neck, her orange satin blouse still hanging open slovenly below her full white lacy brassiere as she made dirty sex talk ostentatiously with Hoople or Kid Sampson and Hungry Joe. Just as he reached them, Luciana gave him a forceful, unexpected shove that carried them both well beyond the table so that they were still alone. She was a tall, earthy, exuberant girl with long hair and a pretty face, a buxom, delightful, flirtatious girl. All right, she said. I will let you buy me dinner, but I won't let you sleep with me. Who asked you? Yossarian asked with surprise. You don't want to sleep with me? I don't want to buy you dinner. She pulled him out of the nightclub into the street and down a flight of steps into a black market restaurant filled with lively, chirping, attractive girls who all seemed to know each other and with a self-conscious military officers from different countries who had come there with them. The food was elegant and expensive and the aisles were overflowing with great streams of flushed and merry proprietors, all stout and balding. The bustling interior radiated with enormous, engulfing waves of fun and warmth. Yossarian got a tremendous kick out of the rude gusto with which Luciana ignored him completely while she shoveled away her whole meal with both hands. She ate like a horse until the last plate was clean, 
and then she placed her silverware down with an air of conclusion and settled back lazily in her chair with a dreamy and congested look of sated gluttony. She drew a deep, smiling, contented breath and regarded him amorously with a melting gaze. Okay, Joe, she purred, her glowing dark eyes drowsy and grateful. Now I will let you sleep with me. My name is Yossarian. Okay, Yossarian, she answered with a soft, repentant laugh. Now I will let you sleep with me. Who asked you, said Yossarian. Luciana was stunned. You don't want to sleep with me? Yossarian nodded emphatically, laughing, and shot his hand up under her dress. The girl came to life with a horrified start. She jerked her legs away from him instantly, whipping her bottom around. Flushing with alarm and embarrassment, she pushed her skirt back down with a number of prim, sidelong glances about the restaurant. Now I will let you sleep with me, she explained cautiously in a manner of apprehensive indulgence. But not now. I know. When we get back to my room. The girl shook her head, eyeing him mistrustfully and keeping her knees pressed together. No. Now I must go home to my mama, because my mama does not like me to dance with soldiers or let them take me to dinner, and she will be very angry with me if I do not come home now. But I will let you write down for me where you live, and tomorrow morning I will come to your room for ficky fick before I go to my work at the French office. Capisci? Bullshit, Yossarian exclaimed with angry disappointment. Cosa vuol dire bullshit? Luciana inquired with a blank look. Yossarian broke into loud laughter. He answered her finally in a tone of sympathetic good humor. It means that I want to escort you now to wherever the hell I have to take you next so that I can rush back to that nightclub before Arfie leaves with that wonderful tomato he's got without giving me a chance to ask about an aunt or friend she must have who's just like her. Come? Subito. Subito, he taunted her tenderly. Mama is waiting, remember? Si. See, Mama. Yossarian let the girl drag him through the lovely Roman spring night for almost a mile until they reached a chaotic bus depot, honking with horns, blazing with red and yellow lights, and echoing with the snarling vituperations of unshaven bus drivers, pouring loathsome, hair-raising curses out at each other, at their passengers and at the strolling, unconcerned knots of pedestrians clogging their paths, who ignored them until they were bumped by the buses and began shouting curses back. Luciana vanished aboard one of the diminutive green vehicles, and Yossarian hurried as fast as he could all the way back to the cabaret and the bleary-eyed bleached blonde in the open orange satin blouse. She seemed infatuated with Arfie, but he prayed intensely for her luscious aunt as he ran, or for a luscious girlfriend, sister, cousin, or mother who was just as libidinous and depraved. She would have been perfect for Yossarian, a debauched, coarse, vulgar, amoral, appetizing slattern whom he had longed for and idolized for months. She was a real find. She paid for her own drinks, and she had an automobile, an apartment, and a salmon-colored cameo ring that drove Hungry Joe clean out of his senses with its exquisitely carved figures of a naked boy and girl on a rock. Hungry Joe snorted and pranced and pawed at the floor in salivating lust and groveling need, but the girl would not sell him the ring, even though he offered her all the money in all their pockets and his complicated black camera thrown in. She was not interested in money or cameras. She was interested in fornication. She was gone when Yossarian got there. They were all gone, and he walked right out and moved in wistful dejection through the dark, emptying streets. Yossarian was not often lonely when he was by himself, but he was lonely now in his keen envy of Arfi, who he knew was in bed that very moment with a girl who was just right for Yossarian, and who could also make out any time he wanted to, if he ever wanted to, with either or both of the two slender, stunning aristocratic women who lived in the apartment upstairs and fructified Yossarian's sex fantasies whenever he had sex fantasies. The beautiful, rich, black-haired countess with the red, wet, nervous lips and her beautiful, rich, black-haired daughter-in-law. Yossarian was madly in love with all of them as he made his way back to the officer's apartment, in love with Luciana, with the prurient, intoxicated girl in the unbuttoned satin blouse, and with the beautiful rich countess and her beautiful rich daughter-in-law, 
both of whom would never let him touch them or even flirt with them. They doted kittenishly on Nately and deferred passively to Arfi, but they thought Eusarian was crazy and recoiled from him with distasteful contempt each time he made an indecent proposal or tried to fondle them when they passed on the stairs. They were both superb creatures, with pulpy, bright-pointed tongues and mouths like round, warm plums, a little sweet and sticky, a little rotten. They had class. Eusarian was not sure what class was, but he knew that they had it, and he did not, and that they knew it, too. He could picture as he walked the kind of underclothing they wore against their svelte feminine parts, filmy, smooth, clinging garments of deepest black or of opalescent pastel radiance with flowering lace borders fragrant with the tantalizing fumes of pampered flesh and scented bath salts rising in a germinating cloud from their blue-white breasts. He wished again that he was where Arfi was, making obscene, brutal, cheerful love with a juicy, drunken tart who didn't give a tinker's damn about him and would never think of him again. But Arfi was already back in the apartment when Eusarian arrived, and Eusarian gaped at him with that same sense of persecuted astonishment he had suffered that same morning over Bologna at his malign and cabalistic and irremovable presence in the nose of the plain. "'What are you doing here?' he asked. "'That's right. Ask him!' Hungry Joe exclaimed in a rage. Make him tell you what he's doing here. With a long theatrical moan, Kid Sampson made a pistol of his thumb and forefinger and blew his own brains out. Hoople, chewing away on a bulging wad of bubblegum, drank everything in with a callow, vacant expression on his fifteen-year-old face. Arfie was tapping the bowl of his pipe against his palm leisurely as he paced back and forth in corpulent self-approval, obviously delighted by the stir he was causing. Didn't you go home with that girl? Yossarian demanded. Oh, sure I went home with her, Arfi replied. You didn't think I was going to let her try to find her way home alone, did you? Wouldn't she let you stay with her? Oh, she wanted me to stay with her, all right, Arfi chuckled. Don't you worry about good old Arfi. But I wasn't going to take advantage of a sweet kid like that just because she'd had a little too much to drink. What kind of a guy do you think I am? Who said anything about taking advantage of her? Yossarian railed at him in amazement. All she wanted to do was get into bed with someone. That's the only thing she kept talking about all night long. Oh, that's because she was a little mixed up, Arfi explained. But I gave her a little talking to and really put some sense into her. You bastard! Yossarian exclaimed and sank down tiredly on the divan beside Kid Sampson. Why the hell didn't you give her to one of us if you didn't want her? You see... Hungry Joe asked. There's something wrong with him. Yossarian nodded and looked at Arfi curiously. Arfi, tell me something. Don't you ever screw any of them? Arfi chuckled again with conceited amusement. Oh, sure, I prod them. Don't you worry about me. But never any nice girls. I know what kind of girls to prod and what kind of girls not to prod, and I never prod any nice girls. This one was a sweet kid. You could see her family had money. Why, I even got her to throw that ring of hers away right out the car window. Hungry Joe flew into the air with a screech of intolerable pain. You did what? he screamed. You did what? He began wailing away at Arfie's shoulders and arms with both fists almost in tears. I ought to kill you for what you did, you lousy bastard. He's sinful, that's what he is. He's got a dirty mind, ain't he? Ain't he got a dirty mind? The dirtiest, Yossarian agreed. What are you fellas talking about? Arfi asked with genuine puzzlement, tucking his face away protectively inside the cushioning insulation of his oval shoulders. Oh, come on, Joe, he pleaded with a smile of mild discomfort. Quit punching me, will you? But Hungry Joe would not quit punching until Yossarian picked him up and pushed him away toward his bedroom. Yossarian moved listlessly into his own room, undressed and went to sleep. A second later, it was morning, and someone was shaking him. Oh, what do you wake me up for? he whimpered. It was Michaela, the skinny maid with the merry disposition and homely, sallow face, and she was waking him up because he had a visitor waiting just outside the door. Luciana. He could hardly believe it. And she was alone in the room with him after Michaela had departed, lovely, hale, and statuesque, 
steaming and rippling with an irrepressible, affectionate vitality, even as she remained in one place and frowned at him irately. She stood like a youthful female colossus, with her magnificent columnar legs apart on high white shoes with wedged heels, wearing a pretty green dress and swinging a large, flat, white leather pocketbook, with which she cracked him hard across the face when he leaped out of bed to grab her. Yossarian staggered backward out of range in a daze, clutching his stinging cheek with bewilderment. Big! she spat out at him viciously, her nostrils flaring in a look of savage disdain. Vive come un animale! With a fierce, guttural, scornful, disgusted oath, she strode across the room and threw open the three tall casement windows, letting inside an effulgent flood of sunlight and crisp, fresh air that washed through the stuffy room like an invigorating tonic. She placed her pocketbook on a chair and began tidying the room, picking his things up from the floor and off the tops of the furniture, throwing his socks, handkerchief, and underwear into an empty drawer of the dresser and hanging his shirt and trousers up in the closet. Yossarian ran out of the bedroom into the bathroom and brushed his teeth. He washed his hands and face and combed his hair. When he ran back, the room was in order and Luciana was almost undressed. Her expression was relaxed. She left her earrings on the dresser and padded barefoot to the bed, wearing just a pink rayon chemise that came down to her hips. She glanced about the room prudently to make certain there was nothing she had overlooked in the way of neatness, and then drew back the coverlet and stretched herself out luxuriously with an expression of feline expectation. She beckoned to him longingly with a husky laugh. Now, she announced in a whisper, holding both arms out to him eagerly, now I will let you sleep with me. She told him some lies about a single weekend in bed with a slaughtered fiancé in the Italian army, and they all turned out to be true. For she cried, Finito, almost as soon as he started, and wondered why he didn't stop, until he had finitoed too and explained to her. He lit cigarettes for both of them. She was enchanted by the deep suntan covering his whole body. He wondered about the pink chemise that she would not remove. It was cut like a man's undershirt with narrow shoulder straps, and concealed the invisible scar on her back that she refused to let him see after he had made her tell him it was there. She grew tense as fine steel when he traced the mutilated contours with his fingertip from a pit in her shoulder blade almost to the base of her spine. He winced at the many tortured nights she had spent in the hospital, drugged or in pain, with the ubiquitous ineradicable odors of ether, fecal matter, and disinfectant, of human flesh mortified and decaying amid the white uniforms, the rubber-soled shoes, and the eerie night lights glowing dimly until dawn in the corridors. She had been wounded in an air raid. Dove? he asked, and he held his breath in suspense. Napoli. Germans? Americani. His heart cracked, and he fell in love. He wondered if she would marry him. Tu sei pazzo, she told him with a pleasant laugh. Why am I crazy? he asked. Perché non posso sposare? Why can't you get married? Because I'm not a virgin, she answered. Well, what has that got to do with it? Who will marry me? No one wants a girl who is not a virgin. I will. I'll marry you. Ma non posso sposarti. Why can't you marry me? Perché sei pazzo? Why am I crazy? Perché vuoi sposarmi? Yossarian wrinkled his forehead with quizzical amusement. You won't marry me because I'm crazy, and you say I'm crazy because I want to marry you, is that right? Si. Tu sei pazzo, he told her loudly. Perché? She shouted back at him indignantly, her unavoidable round breasts rising and falling in a saucy huff beneath the pink chemise as she sat up in bed indignantly. Why am I crazy? Because you won't marry me. Stupido! She shouted back at him and smacked him loudly and flamboyantly on the chest with the back of her hand. Non posso sposarti. Non capisci? Non posso sposarti. Oh, sure, I understand. And why can't you marry me? Perché sei pazzo. And why am I crazy? Perché vuoi sposarmi? Because I want to marry you. Carina, ti amo, he explained, and he drew her gently back down to the pillow. Ti amo molto. Tu sei pazzo, 
she murmured in reply, flattered. Perché? Because you say you love me. How can you love a girl who is not a virgin? Because I can't marry you. She bolted right up again in a threatening rage. Why can't you marry me? She demanded, ready to clout him again if he gave an uncomplimentary reply. Just because I'm not a virgin? No, no, darling. Because you're crazy. She stared at him in blank resentment for a moment and then tossed her head back and roared appreciatively with hearty laughter. She gazed at him with new approval when she stopped, the lush, responsive tissues of her dark face turning darker still and blooming somnolently with a swelling and beautifying infusion of blood. Her eyes grew dim. He crushed out both their cigarettes, and they turned into each other wordlessly in an engrossing kiss, just as Hungry Joe came meandering into the room without knocking to ask if Eusarian wanted to go out with him to look for girls. Hungry Joe stopped on a dime when he saw them and shot out of the room. Eusarian shot out of bed even faster and began shouting at Luciana to get dressed. The girl was dumbfounded. He pulled her roughly out of bed by her arm and flung her away toward her clothing, then raced for the door in time to slam it shut as Hungry Joe was running back in with his camera. Hungry Joe had his leg wedged in the door and would not pull it out. Oh, let me in, he begged urgently, wriggling and squirming maniacally. Let me in! He stopped struggling for a moment to gaze up into Yossarian's face through the crack in the door with what he must have supposed was a beguiling smile. Me no hungry, Joe, he explained earnestly. Me, he big photographer from Life magazine. He big picture on he big cover. I make you big Hollywood star, Yossarian. Multi dinero, multi divorces, uh, multi ficky fic all day long. See, si, see, si, see. Si. Yossarian slammed the door shut when Hungry Joe stepped back a bit to try to shoot a picture of Luciana dressing. Hungry Joe attacked the stout wooden barrier fanatically, fell back to reorganize his energies, and hurled himself forward fanatically again. Yossarian slithered into his own clothes between assaults. Luciana had her green and white summer dress on and was holding the skirt bunched up above her waist. A wave of misery broke over him as he saw her about to vanish inside her panties forever. He reached out to grasp her and drew her to him by the raised calf of her leg. She hopped forward and molded herself against him. Eusarian kissed her ears and her closed eyes romantically and rubbed the backs of her thighs. She began to hum sensually a moment before Hungry Joe hurled his frail body against the door in still one more desperate attack and almost knocked them both down. Eusarian pushed her away. Vite, Vite, he scolded her. Get your things on. What the hell are you talking about? She wanted to know. Fast! Fast! Can't you understand English? Get your clothes on fast! Stupido! She snarled back at him. Vite is a French, not Italian. Subito! Subito! That's what you mean. Subito! Si, si, that's what I mean. Subito! Subito! Si, si! She responded cooperatively and ran for her shoes and earrings. Hungry Joe had paused in his attack to shoot pictures through the closed door. Yossarian could hear the camera shutter clicking. When both he and Luciana were ready, Yossarian waited for Hungry Joe's next charge and yanked the door open on him unexpectedly. Hungry Joe spilled forward into the room like a floundering frog. Yossarian skipped nimbly around him, guiding Luciana along behind him through the apartment and out into the hallway. They bounced down the stairs with a great roistering clatter, laughing out loud breathlessly and knocking their hilarious heads together each time they paused to rest. Near the bottom, they met Nately coming up and stopped laughing. Nately was drawn, dirty, and unhappy. His tie was twisted and his shirt was rumpled, and he walked with his hands in his pockets. He wore a hangdog, hopeless look. Oh, what's the matter, kid? Yossarian inquired compassionately. I'm flat broke again, Nately replied with a lame and distracted smile. What am I going to do? Yossarian didn't know. Nately had spent the last thirty-two hours at twenty dollars an hour with the apathetic whore he adored, and he had nothing left of his pay or of the lucrative allowance he received every month from his wealthy and generous father. That meant he could not spend time with her any more. She would not allow him to walk beside her as she strolled the pavement soliciting other servicemen, and she was infuriated when she spied him trailing her from a distance. He was free to hang around her apartment if he cared to, but there was no certainty that she would be there and she would give him nothing unless he could pay. She found sex uninteresting. Nately wanted the assurance that she was not going to bed with anyone unsavory or with someone he knew. 
Captain Black always made it a point to buy her each time he came to Rome, just so he could torment Nately with the news that he had thrown his sweetheart another hump and watched Nately eat his liver as he related the atrocious indignities to which he had forced her to submit. Luciana was touched by Nately's forlorn air, but broke loudly into robust laughter again the moment she stepped outside into the sunny street with Yossarian and heard Hungry Joe beseeching them from the window to come back and take their clothes off, because he really was a photographer from Life magazine. Luciana fled mirthfully along the sidewalk in her high white wedgies, pulling Yossarian along in tow with the same lusty and ingenuous zeal she had displayed in the dance hall the night before and at every moment since. Yossarian caught up and walked with his arm around her waist until they came to the corner, and she stepped away from him. She straightened her hair in a mirror from her pocketbook and put lipstick on. Why don't you ask me to let you write my name and address on a piece of paper so that you will be able to find me again when you come to Rome, she suggested. Why don't you let me write your name and address down on a piece of paper, he agreed. Why? she demanded belligerently, her mouth curling suddenly into a vehement sneer and her eyes flashing with anger. So you can tear it up into little pieces as soon as I leave. Who's gonna tear it up? Yossarian protested in confusion. What the hell are you talking about? You will, she insisted. You'll tear it up into little pieces the minute I'm gone and go walking away like a big shot because a tall, young, beautiful girl like me, Luciana, let you sleep with her and did not ask you for money. How much money are you asking me for? He asked her. Stupid, oh, she shouted with emotion. I'm not asking you for any money. She stamped her foot and raised her arm in a turbulent gesture that made Yossarian fear she was going to crack him in the face again with her great pocketbook. Instead, she scribbled her name and address on a slip of paper and thrust it at him. Here, she taunted him sardonically, biting on her lip to still a delicate tremor. Don't forget... Don't forget to tear it into tiny pieces as soon as I am gone. Then she smiled at him serenely, squeezed his hand, and with a whispered, regretful, Adio, pressed herself against him for a moment, and then straightened and walked away with unconscious dignity and grace. The minute she was gone, Yossarian tore the slip of paper up and walked away in the other direction, feeling very much like a big shot because a beautiful young girl like Luciana had slept with him and did not ask for money. He was pretty pleased with himself until he looked up in the dining room of the Red Cross building and found himself eating breakfast with dozens and dozens of other servicemen in all kinds of fantastic uniforms. And then all at once he was surrounded by images of Luciana getting out of her clothes and into her clothes and caressing and haranguing him tempestuously in the pink rayon chemise she wore in bed with him and would not take off. Yossarian choked on his toast and eggs at the enormity of his error in tearing her long, lithe, nude, young, vibrant limbs into tiny pieces of paper so impudently and dumping her down so smugly into the gutter from the curb. He missed her terribly already. There were so many strident, faceless people in uniform in the dining room with him. He felt an urgent desire to be alone with her again soon, and sprang up impetuously from his table and went running outside and back down the street toward the apartment in search of the tiny bits of paper in the gutter, but they had all been flushed away by a street cleaner's hose. He couldn't find her again in the Allied officers' nightclub that evening or in the sweltering, burnished, hedonistic bedlam of the black market restaurant with its vast, bobbing wooden trays of elegant food and its chirping flock of bright and lovely girls. He couldn't even find the restaurant. When he went to bed alone... He dodged flack over Bologna again in a dream, with Arfi hanging over his shoulder abominably in the plain with a bloated, sordid leer. In the morning he ran looking for Luciana in all the French offices he could find, but nobody knew what he was talking about. And then he ran in terror, so jumpy, distraught, and disorganized that he just had to keep running in terror somewhere, to the enlisted men's apartment for the squat maid in the lime-colored panties, whom he found dusting in Snowden's room on the fifth floor in her drab brown sweater and heavy dark skirt. Snowden was still alive then, and Yossarian could tell it was Snowden's room from the name stenciled in white on the blue duffel bag he tripped over as he plunged through the doorway at her in a frenzy of creative desperation. The woman caught him by the wrists before he could fall, as he came stumbling toward her in need, and pulled him along down on top of her as she flopped over backward onto the bed, and enveloped him hospitably in her flaccid and consoling embrace, her dust mop aloft in her hand like a banner 
as her broad, brutish, congenial face gazed up at him fondly with a smile of unperjured friendship. There was a sharp, elastic snap as she rolled the lime-colored panties off beneath them both without disturbing him. He stuffed money into her hand when they were finished. She hugged him in gratitude. He hugged her. She hugged him back, and then pulled him down on top of her on the bed again. He stuffed more money into her hand when they were finished this time, and ran out of the room before she could begin hugging him in gratitude again. Back at his own apartment, he threw his things together as fast as he could, left for Nately what money he had, and ran back to Pianoza on a supply plane to apologize to Hungry Joe for shutting him out of the bedroom. The apology was unnecessary, for Hungry Joe was in high spirits when Yasarian found him. Hungry Joe was grinning from ear to ear, and Yasarian turned sick at the sight of him, for he understood instantly what the high spirits meant. Forty missions, Hungry Joe announced readily in a voice lyrical with relief and elation. The colonel raised them again. Yasarian was stunned. But I've got thirty-two, goddammit. Three more and I would have been through. Hungry Joe shrugged indifferently. The colonel wants forty missions, he repeated. Yasarian shoved him out of the way and ran right into the hospital. Chapter 17 The Soldier in White Yasarian ran right into the hospital, determined to remain there forever rather than fly one mission more than the thirty-two missions he had. Ten days after he changed his mind and came out, the colonel raised the missions to forty-five, and Yasarian ran right back in, determined to remain in the hospital forever rather than fly one mission more than the six missions more he had just flown. Yasarian could run into the hospital whenever he wanted to because of his liver and because of his eyes. The doctors couldn't fix his liver condition and couldn't meet his eyes each time he told them he had a liver condition. He could enjoy himself in the hospital just as long as there was no one really very sick in the same ward. His system was sturdy enough to survive a case of someone else's malaria or influenza with scarcely any discomfort at all. He could come through other people's tonsillectomies without suffering any post-operative distress and even endure their hernias and hemorrhoids with only mild nausea and revulsion but that was just about as much as he could go through without getting sick. After that, he was ready to bolt. He could relax in the hospital, since no one there expected him to do anything. All he was expected to do in the hospital was die or get better, and since he was perfectly all right to begin with, getting better was easy. Being in the hospital was better than being over Bologna or flying over Avignon with Hoople and Dobbs at the controls and Snowden dying in back. There were usually not nearly as many sick people inside the hospital as Yossarian saw outside the hospital, and there were generally fewer people inside the hospital who were seriously sick. There was a much lower death rate inside the hospital than outside the hospital, and a much healthier death rate. Few people died unnecessarily. People knew a lot more about dying inside the hospital and made a much neater, more orderly job of it. They couldn't dominate death inside the hospital, but they certainly made her behave. They had taught her manners. They couldn't keep death out, but while she was in, she had to act like a lady. People gave up the ghost with delicacy and taste inside the hospital. There was none of that crude, ugly ostentation about dying that was so common outside the hospital. They did not blow up in midair like Kraft or the dead man in Yossarian's tent, or freeze to death in the blazing summertime, the way Snowden had frozen to death after spilling his secret to Yossarian in the back of the plane. I'm cold, Snowden had whimpered. I'm cold. There, there, Yossarian had tried to comfort him. There, there. They didn't take it on the lamb weirdly inside a cloud the way Clevenger had done. They didn't explode into blood and clotted matter. They didn't drown or get struck by lightning, mangled by machinery or crushed in landslides. They didn't get shot to death in hold-ups, strangled to death in rapes, stabbed to death in saloons, bludgeoned to death with axes by parents or children, or die summarily by some other act of God. Nobody choked to death. People bled to death like gentlemen in an operating room or expired without comment in an oxygen tent. There was none of that tricky... Now you see me, now you don't business so much in vogue outside the hospital. None of that, now I am and now I ain't. 
There were no famines or floods. Children didn't suffocate in cradles or iceboxes or fall under trucks. No one was beaten to death. People didn't stick their heads into ovens with the gas on, jump in front of subway trains, or come plummeting like dead weights out of hotel windows with a whoosh, accelerating at the rate of 16 feet per second to land with a hideous plop on the sidewalk and die disgustingly there in public like an alpaca sack full of hairy strawberry ice cream, bleeding, pink toes awry. All things considered, Yossarian often preferred the hospital, even though it had its faults. The help tended to be officious, the rules, if heeded, restrictive, and the management meddlesome. Since sick people were apt to be present, he could not always depend on a lively young crowd in the same ward with him, and the entertainment was not always good. He was forced to admit that the hospitals had altered steadily for the worse as the war continued and one moved closer to the battlefront, the deterioration in the quality of the guests becoming most marked within the combat zone itself, where the effects of booming wartime conditions were apt to make themselves conspicuous immediately. The people got sicker and sicker the deeper he moved into combat, until finally in the hospital that last time there had been the soldier in white, who could not have been any sicker without being dead, and he soon was. The soldier in white was constructed entirely of gauze, plaster, and a thermometer, and the thermometer was merely an adornment left balanced in the empty, dark hole in the bandages over his mouth early each morning and late each afternoon by Nurse Kramer and Nurse Duckett. Right up to the afternoon, Nurse Kramer read the thermometer and discovered he was dead. Now that Yossarian looked back, it seemed that Nurse Kramer, rather than the talkative Texan, had murdered the soldier in white. If she had not read the thermometer and reported what she had found, the soldier in white might still be lying there alive, exactly as he had been lying there all along, encased from head to toe in plaster and gauze, with both strange, rigid legs elevated from the hips, and both strange arms strung up perpendicularly, all four bulky limbs in casts, all four strange, useless limbs hoisted up in the air by taut wire cables, and fantastically long lead weights suspended darkly above him. Lying there that way might not have been much of a life, but it was all the life he had, and the decision to terminate it, Yossarian felt, should hardly have been Nurse Kramer's. The soldier in white was like an unrolled bandage with a hole in it, or like a broken block of stone in a harbor with a crooked zinc pipe jutting out. The other patients in the ward, all but the Texan, shrank from him with a tender-hearted aversion from the moment they set eyes on him, the morning after the night he had been sneaked in. They gathered soberly in the farthest recess of the ward and gossiped about him in malicious, offended undertones, rebelling against his presence as a ghastly imposition and resenting him malevolently for the nauseating truth of which he was bright reminder. They shared a common dread that he would begin moaning. I don't know what I'll do if he does begin moaning, the dashing young fighter pilot with the golden mustache had grieved forlornly. It means he'll moan during the night, too, because he won't be able to tell time. No sound at all came from the soldier in white all the time he was there. The ragged round hole over his mouth was deep and jet black and showed no sign of lip, teeth, palate, or tongue. The only one who ever came close enough to look was the affable Texan, who came close enough several times a day to chat with him about more votes for the decent folk, opening each conversation with the same unvarying greeting. What do you say, fella? How you coming along? The rest of the men avoided them both in their regulation maroon corduroy bathrobes and unraveling flannel pajamas, wondering gloomily who the soldier in white was, why he was there and what he was really like inside. He's all right, I tell you, the Texan would report back to them encouragingly after each of his social visits. Deep down inside, he's a regular guy. He's feeling a little shy and insecure now because he doesn't know anybody here and can't talk. Why don't you all just step right up to him and introduce yourselves? He won't hurt you. What the goddamn hell are you talking about? Dunbar demanded. Does he even know what you're talking about? Well, sure he knows what I'm talking about. He's not stupid. There ain't nothing wrong with him. Can he hear you? Well, I don't know if he can hear me or not, but I'm sure he knows what I'm talking about. Does that hole over his mouth ever move? Now, what kind of a crazy question is that? The Texan asked uneasily. How can you tell if he's breathing if it never moves? How can you tell if it's a he? 
Does he have pads over his eyes underneath that bandage over his face? Does he ever wiggle his toes or move the tips of his fingers? The Texan backed away in mounting confusion. Now, what kind of a crazy question is that? You fellas must all be crazy or something. Why don't you just walk right up to him and get acquainted? He's a real nice guy, I tell you. The soldier in white was more like a stuffed and sterilized mummy than a real nice guy. Nurse Duckett and Nurse Kramer kept him spick and span. They brushed his bandages often with a whisk broom and scrubbed the plaster casts on his arms, legs, shoulders, chest, and pelvis with soapy water. Working with a round tin of metal polish, they waxed a dim gloss on the dull zinc pipe rising from the cement on his groin. With damp dish towels, they wiped the dust several times a day from the slim black rubber tubes leading in and out of him to the two large stoppered jars. One of them hanging on a post beside his bed, dripping fluid into his arm constantly through a slit in the bandages, while the other, almost out of sight on the floor, drained the fluid away through the zinc pipe rising from his groin. Both young nurses polished the glass jars unceasingly. They were proud of their housework. The more solicitous of the two was Nurse Kramer, a shapely, pretty, sexless girl with a wholesome, unattractive face. Nurse Kramer had a cute nose and a radiant, blooming complexion dotted with fetching sprays of adorable freckles that Yossarian detested. She was touched very deeply by the soldier in white. Her virtuous, pale blue, saucer-like eyes flooded with leviathan tears on unexpected occasions and made Yossarian mad. How the hell do you know he's even in there? he asked her. Don't you dare talk to me that way, she replied indignantly. Well, how do you? You don't even know if it's really him. Who? Oh, whoever's supposed to be in all those bandages, you might really be weeping for somebody else. How do you know he's even alive? Oh, what a terrible thing to say, Nurse Kramer exclaimed. Now you get right into bed and stop making jokes about him. I'm not making jokes. Anybody might be in there. For all we know, it might even be mud. What are you talking about? Nurse Kramer pleaded with him in a quavering voice. Maybe that's where the dead man is. What dead man? I've got a dead man in my tent that nobody can throw out. His name is Mud. Nurse Kramer's face blanched, and she turned to Dunbar desperately for aid. Make him stop saying things like that, she begged. Maybe there's no one inside, Dunbar suggested helpfully. Maybe they just sent the bandages here for a joke. She stepped away from Dunbar in alarm. You're crazy, she cried, glancing about imploringly. You're both crazy. Nurse Duckett showed up then and chased them all back to their own beds, while Nurse Kramer changed the stoppered jars for the soldier in white. Changing the jars for the soldier in white was no trouble at all, since the same clear fluid was dripped back inside him over and over again with no apparent loss. When the jar feeding the inside of his elbow was just about empty, the jar on the floor was just about full, and the two were simply uncoupled from their respective hoses and reversed quickly so that the liquid could be dripped right back into him. Changing the jars was no trouble to anyone, but the men who watched them changed every hour or so and were baffled by the procedure. Why can't they hook the two jars up to each other and eliminate the middleman? The artillery captain with whom Yossarian had stopped playing chess inquired. What the hell do they need him for? I wonder what he did to deserve it, the warrant officer with malaria and a mosquito bite on his ass lamented after Nurse Kramer had read her thermometer and discovered that the soldier in white was dead. He went to war, the fighter pilot with the golden mustache surmised. We all went to war, Dunbar countered. That's what I mean, the warrant officer with malaria continued. Why him? There just doesn't seem to be any logic to this system of rewards and punishment. Look what happened to me. If I'd gotten syphilis or a dose of clap for my five minutes of passion on the beach instead of this damn mosquito bite, I could see justice. But malaria? Malaria? Who can explain malaria as a consequence of fornication? The warrant officer shook his head in numb astonishment. What about me? Yossarian said. I stepped out of my tent in Marrakesh one night to get a bar of candy and caught your dose of clap when that whack I never even saw before hissed me into the bushes. All I really wanted was a bar of candy, but who could turn it down? That sounds like my dose of clap, all right, the warrant officer agreed. But I've still got somebody else's malaria. Just for once, I'd like to see all these things sort of straightened out, with each person getting exactly what he deserves 
It might give me some confidence in this universe. I've got somebody else's three hundred thousand dollars, the dashing young fighter captain with the golden mustache admitted. I've been goofing off since the day I was born. I cheated my way through prep school and college, and just about all I've been doing ever since is shacking up with pretty girls who think I'd make a good husband. I've got no ambition at all. The only thing I want to do after the war is marry some girl who's got more money than I have and shack up with lots more pretty girls. The three hundred thousand bucks was left to me before I was born by a grandfather who made a fortune selling on an international scale. I know I don't deserve it, but I'll be damned if I give it back. I wonder who it really belongs to. Maybe it belongs to my father. Dunbar conjectured. He spent a lifetime at hard work and never could make enough money to even send my sister and me through college. He's dead now. She might as well keep it. Now, if we can just find out who my malaria belongs to, we'd be all set. It's not that I've got anything against malaria. I'm just as soon gold brick with malaria as with anything else. It's only that I feel an injustice has been committed. Why should I have somebody else's malaria, and you have my dose of clap? I've got more than your dose of clap, Yossarian told him. I've got to keep flying combat missions because of that dose of yours until they kill me. Well, that makes it even worse. What's the justice in that? I had a friend named Clevenger two and a half weeks ago who used to see plenty of justice in it. It's the highest kind of justice of all, Clevenger had gloated, clapping his hands with a merry laugh. I can't help thinking of the Hippolytus of Euripides, where the early licentiousness of Theseus is probably responsible for the asceticism of the sun that helps bring about the tragedy that ruins them all. If nothing else, that episode with the wax should teach you the evil of sexual immorality. It teaches me the evil of candy. Can't you see that you're not exactly without blame for the predicament you're in? Clevenger had continued with undisguised relish. If you hadn't been laid up in the hospital with venereal disease for ten days back there in Africa, you might have finished your twenty-five missions in time to be sent home before Colonel Nevers was killed and Colonel Cathcart came to replace him. And what about you? Yusarian had replied. You never got clap in Marrakesh, and you're in the same predicament. I don't know," confessed Clevenger with a trace of mock concern. "I guess I must have done something very bad in my time. Do you really believe that?" Clevenger laughed. No, of course not. I just like to kid you along a little. There were too many dangers for Yossarian to keep track of. There was Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo, for example, and they were all out to kill him. There was Lieutenant Scheisskopf with his fanaticism for parades, and there was the bloated Colonel with his big fat mustache and his fanaticism for retribution, and they wanted to kill him too. There was Appleby. Havermeyer, Black, and Corn. There was Nurse Kramer and Nurse Duckett, who he was almost certain wanted him dead, and there was the Texan and the CID man about whom he had no doubt. There were bartenders, bricklayers, and bus conductors all over the world who wanted him dead. Landlords and tenants, traders and patriots, lynchers, leeches, and lackeys, and they were all out to bump him off. That was the secret Snowden had spilled to him on the mission to Avignon. They were out to get him. And Snowden had spilled it all over the back of the plane. There were lymph glands that might do him in. There were kidneys, nerve sheaths, and corpuscles. There were tumors of the brain. There was Hodgkin's disease, leukemia, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. There were fertile red meadows of epithelial tissue to catch and coddle a cancer cell. There were diseases of the skin, diseases of the bone. Diseases of the lung, diseases of the stomach, diseases of the heart, blood, and arteries. There were diseases of the head, diseases of the neck, diseases of the chest, diseases of the intestines, diseases of the crotch. There even were diseases of the feet. There were billions of conscientious body cells oxidating away day and night like dumb animals at their complicated job of keeping him alive and healthy, and every one was a potential traitor and foe. There were so many diseases that it took a truly diseased mind to even think about them, as often as he and Hungry Joe did. Hungry Joe collected lists of fatal diseases and arranged them in alphabetical order so that he could put his finger without delay on any one he wanted to worry about. He grew very upset whenever he misplaced some or when he could not add to his list, and he would go rushing in a cold sweat to Doctor Nika for help. Give him Ewing's tumor. Yasserian advised Doctor Nika, who had come to Yasserian for help in handling Hungry Joe, and follow it up with melanoma. Hungry Joe likes lingering diseases, but he likes the fulminating ones even more. Doctor Nika had never heard of either. 
How do you manage to keep up on so many diseases like that? He inquired with high professional esteem. I learn about them at the hospital when I study the Reader's Digest. Yossarian had so many ailments to be afraid of that he was sometimes tempted to turn himself into the hospital for good and spend the rest of his life stretched out there inside an oxygen tent with a battery of specialists and nurses seated at one side of his bed 24 hours a day waiting for something to go wrong and at least one surgeon with a knife poised at the other, ready to jump forward and begin cutting away the moment it became necessary. Aneurysms, for instance. How else could they ever defend him in time against an aneurysm of the aorta? Yossarian felt much safer inside the hospital than outside the hospital, even though he loathed the surgeon and his knife as much as he had ever loathed anyone. He could start screaming inside a hospital, and people would at least come running to try to help. Outside the hospital, they would throw him in prison if he ever started screaming about all the things he felt everyone ought to start screaming about, or they would put him in the hospital. One of the things he wanted to start screaming about was the surgeon's knife that was almost certain to be waiting for him, and everyone else who lived long enough to die. He wondered often how he would ever recognize the first chill, flush, twinge, ache, belch, sneeze, stain, lethargy, vocal slip, loss of balance, or lapse of memory that would signal the inevitable beginning of the inevitable end. He was afraid also that Dr. Nika would still refuse to help him when he went to him again after jumping out of Major Major's office, and he was right. "'You think you've got something to be afraid about?' Dr. Nika demanded, lifting his delicate, immaculate dark head up from his chest to gaze at Yossarian irascibly for a moment with lachrymose eyes. What about me? My precious medical skills are rusting away here on this lousy island while other doctors are cleaning up. Do you think I enjoy sitting here day after day refusing to help you? I wouldn't mind it so much if I could refuse to help you back in the States or in some place like Rome, but saying no to you here isn't easy for me either. Then stop saying no. Ground me. I can't ground you, Dr. Nika mumbled. How many times do you have to be told? Yes, you can. Major Major told me you're the only one in the squadron who can ground me. Dr. Nika was stunned. Major Major told you that? When? When I tackled him in the ditch. Major Major told you that? In a ditch? He told me in his office after we left the ditch and jumped inside. He told me not to tell anyone he told me. So don't start shooting your mouth off. Why, that dirty, scheming liar, Dr. Nika cried. He wasn't supposed to tell anyone. Did he tell you how I could ground you? Just by filling out a little slip of paper saying I'm on the verge of a nervous collapse and sending it to group. Dr. Stubbs grounds men in his squadron all the time, so why can't you? And what happens to the men after Stubbs does ground them? Dr. Nika retorted with a sneer. They go right back on combat status, don't they? And he finds himself right up the creek. Sure, I can ground you by filling out a slip saying you're unfit to fly, but there's a catch. Catch-22? Sure. If I take you off combat duty, group has to approve my action. And group isn't going to. They'll put you right back on combat status, and then where will I be? On my way to the Pacific Ocean, probably. No, thank you. I'm not going to take any chances for you. Isn't it worth a try? Yossarian argued. What's so hard about Pianosa? Pianosa is terrible, but it's better than the Pacific Ocean. I wouldn't mind being shipped someplace civilized where I might pick up a buck or two in abortion money every now and then. But all they've got in the Pacific is jungles and the monsoons. I'd rot there. You're rotting here. Dr. Nika flared up angrily. Yeah? Well, at least I'm going to come out of this war alive, which is a lot more than you are going to do. That's just what I'm trying to tell you, goddammit. I'm asking you to save my life. It's not my business to save lives, Dr. Nika retorted sullenly. What is your business? I don't know what my business is. All they ever told me was to uphold the ethics of my profession and never give testimony against another physician. Listen, you think you're the only one whose life is in danger. What about me? Those two quacks I've got working for me in the medical tent still can't find out what's wrong with me. Maybe it's Ewing's tumor. Yossarian muttered sarcastically. Do you really think so? Dr. Nika exclaimed with fright. Oh, I don't know, Yossarian answered impatiently. I just know I'm not going to fly any more missions. They wouldn't really shoot me, would they? I've got 51. Now why don't you at least finish the 55 before you take a stand? Dr. Nika advised. With all your bitching, you've never finished the tour of duty even once. 
How the hell can I? The colonel keeps raising them every time I get close. You never finish your missions because you keep running into the hospital and going off to Rome. You'd be in a much stronger position if you had your 55 finished and then refused to fly. Then, then maybe I'd see what I could do. Do you promise? I promise. What do you promise? I promise that maybe I'll think about doing something to help if you finish your 55 missions and if you get McWatt to put my name on his flight log again so that I can draw my flight pay without going up in a plane. I'm afraid of airplanes. Did you read about that airplane crash in Idaho three weeks ago? Six people killed. It was terrible. I don't know why they want me to put in four hours flight time every month in order to get my flight pay. Don't I have enough to worry about without worrying about being killed in an airplane crash, do? I worry about the airplane crashes also, Yesarian told him. You're not the only one. Yeah, but I'm also pretty worried about that Ewing's tumor, Dr. Nika boasted. Do you think that's why my nose is stuffed all the time and why I always feel so chilly? Take my pulse. Yesarian also worried about Ewing's tumor and melanoma. Catastrophes were lurking everywhere, too numerous to count. When he contemplated the many diseases and potential accidents threatening him, he was positively astounded that he had managed to survive in good health for as long as he had. It was miraculous. Each day he faced was another dangerous mission against mortality, and he had been surviving them for twenty-eight years. Chapter 18 The Soldier Who Saw Everything Twice Eusarian owed his good health to exercise, fresh air, teamwork, and good sportsmanship. It was to get away from them all that he had first discovered the hospital. When the physical education officer at Lowry Field ordered everyone to fall out for calisthenics one afternoon, Eusarian, the private, reported instead at the dispensary with what he said was a pain in his right side. Beat it, said the doctor on duty there who was doing a crossword puzzle. We can't tell him to beat it, said a corporal. There's a new directive out about abdominal complaints. We have to keep them under observation five days because so many of them have been dying after we make them beat it. Uh, all right, grumbled the doctor. Keep them under observation five days and then make them beat it. They took Eusarian's clothes away and put him in a ward where he was very happy when no one was snoring nearby. In the morning, a helpful young English intern popped in to ask him about his liver. Mm, I think it's my appendix that's bothering me, Yesarian told him. Your appendix is no good, the Englishman declared with jaunty authority. If your appendix goes wrong, we can take it out and have you back on active duty in almost no time at all. But come to us with a liver complaint and you can fool us for weeks. The liver, you see, is a large, ugly mystery to us. If you've ever eaten liver, you know what I mean. We're pretty sure today that the liver exists and we have a fairly good idea of what it does whenever it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Beyond that, we're really in the dark. After all, what is a liver? My father, for example, died of cancer of the liver and was never sick a day of his life right up till the moment it killed him. Never felt a twinge of pain. In a way, that was too bad, since I hated my father. Lust for my mother, you know. What's uh, an English medical officer doing on duty here? Yossarian wanted to know. The officer laughed. I'll tell you all about that when I see you tomorrow morning, and throw that silly ice bag away before you die of pneumonia. Yossarian never saw him again. That was one of the nice things about all the doctors at the hospital. He never saw any of them a second time. They came and went and simply disappeared. In place of the English intern, the next day there arrived a group of doctors he had never seen before to ask him about his appendix. Oh, there's nothing wrong with my appendix, Yesarian informed them. The doctor yesterday said it was my liver. Maybe it is his liver, replied the white-haired officer in charge. What does his blood count show? He hasn't had a blood count. Have one taken right away. We can't afford to take chances with a patient in his condition. We've got to keep ourselves covered in case he dies. He made a notation on his clipboard and spoke to Yesarian. In the meantime, keep that ice bag on. It's very important. I don't have an ice bag on. Well, get one. There must be an ice bag around here somewhere. And let someone know if the pain becomes unendurable. At the end of ten days, a new group of doctors came to Yossarian with bad news. He was in perfect health and had to get out. He was rescued in the nick of time by a patient across the aisle who began to see everything twice. 
Without warning, the patient sat up in bed and shouted, I see everything twice! A nurse screamed and an orderly fainted. Doctors came running up from every direction with needles, lights, tubes, rubber mallets, and oscillating metal tines. They rolled up complicated instruments on wheels. There was not enough of the patient to go around, and specialists pushed forward in line with raw tempers and snapped at their colleagues in front to hurry up and give somebody else a chance. A colonel with a large forehead and horn-rimmed glasses soon arrived at a diagnosis. It's meningitis, he called out emphatically, waving the others back. Although Lord knows there's not the slightest reason for thinking so. Then why pick meningitis, inquired a major with a suave chuckle. Why not, let's say, acute nephritis? Because I'm a meningitis man, that's why, and not an acute nephritis man, retorted the colonel. And I'm not going to give him up to any of you kidney birds without a struggle. I was here first. In the end, the doctors were all in accord. They agreed they had no idea what was wrong with the soldier who saw everything twice, and they rolled him away into a room in the corridor and quarantined everyone else in the ward for 14 days. Thanksgiving Day came and went without any fuss while Yossarian was still in the hospital. The only bad thing about it was the turkey for dinner, and even that was pretty good. It was the most rational Thanksgiving he had ever spent, and he took a sacred oath to spend every future Thanksgiving Day in the cloistered shelter of a hospital. He broke his sacred oath the very next year when he spent the holiday in a hotel room instead in intellectual conversation with Lieutenant Scheiskopf's wife, who had Dory Duz's dog tags on for the occasion and who henpecked Eusarian sententiously for being cynical and callous about Thanksgiving, even though she didn't believe in God just as much as he didn't. I'm probably just as good an atheist as you are, she speculated boastfully. But even I feel that we all have a great deal to be thankful for and that we shouldn't be ashamed to show it. Name one thing I've got to be thankful for, Yossarian challenged her without interest. Well? Lieutenant Scheiskopf's wife mused and paused a moment to ponder dubiously. Me? Oh, come on, he scoffed. She arched her eyebrows in surprise. Aren't you thankful for me? she asked. She frowned peevishly, her pride wounded. I don't have to shack up with you, you know, she told him with cold dignity. My husband has a whole squadron full of aviation cadets who would be only too happy to shack up with their commanding officer's wife just for the added Philip it would give them. Vissarion decided to change the subject. Now you're changing the subject, he pointed out diplomatically. I'll bet I can name two things to be miserable about for every one you can name to be thankful for. Be thankful you've got me, she insisted. I am, honey. But I'm also goddamn good and miserable that I can't have Dory does again, too. Or the hundreds of other girls and women I'll see and want in my short lifetime and won't be able to go to bed with even once. Be thankful you're healthy. Be bitter you're not going to stay that way. Be glad you're even alive. Be furious you're going to die. Things could be much worse, she cried. They could be one hell of a lot better, he answered heatedly. You're naming only one thing, she protested. You said you could name two. And don't tell me God works in mysterious ways, Ysarian continued, hurtling on over her objection. There's nothing so mysterious about it. He's not working at all. He's playing. Or else he's forgotten all about us. That's the kind of God you people talk about. A country bumpkin, a, a clumsy, bungling, brainless, conceited, uncouth hayseed. Good God, how much reverence can you have for a supreme being who finds it necessary to include such phenomena as phlegm and tooth decay in his divine system of creation? What in the world was running through that warped, evil, scatological mind of his when he robbed old people of the power to control their bowel movements? Why in the world did he ever create pain? Pain? Lieutenant Scheiskopf's wife pounced upon the word victoriously. Pain is a useful symptom. Pain is a warning to us of bodily dangers. And who created the dangers? Yossarian demanded. He laughed caustically. Oh, he was really being charitable to us when he gave us pain. Why couldn't he have used a doorbell instead to notify us, or one of his celestial choirs, or a system of blue and red neon tubes right in the middle of each person's forehead? Any jukebox manufacturer with his salt could have done that. Why couldn't he? People would certainly look silly walking around with red neon tubes in the middle of their foreheads. They certainly look beautiful now, writhing in agony or stupefied with morphine, don't they? What a colossal immortal blunderer. When you consider the opportunity and power he had to really do a job, and then look at the stupid, ugly little mess he made of it instead. His sheer incompetence is almost staggering. It's obvious he never met a payroll. 
Why, no self-respecting businessman would hire a bungler like him as even a shipping clerk. Lieutenant Shyskop's wife had turned ashen in disbelief and was ogling him with alarm. You'd better not talk that way about him, honey, she warned him reprovingly in a low and hostile voice. He might punish you. Isn't he punishing me enough? Yossarian snorted resentfully. You know, we mustn't let him get away with it. Oh, no, we certainly mustn't let him get away scot-free for all the sorrow he's caused us. Someday I'm going to make him pay. I know when. On the judgment day. Yes, that's the day I'll be close enough to reach out and grab that little yokel by his neck and... Stop it! Stop it! Lieutenant Shyskop's wife screamed suddenly and began beating him ineffectually about the head with both fists. Stop it! Yossarian ducked behind his arm for protection while she slammed away at him in feminine fury for a few seconds, and then he caught her determinedly by the wrist and forced her gently back down on the bed. What the hell are you getting so upset about? he asked her bewilderedly in a tone of contrite amusement. I thought you didn't believe in God. I don't, she sobbed, bursting violently into tears. But the God I don't believe in is a good God, a just God, a merciful God. He's not the mean and stupid God you make him out to be. Yossarian laughed and turned her arms loose. Let's have a little more religious freedom between us, he proposed obligingly. You don't believe in the God you want to, and I won't believe in the God I want to. Is that a deal? That was the most illogical Thanksgiving he could ever remember spending, and his thoughts returned wishfully to his halcyon fourteen-day quarantine in a hospital the year before. But even that idyll had ended on a tragic note. He was still in good health when the quarantine period was over, and they told him again that he had to get out and go to war. Yossarian sat up in bed when he heard the bad news and shouted, I see everything twice! Pandemonium broke loose in the ward again. The specialists came running up from all directions and ringed him in a circle of scrutiny so confining that he could feel the humid breath from their various noses blowing uncomfortably upon the different sectors of his body. They went snooping into his eyes and ears with tiny beams of light, assaulted his legs and feet with rubber hammers and vibrating forks, drew blood from his veins, held anything handy up for him to see on the periphery of his vision. The leader of this team of doctors was a dignified, solicitous gentleman who held one finger up directly in front of Yossarian and demanded, How many fingers do you see? Two, said Yossarian. How many fingers do you see now? asked the doctor, holding up two. Two, said Yossarian. And how many now? asked the doctor, holding up none. Two, said Yossarian. The doctor's face wreathed with a smile. By Jove, he's right, he declared jubilantly. He does see everything twice. They rolled Yossarian away on a stretcher into the room with the other soldier who saw everything twice and quarantined everyone else in the ward for another fourteen days. I see everything twice, the soldier who saw everything twice shouted when they rolled Yossarian in. I see everything twice, Yossarian shouted back at him just as loudly with a secret wink. The walls, the walls! The other soldier cried, Move back the walls! The walls, the walls, Yossarian cried. Move back the walls! One of the doctors pretended to shove the wall back. Is that far enough? The soldier who saw everything twice nodded weakly and sank back on his bed. Yossarian nodded weakly too, eyeing his talented roommate with great humility and admiration. He knew he was in the presence of a master. His talented roommate was obviously a person to be studied and emulated. During the night, his talented roommate died, and Yossarian decided that he had followed him far enough. I see everything once, he cried quickly. A new group of specialists came pounding up to his bedside with their instruments to find out if it was true. How many fingers do you see? asked the leader, holding up one. One. The doctor held up two fingers. How many fingers do you see now? One. The doctor held up ten fingers. And how many now? One. The doctor turned to the other doctors with amazement. He does see everything once, he exclaimed. We made him all better. And just in time, too, announced the doctor with whom Yossarian next found himself alone, a tall, torpedo-shaped, congenial man with an unshaven growth of brown beard and a pack of cigarettes in his shirt pocket that he chain-smoked insouciantly as he leaned against the wall. There are some <coughs> relatives here to see you. Oh, <laughs> don't worry, he added with a laugh. Not your relatives. <coughs> it's the uh, mother, father, and brother of that chap who died. Uh, they've <coughs> traveled all the way from New York to see a dying soldier, and uh, 
You're the handiest one we've got. W what are you talking about? Yossarian asked suspiciously. I I'm not dying. <laughs> of course you're dying. We're all dying. <laughs> Where the devil else do you think you're heading? Uh, they didn't come to see me, Yossarian objected. They came to see their son. <laughs> They'll have to take what they can get. As far as we're concerned, one dying boy is just as good as any other, or just as bad. <laughs> to a scientist, all dying boys are equal. Yeah, I, I have a proposition for you. You let them come in and look you over for a few minutes, and <laughs> I won't tell anyone you've been lying about your liver symptoms. Yossarian drew back from him farther. You know about that? Of course I do. <laughs> Give us some credit. The doctor chuckled amiably and lit another cigarette. <coughs> How do you expect anyone to believe you have a liver condition if you keep squeezing the nurse's tits every time you get a chance? You're going to have to give up sex if you want to convince people you've got an ailing liver. Well, that's a hell of a price to pay just to keep alive. Why didn't you turn me in if you knew I was faking? Why the devil should I? asked the doctor with a flicker of surprise. We're all in this business of illusion together. <laughs> I'm always willing to lend a helping hand to a fellow conspirator along the road to survival if he's willing to do the same for me. These people have come a long way, and uh, <laughs> I'd rather not disappoint them. Huh? I'm sentimental about old people. But they came to see their son. They came too late. Maybe they won't even notice the difference. Suppose they start crying. Well, they probably will start crying. That's one of the reasons they came. Yeah, I'll listen outside the door and break it up if it starts getting tacky. That all sounds a bit crazy, Yossarian reflected. What do they want to watch their son die for, anyway? I've never been able to figure that one out, the doctor admitted. But they always do. Well, what do you say? Huh? <laughs> all you've got to do is lie there a few minutes and die a little. Is that asking so much? All right, Yossarian gave in. If it's just for a few minutes and you promise to wait right outside. He warmed to his role. Say, um, why don't you wrap a, a bandage around me for effect? Oh, that sounds like a splendid idea, applauded the doctor. They wrapped a batch of bandages around Yossarian. A team of medical orderlies installed tan shades on each of the two windows and lowered them to douse the room in depressing shadows. Eusarian suggested flowers, and the doctor sent an orderly out to find two small bunches of fading ones with a strong and sickening smell. When everything was in place, they made Eusarian get back into bed and lie down. Then they admitted the visitors. The visitors entered uncertainly, as though they felt they were intruding, tiptoeing in with stares of meek apology. First the grieving mother and father, then the brother, a glowering, heavy-set sailor with a deep chest. The man and woman stepped into the room stiffly, side by side, as though right out of a familiar, though esoteric, anniversary daguerreotype on a wall. They were both short, sere, and proud. They seemed made of iron and old, dark clothing. The woman had a long, brooding, oval face of burnt umber, with coarse, graying black hair, parted severely in the middle and combed back austerely behind her neck without curl, wave, or ornamentation. Her mouth was sullen and sad. Her lined lips compressed. The father stood very rigid and quaint in a double-breasted suit with padded shoulders that were much too tight for him. He was broad and muscular on a small scale and had a magnificently curled silver mustache on his crinkled face. His eyes were creased and roomy, and he appeared tragically ill at ease as he stood awkwardly with the brim of his black felt fedora held in his two brawny laborer's hands out in front of his wide lapels. Poverty and hard work had inflicted iniquitous damage on both. The brother was looking for a fight. His round white cap was cocked at an insolent tilt. His hands were clenched, and he glared at everything in the room with a scowl of injured truculence. The three creaked forward timidly, holding themselves close to each other in a stealthy funereal group, and inching forward almost in step, until they arrived at the side of the bed and stood staring down at Yossarian. There was a gruesome and excruciating silence that threatened to endure forever. Finally, Yossarian was unable to bear it any longer and cleared his throat. The old man spoke at last. He looks terrible, he said. He's sick, pa. Giuseppe, 
me, said the mother, who had seated herself in a chair with her veinous fingers clasped in her lap. My name is Yossarian, Yossarian said. His name is Yossarian, ma. Hey, Yossarian, don't you recognize me? I'm your brother, John. Don't you know who I am? Sure I do. Uh, you're my brother, John. Hey, he does recognize me. Pa, he knows who I am. You're Syrian. He's Papa. Say hello to Papa. Hello, Papa, said Yossarian. Hello, Giuseppe. His name is Yossarian, Pa. I can't get over how terrible he looks, the father said. He's very sick, Pa. The doctor says he's going to die. I didn't know whether to believe the doctor or not, the father said. You know how crooked those guys are. Giuseppe, the mother said again, in a soft, broken chord of muted anguish. His name is Yossarian. Ma! Man, she don't remember things too good anymore. How are they treating you in here, kid? They treating you pretty good? Pretty good, Yossarian told him. That's good. Just don't let anybody in here push you around. You're just as good as anybody else in here, even though you are Italian. You got rice, too. Yossarian winced and closed his eyes so that he would not have to look at his brother John. He began to feel sick. Oh, now see how terrible he looks, the father observed. Giuseppe, the mother said. Ma, his name is Yossarian, the brother interrupted her impatiently. Can't you remember? It's all right, Yossarian interrupted him. She can call me Giuseppe if she wants to. Giuseppe she said to him. Don't worry, you Syrian, the brother said. Everything's gonna be all right. Don't worry, Ma, the Syrian said. Everything is gonna be all right. Did you have a priest? The brother wanted to know. Yes, the Syrian lied, wincing again. That's good, the brother decided. Just as long as you're getting everything you got coming to you. We came all the way from New York. We were afraid we wouldn't get here in time. In time for what? In time to see you before you died. What difference would it make? We don't want you to die by yourself. What difference would it make? Hey, he must be getting delirious, the brother said. He keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Oh, that's really very funny, the old man replied. All the time I thought his name was a Giuseppe, and now I find out his name is Yossarian. Hey, that's really very funny. Ma, Make him feel good, the brother urged. Say something to cheer him up. Giuseppe. It's not Giuseppe, ma, it's Yossarian. What difference does it make? The mother answered in the same mourning tone without looking up. He's dying. Her tumid eyes filled with tears, and she began to cry, rocking back and forth slowly in her chair with her hands lying in her lap like fallen moths. Yossarian was afraid she would start wailing. The father and brother began crying also. Yossarian remembered suddenly why they were all crying, and he began crying too. A doctor Yossarian had never seen before stepped inside the room and told the visitors courteously that they had to go. The father drew himself up formally to say goodbye. Giuseppe, he began. Yossarian, corrected the son. Yossarian, said the father. Giuseppe, corrected Yossarian. Soon you're going to die. Yossarian began to cry again. The doctor threw him a dirty look from the rear of the room and Yossarian made himself stop. The father continued solemnly with his head lowered. When you talk to the man upstairs, he said, I want you to tell him something for me. Tell him. It ain't right for people to die when they're young. I mean it. Tell him if they've got to die at all, they've got to die when they're old. I want you to tell him that. I don't think he knows it ain't right, because he's supposed to be good, and it's been going on for a long, long time. Okay? And don't let anybody up there push you around, the brother advised. You'll be just as good as anybody else in heaven, even though you are Italian. Dress warm, said the mother, who seemed to know.
Chapter 19 Colonel Cathcart Colonel Cathcart was a slick, successful, slipshod, unhappy man of thirty-six who lumbered when he walked and wanted to be a general. He was dashing and dejected, poised and chagrined. He was complacent and insecure, daring in the administrative stratagems he employed to bring himself to the attention of his superiors, and craven in his concern that his schemes might all backfire. He was handsome and unattractive, a swashbuckling, beefy, conceited man who was putting on fat and was tormented chronically by prolonged seizures of apprehension. Colonel Cathcart was conceited because he was a full colonel with a combat command at the age of only thirty-six, and Colonel Cathcart was dejected, because although he was already thirty-six, he was still only a full colonel. Colonel Cathcart was impervious to absolutes. He could measure his own progress only in relationship to others, and his idea of excellence was to do something at least as well as all the men his own age who were doing the same thing even better. The fact that there were thousands of men his own age and older who had not even attained the rank of major enlivened him with foppish delight in his own remarkable worth. On the other hand, the fact that there were men of his own age and younger who were already generals contaminated him with an agonizing sense of failure and made him gnaw at his fingernails with an unappeasable anxiety that was even more intense than Hungry Joe's. Colonel Cathcart was a very large, pouting, broad-shouldered man with close-cropped curly dark hair that was graying at the tips and an ornate cigarette holder that he purchased the day before he arrived in Pianosa to take command of his group. He displayed the cigarette holder grandly on every occasion and had learned to manipulate it adroitly. Unwittingly, he had discovered deep within himself a fertile aptitude for smoking with a cigarette holder. As far as he could tell, his was the only cigarette holder in the whole Mediterranean theater of operations, and the thought was both flattering and disquieting. He had no doubts at all that someone as debonair and intellectual as General Peckham approved of his smoking with a cigarette holder, even though the two were in each other's presence rather seldom, which in a way was very lucky, Colonel Cathcart recognized with relief, since General Peckham might not have approved of his cigarette holder at all. When such misgivings assailed Colonel Cathcart, he choked back a sob and wanted to throw the damned thing away, but he was restrained by his unswerving conviction that the cigarette holder never failed to embellish his masculine, martial physique with a high gloss of sophisticated heroism that illuminated him to dazzling advantage among all the other full colonels in the American army with whom he was in competition. Although, how could he be sure? Colonel Cathcart was indefatigable that way, an industrious, intense, dedicated military tactician who calculated day and night in the service of himself. He was his own sarcophagus, a bold and infallible diplomat who was always berating himself disgustedly for all the chances he had missed and kicking himself regretfully for all the errors he had made. He was tense, irritable, bitter, and smug. He was a valorous opportunist who pounced hoggishly upon every opportunity Colonel Corn discovered for him and trembled in damp despair immediately afterwards at the possible consequences he might suffer. He collected rumors greedily and treasured gossip, he believed all the news he heard and had faith in none. He was on the alert constantly for every signal, shrewdly sensitive to relationships and situations that did not exist. He was someone in the know who was always striving pathetically to find out what was going on. He was a blustering, intrepid bully who brooded inconsolably over the terrible, ineradicable impressions he knew he kept making on people of prominence who were scarcely aware that he was even alive. Everybody was persecuting him. Colonel Cathcart lived by his wits in an unstable, arithmetical world of black eyes and feathers in his cap, of overwhelming imaginary triumphs and catastrophic imaginary defeats. He oscillated hourly between anguish and exhilaration, multiplying fantastically the grandeur of his victories and exaggerating tragically the seriousness of his defeats. Nobody ever caught him napping. If word reached him that General Dreedle or General Peckham had been smiling, frowning, or doing neither, he could not make himself rest until he had found an acceptable interpretation and grumbled mulishly until Colonel Corn persuaded him to relax and take things easy. Lieutenant Colonel Corn was a loyal, indispensable ally who got on Colonel Cathcart's nerves. Colonel Cathcart pledged eternal gratitude to Colonel Corn for the ingenious moves he devised, and was furious with him afterward when he realized they might not work. 
Colonel Cathcart was greatly indebted to Colonel Corn and did not like him at all. The two were very close. Colonel Cathcart was jealous of Colonel Corn's intelligence and had to remind himself often that Colonel Corn was still only a lieutenant colonel, even though he was almost ten years older than Colonel Cathcart, and that Colonel Corn had obtained his education at a state university. Colonel Cathcart bewailed the miserable fate that had given him for an invaluable assistant, someone as common as Colonel Corn. It was degrading to have to depend so thoroughly on a person who had been educated at a state university. If someone did have to become indispensable to him, Colonel Cathcart lamented it could just as easily have been someone wealthy and well-groomed, someone from a better family who was more mature than Colonel Corn and who did not treat Colonel Cathcart's desire to become a general as frivolously as Colonel Cathcart secretly suspected Colonel Corn secretly did. Colonel Cathcart wanted to be a general so desperately he was willing to try anything, even religion, and he summoned the chaplain to his office late one morning the week after he had raised the number of missions to sixty and pointed abruptly down toward his desk to his copy of the Saturday Evening Post. The colonel wore his cocky shirt color wide open, exposing a shadow of tough black bristles of beard on his egg-white neck and had a spongy hanging underlip. He was a person who never tanned, and he kept out of the sun as much as possible to avoid burning. The colonel was more than a head taller than the chaplain, and over twice as broad, and his swollen, overbearing authority made the chaplain feel frail and sickly by contrast. Take a look, chaplain, Colonel Cathcart directed, screwing a cigarette into his holder and seating himself affluently in the swivel chair behind his desk. Let me know what you think. The chaplain looked down at the open magazine compliantly and saw an editorial spread dealing with an American bomber group in England whose chaplain said prayers in the briefing room before each mission. The chaplain almost wept with happiness when he realized the colonel was not going to holler at him. The two had hardly spoken since the tumultuous evening Colonel Cathcart had thrown him out of the officers' club at General Dreedle's bidding after Chief White Halfoat had punched Colonel Moodus in the nose. The chaplain's initial fear had been that the colonel intended reprimanding him for having gone back into the officers' club without permission the evening before. He had gone there with Yossarian and Dunbar after the two had come unexpectedly to his tent in the clearing in the woods to ask him to join them. Intimidated as he was by Colonel Cathcart, he nevertheless found it easier to brave his displeasure than to decline the thoughtful invitation of his two new friends, whom he had met on one of his hospital visits just a few weeks before, and who had worked so effectively to insulate him against the myriad social vicissitudes involved in his official duty to live on closest terms of familiarity with more than 900 unfamiliar officers and enlisted men who thought him an odd duck. The chaplain glued his eyes to the pages of the magazine. He studied each photograph twice and read the captions intently as he organized his response to the colonel's question into a grammatically complete sentence that he rehearsed and reorganized in his mind a considerable number of times before he was able, finally, to muster the courage to reply. I think that saying prayers before each mission is a very moral and highly laudatory procedure, sir, he offered timidly and waited. Yeah, said the colonel, but I want to know if you think they'll work here. Uh, yes, sir, answered the chaplain after a few moments. I, I should think they would. Then I'd like to give it a try. The colonel's ponderous, farinaceous cheeks were tinted suddenly with glowing patches of enthusiasm. He rose to his feet and began walking around excitedly. Look how much good they've done for these people in England. Here's a picture of a colonel in the Saturday Evening Post whose chaplain conducts prayers before each mission. If the prayers work for him, they should work for us. Maybe if we say prayers, they'll put my picture in the Saturday Evening Post. The colonel sat down again and smiled distantly in lavish contemplation. The chaplain had no hint of what he was expected to say next. With a pensive expression on his oblong, rather pale face, he allowed his gaze to settle on several of the high bushels filled with red plum tomatoes that stood in rows against each of the walls. He pretended to concentrate on reply. After a while, he realized that he was staring at rows and rows of bushels of red plum tomatoes, and grew so intrigued by the question of what bushels brimming with red plum tomatoes were doing in a group commander's office that he forgot completely about the discussion of prayer meetings until Colonel Cathcart, in a genial digression, inquired, Would you like to buy some, chaplain? They come right off the farm Colonel Corn and I have up in the hills. 
I could let you have a bushel wholesale. Oh, uh, no, sir, I, I don't think so. Well, that's quite all right, the colonel assured him liberally. You don't have to. Milo is glad to snap up all we can produce. These were picked only yesterday. Notice how firm and ripe they are, like a young girl's breasts. The chaplain blushed, and the colonel understood at once that he had made a mistake. He lowered his head in shame, his cumbersome face burning. His fingers felt gross and unwieldy. He hated the chaplain venomously for being a chaplain and making a coarse blunder out of an observation that in any other circumstances he knew would have been considered witty and urbane. He tried miserably to recall some means of extricating them both from their devastating embarrassment. He recalled instead that the chaplain was only a captain, and he straightened at once with a shocked and outraged gasp. His cheeks grew tight with fury at the thought that he had just been duped into humiliation by a man who was almost the same age as he was and still only a captain, and he swung upon the chaplain avengingly with a look of such murderous antagonism that the chaplain began to tremble. The colonel punished him sadistically with a long, glowering, malignant, hateful, silent stare. "'We were speaking about something else,' he reminded the chaplain cuttingly at last. "'We were not speaking about the firm, ripe breasts of beautiful young girls, but about something else entirely. We were speaking about conducting religious services in the briefing room before each mission. Is there any reason why we can't?' "'No, sir,' the chaplain mumbled. "'Then we'll begin with this afternoon's mission.' The colonel's hostility softened gradually as he applied himself to details. Now, I want you to give a lot of thought to the kind of prayers we're going to say. I don't want anything heavy or sad. I'd like you to keep it light and snappy, something that will send the boys out feeling pretty good. Do you know what I mean? I don't want any of this uh, kingdom of God or valley of death stuff. That's all too negative. What are you making such a sour face for? I I'm, I'm sorry, sir, the chaplain stammered. I, I happen to be... Uh, Thinking of the uh, 23rd Psalm, just as you said that. How does that one go? That's the one you were just referring to, sir. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I. That's the one I was just referring to. It's out. What else have you got? Uh, save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto... No waters, the colonel decided, blowing ruggedly into his cigarette holder after flipping the butt down into his combed brass ashtray. Why don't we try something musical? How about the harps on the willows? That has the um, rivers of Babylon in it, sir, the chaplain replied. Uh, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Zion? Well, let's forget about that one right now. I'd like to know how that one even got in there. Haven't you got anything humorous that stays away from waters and valleys and God? And... Uh, I'd like to keep away from the subject of religion altogether, if we can. The chaplain was apologetic. I'm I'm sorry, sir, but uh, just about all the prayers I know are rather somber in tone and make at least some passing reference to God. Then let's get some new ones. The men are already doing enough bitching about the missions I send them on without rubbing it in with any sermons about God or death or paradise. Why can't we take a more positive approach? Why can't we all pray for something good? Like a tighter bomb pattern, for example. Couldn't we pray for a tighter bomb pattern? Well, yes, sir, I, I suppose so, the chaplain answered hesitantly. You wouldn't even need me. If that's all you wanted to do, you could do that yourself. I know I could, the colonel responded tartly. But what do you think you're here for? I could shop for my own food, too, but that's Milo's job, and that's why he's doing it for every group in the area. Your job is to lead us in prayer. And from now on, you're going to lead us in a prayer for a tighter bomb pattern before every mission. Is that clear? I think a tighter bomb pattern is something really worth praying for. It will be a feather in all our caps with General Peckham. General Peckham feels it makes a much nicer aerial photograph when the bombs explode close together. General Peckham, sir? That's right, chaplain. The colonel replied, chuckling paternally at the chaplain's look of puzzlement. I wouldn't want this to get around, but it looks like General Dreedle is finally on the way out, and that General Peckham is slated to replace him. Frankly, I'm not going to be sorry to see that happen. General Peckham is a very good man, and I think we'll all be much better off under him. On the other hand, it might never take place, and we'd still remain under General Dreedle. Frankly, I wouldn't be sorry to see that happen either, because General Dreedle is another very good man, and I think we'll all be much better off under him, too. I hope you're going to keep all this under your hat, Chaplain. 
I wouldn't want either one to get the idea I was throwing my support on the side of the other. Yes, sir. That's good, the colonel exclaimed and stood up jovially. But all this gossip isn't getting us into the Saturday evening post, eh, chaplain? Let's see what kind of procedure we can evolve. Incidentally, chaplain, not a word about this beforehand to Colonel Korn. Understand? Yes, sir. Colonel Cathcart began tramping back and forth reflectively in the narrow corridors left between his bushels of plum tomatoes and the desk and wooden chairs in the center of the room. I suppose we'll have to keep you waiting outside until the briefing is over, because all that information is classified. We, we, we can slip you in while Major Danby is synchronizing the watches. I don't think there's anything secret about the right time. We'll allocate about a minute and a half for you in the schedule. Will a minute and a half be enough? Yes, sir. If it doesn't include the time necessary to excuse the atheists from the room and admit the enlisted man. Colonel Cathcart stopped in his tracks. What atheists? He bellowed defensively, his whole manner changing in a flash to one of virtuous and belligerent denial. There are no atheists in my outfit. Atheism is against the law, isn't it? Uh, no, sir. It isn't? The colonel was surprised. Then it's un-American, isn't it? I'm not sure, sir, answered the chaplain. Well, I am, the colonel declared. I'm not going to disrupt our religious services just to accommodate a bunch of lousy atheists. They're getting no special privileges from me. They can stay right where they are and pray with the rest of us. And what's all this about enlisted men? Just how the hell do they get into this act? The chaplain felt his face flush. I I'm sorry, sir. I, I just assumed you would want the enlisted men to be present, since they would be going along on the same mission. Well, I don't. They've got a god and a chaplain of their own, haven't they? N no, sir. What are you talking about? You mean they pray to the same god we do? Yes, sir. And he listens? I think so, sir. Well, I'll be damned, remarked the colonel, and he snorted to himself in quizzical amusement. His spirits drooped suddenly a moment later, and he ran his hand nervously over his short, black, graying curls. Do you really think it's a good idea to let the enlisted men in? he asked with concern. I should think it only proper, sir. I'd like to keep them out, confided the colonel and began cracking his knuckles savagely as he wandered back and forth. Oh, don't get me wrong, chaplain. It isn't that I think the enlisted men are dirty, common, and inferior. It's that we just don't have enough room. Frankly, though, I just assume the officers and enlisted men didn't fraternize in the briefing room. They see enough of each other during the mission, it seems to me. Some of my very best friends are enlisted men, you understand, but that's about as close as I care to let them come. Honestly, now, chaplain, you wouldn't want your sister to marry an enlisted man, would you? My sister is an enlisted man, sir, the chaplain replied. The colonel stopped in his tracks again and eyed the chaplain sharply to make certain he was not being ridiculed. Just what do you mean by that remark, chaplain? Are you trying to be funny? Oh, n no, sir, the chaplain hastened to explain with a look of excruciating discomfort. She's a master sergeant in the Marines. The colonel had never liked the chaplain, and now he loathed and distrusted him. He experienced a keen premonition of danger and wondered if the chaplain, too, were plotting against him, if the chaplain's reticent, unimpressive manner were really just a sinister disguise, masking a fiery ambition that way down deep was crafty and unscrupulous. There was something funny about the chaplain, and the colonel soon detected what it was. The chaplain was standing stiffly at attention, for the colonel had forgotten to put him at ease. Let him stay that way, the colonel decided vindictively, just to show him who was boss and to safeguard himself against any loss of dignity that might devolve from his acknowledging the omission. Colonel Cathcart was drawn hypnotically toward the window with a massive, dull stare of moody introspection. The enlisted men were always treacherous, he decided. He looked downward in mournful gloom at the skeet shooting range he had ordered built for the officers on his headquarters staff, and he recalled the mortifying afternoon General Dreedle had tongue-lashed him ruthlessly in front of Colonel Corn and Major Danby and ordered him to throw open the range to all the enlisted men and officers on combat duty. The skeet-shooting range had been a real black eye for him, Colonel Cathcart was forced to conclude. He was positive that General Dreedle had never forgotten it, even though he was positive that General Dreedle didn't even remember it, which was really very unjust, Colonel Cathcart lamented, since the idea of the skeet-shooting range itself should have been a real feather in his cap even though it had been such a real black eye. 
Colonel Cathcart was helpless to assess exactly how much ground he had gained or lost with his goddamn skeet-shooting range and wished that Colonel Korn were in his office right then to evaluate the entire episode for him still one more time and assuage his fears. It was all very perplexing, all very discouraging. Colonel Cathcart took the cigarette holder out of his mouth, stood it on end inside the pocket of his shirt, and began gnawing on the fingernails of both hands grievously. Everybody was against him, and he was sick to his soul that Colonel Korn was not with him in this moment of crisis to help him decide what to do about the prayer meetings. He had almost no faith at all in the chaplain, who was still only a captain. Do you think, um, he asked, that keeping the enlisted men out might interfere with our chances of getting results? The chaplain hesitated, feeling himself on unfamiliar ground again. Yes, sir, he replied finally. I think it's conceivable that such an action could interfere with your chances of having the prayers for a tighter bond pattern answered. Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that, cried the colonel with his eyes blinking and splashing like puddles. You mean that God might even decide to punish me by giving us a looser bomb pattern? Well, yes, sir, said the chaplain. It's conceivable he might. Well, the hell with it, then, the colonel asserted in a huff of independence. I'm not going to set these damn prayer meetings up just to make things worse than they are. With a scornful snicker, he settled himself behind his desk, replaced the empty cigarette holder in his mouth, and lapsed into parturian silence for a few moments. Now oh, I think about it he confessed, as much to himself as to the chaplain. Having the men pray to God probably wasn't such a hard idea anyway. The editors of the Saturday Evening Post might not have cooperated. The colonel abandoned his project with remorse, for he had conceived it entirely on his own, and had hoped to unveil it as a striking demonstration to everyone that he had no real need for Colonel Corn. Once it was gone, he was glad to be rid of it, for he had been troubled from the start by the danger of instituting the plan without first checking it out with Colonel Corn. He heaved an immense sigh of contentment. He had a much higher opinion of himself now that his idea was abandoned, for he had made a very wise decision, he felt, and, most important, he had made this wise decision without consulting Colonel Corn. "'Will that be all, sir?' asked the chaplain. "'Yeah,' said Colonel Cathcart. "'Unless you've got something else to suggest.' "'No, no sir, only... Uh... The colonel lifted his eyes as though affronted, and studied the chaplain with aloof distrust. Only what, chaplain? Sir, said the chaplain, some of the men are very upset since you raised the number of missions to sixty. They've asked me to speak to you about it. The colonel was silent. The chaplain's face reddened to the roots of his sandy hair as he waited. The colonel kept him squirming a long time, with a fixed, uninterested look devoid of all emotion. Tell them there's a war going on, he advised finally in a flat voice. Thank you, sir, I, I will, the chaplain replied in a flood of gratitude, because the colonel had finally said something. They were w wondering why you couldn't requisition some of the replacement crews that are waiting in Africa to take their places and let them go home. That's an administrative matter, the colonel said. It's none of their business. He pointed languidly toward the wall. Help yourself to a plum tomato, chaplain. Go ahead, it's on me. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, don't mention it. How do you like living out there in the woods, chaplain? Is everything hunky-dory? Uh, yes, sir. That's good. You get in touch with us if you need anything. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, thanks for dropping around, chaplain. I've got some work to do now. You'll let me know if you can think of anything for getting our names into the Saturday evening post, won't you? Y yes, sir, I, I will. The chaplain braced himself with a prodigious effort of the will and plunged ahead brazenly. I'm particularly concerned about the condition of one of the bombardiers, sir. Yesarian. The colonel glanced up quickly with a start of vague recognition. Oh, he asked in alarm. Y Yesarian, sir. Yesarian? Yes, sir. Yesarian, he he's in a very bad way, sir. I I'm afraid he won't be able to suffer much longer without doing something desperate. Is that a fact, chaplain? Yes, sir, I'm afraid it is. The colonel thought about it in heavy silence for a few moments. Tell him to trust in God, he advised finally. Thank you, sir, said the chaplain. I will.
Chapter 20 Corporal Whitcomb The late August morning sun was hot and steamy, and there was no breeze on the balcony. The chaplain moved slowly. He was downcast and burdened with self-reproach when he stepped without noise from the colonel's office on his rubber-soled and rubber-heeled brown shoes. He hated himself for what he construed to be his own cowardice. He had intended to take a much stronger stand with Colonel Cathcart on the matter of the Sixty Missions, to speak out with courage, logic, and eloquence on a subject about which he had begun to feel very deeply. Instead, he had failed miserably had choked up once again in the face of opposition from a stronger personality. It was a familiar, ignominious experience, and his opinion of himself was low. He choked up even more a second later, when he spied Colonel Korn's tubby, monochrome figure trotting up the curved, wide, yellow stone staircase toward him in lackadaisical haste from the great dilapidated lobby below, with its lofty walls of cracked dark marble and circular floor of cracked grimy tile. The chaplain was even more frightened of Colonel Korn than he was of Colonel Cathcart. The swarthy middle-aged lieutenant colonel with the rimless icy glasses and faceted bald dome-like pate that he was always touching sensitively with the tips of his splayed fingers disliked the chaplain and was impolite to him frequently. He kept the chaplain in a constant state of terror with his curt, derisive tongue and his knowing, cynical eyes that the chaplain was never brave enough to meet for more than an accidental second. Inevitably, the chaplain's attention, as he cowered meekly before him, focused on Colonel Korn's midriff, where the shirt tails bunching up from inside his sagging belt and ballooning down over his waist gave him an appearance of slovenly girth and made him seem inches shorter than his middle height. Colonel Korn was an untidy, disdainful man with an oily skin and deep, hard lines running almost straight down from his nose between his crepuscular jowls and his square, clefted chin. His face was dour, and he glanced at the chaplain without recognition as the two drew close on the staircase and prepared to pass. Hiya, father, he said tonelessly without looking at the chaplain. How's it going? Good morning, sir, the chaplain replied, discerning wisely that Colonel Korn expected nothing more in the way of a response. Colonel Korn was proceeding up the stairs without slackening his pace, and the chaplain resisted the temptation to remind him again that he was not a Catholic but an Anabaptist, and that it was therefore neither necessary nor correct to address him as father. He was almost certain now that Colonel Korn remembered, and that calling him father with a look of such bland innocence was just another one of Colonel Korn's methods of taunting him because he was only an Anabaptist. Colonel Korn halted without warning when he was almost by and came whirling back down upon the chaplain with a glare of infuriated suspicion. The chaplain was petrified. "'What are you doing with that plum tomato, chaplain?' Colonel Korn demanded roughly. The chaplain looked down his arm with surprise at the plum tomato Colonel Cathcart had invited him to take. "'I got it in Colonel Cathcart's office, sir,' he managed to reply. "'Does the colonel know you took it?' Oh, yes, sir, he gave it to me. Oh, in that case, I guess it's okay, Colonel Korn said, mollified. He smiled without warmth, jabbing the crumpled folds of his shirt back down inside his trousers with his thumbs. His eyes glinted keenly with a private and satisfying mischief. What did Colonel Cathcart want to see you about, father? he asked suddenly. The chaplain was tongue-tied with indecision for a moment. I... Don't think I ought... Saying prayers to the editors of the Saturday Evening Post? The chaplain almost smiled. Yes, sir. Colonel Korn was enchanted with his own intuition. He laughed disparagingly. You know, I was afraid he'd begin thinking about something so ridiculous as soon as he saw this week's Saturday Evening Post. I hope you succeeded in showing him what an atrocious idea it is. He has decided against it, sir. That's good. I'm glad you convinced him that the editors of the Saturday Evening Post were not likely to run that same story twice, just to give some publicity to some obscure colonel. How are things in the wilderness, Father? Are you able to manage out there? Y yes, sir. Uh, everything is working out. That's good. I'm happy to hear you have nothing to complain about. Let us know if you need anything to make you comfortable. We all want you to have a good time out there. Thank you, sir. I, I will. Noise of a growing stir rose from the lobby below. 
It was almost lunchtime, and the earliest arrivals were drifting into the headquarters mess halls, the enlisted men and officers separating into different dining halls on facing sides of the archaic rotunda. Colonel Korn stopped smiling. You had lunch with us here just a day or so ago, didn't you, Father? He asked meaningfully. Uh, yes, sir, uh, the day before yesterday. That's what I thought, Colonel Korn said and paused to let his point sink in. Well, take it easy, Father. I'll see you around when it's time for you to eat here again. Thank, thank you, sir. The chaplain was not certain at which of the five officers and five enlisted men's mess halls he was scheduled to have lunch that day, for the system of rotation worked out for him by Colonel Korn was complicated, and he had forgotten his records back in his tent. The chaplain was the only officer attached to group headquarters who did not reside in the moldering redstone group headquarters building itself or in any of the smaller satellite structures that rose above the grounds in disjuncted relationship. The chaplain lived in a clearing in the woods about four miles away, between the officers' club and the first of the four squadron areas that stretched away from group headquarters in a distant line. The chaplain lived alone in a spacious square tent that was also his office. Sounds of revelry traveled to him at night from the officers' club and kept him awake often as he turned and tossed on his cot in passive, half-voluntary exile. He was not able to gauge the effect of the mild pills he took occasionally to help him sleep, and felt guilty about it for days afterward. The only one who lived with the chaplain in his clearing of the woods was Corporal Whitcomb, his assistant. Corporal Whitcomb, an atheist, was a disgruntled subordinate who felt he could do the chaplain's job much better than the chaplain was doing it, and viewed himself, therefore, as an underprivileged victim of social inequity. He lived in a tent of his own, as spacious and square as the chaplain's. He was openly rude and contemptuous to the chaplain once he discovered that the chaplain would let him get away with it. The borders of the two tents in the clearing stood no more than four or five feet apart. It was Colonel Korn who had mapped out this way of life for the chaplain. One good reason for making the chaplain live outside the group headquarters building was Colonel Korn's theory that dwelling in a tent, as most of his parishioners did, would bring him into closer communication with them. Another good reason was the fact that having the chaplain around headquarters all the time made the other officers uncomfortable. It was one thing to maintain liaison with the Lord, and they were all in favor of that. It was something else, though, to have him hanging around twenty-four hours a day. All in all, as Colonel Corn described it to Major Danby, the jittery and goggle-eyed group operations officer, the chaplain had it pretty soft. He had little more to do than listen to the troubles of others, bury the dead, visit the bedridden, and conduct religious services. And there were not so many dead for him to bury any more, Colonel Korn pointed out, since opposition from German fighter planes had virtually ceased, and since close to 90% of what fatalities there still were, he estimated, perished behind the enemy lines, or disappeared inside the clouds, where the chaplain had nothing to do with disposing of the remains. The religious services were certainly no great strain either, since they were conducted only once a week at the group headquarters building, and were attended by very few of the men. Actually, the chaplain was learning to love it in his clearing in the woods. Both he and Corporal Whitcomb had been provided with every convenience so that neither might ever plead discomfort as a basis for seeking permission to return to the headquarters building. The chaplain rotated his breakfasts, lunches, and dinners in separate sets among the eight squadron mess halls, and ate every fifth meal in the enlisted men's mess at group headquarters, and every tenth meal at the officers' mess there. Back home in Wisconsin, the chaplain had been very fond of gardening, and his heart welled with a glorious impression of fertility and fruition each time he contemplated the low, prickly boughs of the stunted trees and the waist-high weeds and thickets by which he was almost walled in. In the spring he had longed to plant begonias and zinnias in a narrow bed around his tent, but had been deterred by his fear of Corporal Whitcomb's rancor. The chaplain relished the privacy and isolation of his verdant surroundings and the reverie and meditation that living there fostered. Fewer people came to him with their troubles than formerly, and he allowed himself a measure of gratitude for that, too. The chaplain did not mix freely and was not comfortable in conversation. He missed his wife and his three small children, and she missed him. What displeased Corporal Whitcomb most about the chaplain, apart from the fact that the chaplain believed in God, was his lack of initiative and aggressiveness. Corporal Whitcomb regarded the low attendance at religious services as a sad reflection of his own status. 
His mind germinated feverishly with challenging new ideas for sparking the great spiritual revival of which he dreamed himself the architect. Box lunches, um, church socials, form letters to the families of men killed and injured in combat, censorship, uh, bingo. But the chaplain blocked him. Corporal Whitcomb bridled with vexation beneath the chaplain's restraint, for he spied room for improvement everywhere. It was people like the chaplain, he concluded, who were responsible for giving religion such a bad name and making pariahs out of them both. Unlike the chaplain, Corporal Whitcomb detested the seclusion of the clearing in the woods. One of the first things he intended to do after he deposed the chaplain was move back into the group headquarters building, where he could be right in the thick of things. When the chaplain drove back into the clearing after leaving Colonel Corn, Corporal Whitcomb was outside in the muggy haze talking in conspiratorial tones to a strange, chubby man in a maroon corduroy bathrobe and gray flannel pajamas. The chaplain recognized the bathrobe and pajamas as official hospital attire. Neither of the two men gave him any sign of recognition. The stranger's gums had been painted purple. His corduroy bathrobe was decorated in back with a picture of a B-25, nosing through orange bursts of flak, and in front with six neat rows of tiny bombs signifying sixty combat missions flown. The chaplain was so struck by the sight that he stopped to stare. Both men broke off their conversation and waited in stony silence for him to go. The chaplain hurried inside his tent. He heard, or imagined he heard them, tittering. Corporal Whitcomb walked in a moment later and demanded, What's doing? Uh, there uh, isn't anything new, the chaplain replied with averted eyes. Was um, anyone here to see me? Just that crackpot, Yossarian again. He's a real troublemaker, isn't he? Well, I I'm not so sure he's a crackpot, the chaplain observed. Oh, that's right. Take his part, said Corporal Whitcomb in an injured tone and stamped out. The chaplain could not believe that Corporal Whitcomb was offended again and had really walked out. As soon as he did realize it, Corporal Whitcomb walked back in. You always side with other people, Corporal Whitcomb accused. You don't back up your men. That's one of the things that's wrong with you. I didn't intend to side with him, the chaplain apologized. I, I, I was just making a statement. What did Colonel Cathcart want? And it wasn't anything important. He, he just wanted to discuss the possibility of saying prayers in the briefing room before each mission. All right, don't tell me, Corporal Whitcomb snapped and walked out again. And the chaplain felt terrible. No matter how considerate he tried to be, it seemed he always managed to hurt Corporal Whitcomb's feelings. He gazed down remorsefully and saw that the orderly forced upon him by Colonel Corn to keep his tent clean and attend to his belongings had neglected to shine his shoes again. Corporal Whitcomb came back in. You never trust me with information, he whined truculently. You don't have confidence in your men. That's another one of the things that's wrong with you. Oh, yes, I do, the chaplain assured him guiltily. I have lots of confidence in you. Then how about those letters? No, not now, the chaplain pleaded, cringing. Not the letters, please... Don't bring that up again. I, I, I'll let you know if I have a change of mind. Corporal Whitcomb looked furious. Is that so? Well, it's all right for you to just sit there and shake your head while I do all the work. Didn't you see the guy outside with all those pictures painted on his bathrobe? Is he here to see me? No, Corporal Whitcomb said and walked out. It was hot and humid inside the tent, and the chaplain felt himself turning damp. He listened like an unwilling eavesdropper to the muffled, indistinguishable drone of the lowered voices outside. As he sat inertly at the rickety bridge table that served as a desk, his lips were closed, his eyes were blank, and his face, with its pale ochre hue and ancient confined clusters of minute acne pits, had the color and texture of an uncracked almond shell. He racked his memory for some clue to the origin of Corporal Whitcomb's bitterness toward him, in some way he was unable to fathom, he was convinced he had done him some unforgivable wrong. It seemed incredible that such lasting ire as Corporal Whitcomb's could have stemmed from his rejection of bingo or the form letters home to the families of the men killed in combat. The chaplain was despondent with an acceptance of his own ineptitude. 
He had intended for some weeks to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Corporal Whitcomb in order to find out what was bothering him, but was already ashamed of what he might find out. Outside the tent, Corporal Whitcomb snickered. The other man chuckled. For a few precarious seconds, the chaplain tingled with a weird occult sensation of having experienced the identical situation before in some prior time or existence. He endeavored to trap and nourish the impression in order to predict and perhaps even control what incident would occur next. But the afflatus melted away unproductively, as he had known beforehand it would. Déjà vu. The subtle, recurring confusion between illusion and reality that was characteristic of paramnesia fascinated the chaplain, and he knew a number of things about it. He knew, for example, that it was called paramnesia, and he was interested as well in such corollary optical phenomena as jamais vu, uh, never seen, and presque vu, almost seen. There were terrifying, sudden moments when objects, concepts, and even people that the chaplain had lived with almost all his life inexplicably took on an unfamiliar and irregular aspect that he had never seen before, and which made them totally strange. Jamais vu. And there were other moments when he almost saw absolute truth in brilliant flashes of clarity that almost came to him. Presque vu. The episode of the naked man in the tree at Snowden's funeral mystified him thoroughly. It was not déjà vu, for at the time he'd experienced no sensation of ever having seen a naked man in a tree at Snowden's funeral before. It was not jamais vu, since the apparition was not of someone or something familiar appearing to him in an unfamiliar guise. And it was certainly not presque vu, for the chaplain did see him. A jeep started up with a backfire directly outside and roared away. Had the naked man in the tree at Snowden's funeral been merely a hallucination? Or had it been a true revelation? The chaplain trembled at the mere idea. He wanted desperately to confide in Yossarian, but each time he thought about the occurrence, he decided not to think about it any further. Although now that he did think about it, he could not be sure that he ever really had thought about it. Corporal Whitcomb sauntered back in, wearing a shiny new smirk, and leaned his elbow impertinently against the center pole of the chaplain's tent. Do you know who that guy in the red bathrobe was? He asked boastfully. That was a CID man with a fractured nose. He came down here from the hospital on official business. He's conducting an investigation. The chaplain raised his eyes quickly in obsequious commiseration. I, I hope you're not in any trouble. Is there anything I can do? No, I'm not in any trouble, Corporal Whitcomb replied with a grin. You are. They're going to crack down on you for signing Washington Irving's name to all those letters you've been signing Washington Irving's name to. How do you like that? I haven't been signing Washington Irving's name to any letters, said the chaplain. You don't have to lie to me, Corporal Whitcomb answered. I'm not the one you have to convince. But I I'm not lying. I don't care whether you're lying or not. They're going to get you for intercepting Major Major's correspondence, too. A lot of that stuff is classified information. What correspondence? asked the chaplain plaintively in rising exasperation. I've never even seen any of Major Major's correspondence. You don't have to lie to me, Corporal Whitcomb replied. I'm not the one you have to convince. But I I'm not lying, protested the chaplain. I don't see why you have to shout at me, Corporal Whitcomb retorted with an injured look. He came away from the center pole and shook his finger at the chaplain for emphasis. I just did you the biggest favor anybody ever did you in your whole life, and you don't even realize it. Every time he tries to report you to his superior, somebody up at the hospital censors out the details. He's been going batty for weeks trying to turn you in. I just put a censor's okay on his letter without even reading it. That will make a very good impression for you up at CID headquarters. It will let them know that we're not the least bit afraid to have the whole truth about you come out. The chaplain was reeling with confusion. But you aren't authorized to censor letters, are you? Of course not, Corporal Whitcomb answered. Only officers are ever authorized to do that. I censored it in your name. But I'm not authorized to censor letters either, am I? Oh, I took care of that for you, too, Corporal Whitcomb assured him. I signed somebody else's name for you. I isn't that forgery? Oh, don't worry about that, either. 
The only one who might complain in a case of forgery is the person whose name you forged. And I looked out for your interests by picking a dead man. I used Washington Irving's name. Corporal Whitcomb scrutinized the chaplain's face closely for some sign of rebellion, and then breezed ahead confidently with concealed irony. That was pretty quick thinking on my part, wasn't it? I don't know, the chaplain wailed softly in a quavering voice, squinting with grotesque contortions of anguish and incomprehension. I don't think I understand all you've been telling me. How will it make a good impression for me if you signed Washington Irving's name instead of my own? Because they're convinced that you are Washington Irving. Don't you see? They'll know it was you. But isn't that the very belief we want to dispel? Won't this help them prove it? If I thought you were going to be so stuffy about it, I wouldn't even have tried to help, Corporal Whitcomb declared indignantly and walked out. A second later, he walked back in. I just did you the biggest favor anybody ever did you in your whole life, and you don't even know it. You don't know how to show your appreciation. That's another one of the things that's wrong with you. I'm sorry, the chaplain apologized contritely. I, I really am sorry. It's just that I'm so completely stunned by all you're telling me that I don't even realize what I'm saying. I I'm really very grateful to you. Then how about letting me send out those form letters? Corporal Whitcomb demanded immediately. Can I begin working on the first drafts? The chaplain's jaw dropped in astonishment. No, no, he groaned. Not now. Corporal Whitcomb was incensed. I'm the best friend you've got and you don't even know it, he asserted belligerently and walked out of the chaplain's tent. He walked back in. I'm on your side and you don't even realize it. Don't you know what serious trouble you're in? That CID man has gone rushing back to the hospital to write a brand new report on you about that tomato. W what tomato? The chaplain asked, blinking. The plum tomato you were hiding in your hand when you first showed up here. There it is. The tomato you're still holding in your hand right this very minute. The chaplain unclenched his fingers with surprise and saw that he was still holding the plum tomato he had obtained in Colonel Cathcart's office. He set it down quickly on the bridge table. I got this tomato from Colonel Cathcart, he said, and was struck by how ludicrous his explanation sounded. He insisted I take it. You don't have to lie to me, Corporal Whitcomb answered. I don't care whether you stole it from him or not. Stole it, the chaplain exclaimed with amazement. Why should I want to steal a plum tomato? That's exactly what had us both stumped, said Corporal Whitcomb. And then the CID man figured out you might have some important secret papers hidden away inside it. The chaplain sagged limply beneath the mountainous weight of his despair. I don't have any important secret papers hidden away inside it, he stated simply. I didn't even want it to begin with. Here, you can have it and see for yourself. I don't want it. Please, take it away, the chaplain pleaded in a voice that was barely audible. I want to be rid of it. I don't want it, Corporal Whitcomb snapped again and stuck out with an angry face, suppressing a smile of great jubilation at having forged a powerful new alliance with the CID man and at having succeeded again in convincing the chaplain that he was really displeased. Poor Whitcomb sighed the chaplain and blamed himself for his assistance malaise. He sat mutely in a ponderous, stultifying melancholy, waiting expectantly for Corporal Whitcomb to walk back in. He was disappointed as he heard the peremptory crunch of Corporal Whitcomb's footsteps recede into silence. There was nothing he wanted to do next. He decided to pass up lunch for a Milky Way and a Baby Ruth from his footlocker and a few swallows of lukewarm water from his canteen. He felt himself surrounded by dense, overwhelming fogs of possibilities in which he could perceive no glimmer of light. He dreaded what Colonel Cathcart would think when the news that he was suspected of being Washington Irving was brought to him then fell to fretting over what Colonel Cathcart was already thinking about him, for even having broached the subject of sixty missions. There was so much unhappiness in the world, he reflected, bowing his head dismally beneath the tragic thought, and there was nothing he could do about anybody's, least of all his own. Chapter 21 General Dreedle Colonel Cathcart was not thinking anything at all about the chaplain, but was tangled up in a brand new menacing problem of his own. Yossarian. Yossarian. 
The mere sound of that execrable, ugly name made his blood run cold and his breath come in labored gasps. The chaplain's first mention of the name Eusarian had tolled deep in his memory like a portentous gong. As soon as the latch of the door had clicked shut, the whole humiliating recollection of the naked man in formation came cascading down upon him in a mortifying, choking flood of stinging details. He began to perspire and tremble. There was a sinister and unlikely coincidence exposed that was too diabolical in implication to be anything less than the most hideous of omens. The name of the man who had stood naked in ranks that day to receive his distinguished flying cross from General Dreedle had also been Eosaria. And now it was a man named Yossarian who was threatening to make trouble over the sixty missions he had just ordered the men in his group to fly. Colonel Cathcart wondered gloomily if it was the same Yossarian. He climbed to his feet with an air of intolerable woe and began moving about his office. He felt himself in the presence of the mysterious. The naked man in formation, he conceded cheerlessly, had been a real black eye for him. So had the tampering with the bomb line before the mission to Bologna and the seven-day delay in destroying the bridge at Ferrara, even though destroying the bridge at Ferrara finally, he remembered with glee, had been a real feather in his cap, although losing a plane there the second time around, he recalled in dejection, had been another black eye, even though he had won another real feather in his cap by getting a medal approved for the bombardier who had gotten him the real black eye in the first place by going around over the target twice. That bombardier's name, he remembered suddenly with another stupefying shock, had also been Yossarian. Now there were three. His viscous eyes bulged with astonishment, and he whipped himself around in alarm to see what was taking place behind him. A moment ago there had been no Yossarians in his life. Now they were multiplying like hobgoblins. He tried to make himself grow calm. Yossarian was not a common name. Uh, perhaps there were not really three Yossarians, but only two Yossarians, or maybe even only... One Yossarian. But that really made no difference. The colonel was still in grave peril. Intuition warned him that he was drawing close to some immense and inscrutable cosmic climax, and his broad, meaty, towering frame tingled from head to toe at the thought that Yossarian, whoever he would eventually turn out to be, was destined to serve as his nemesis. Colonel Cathcart was not superstitious, but he did believe in omens, and he sat right back down behind his desk and made a cryptic notation on his memorandum pad to look into the whole suspicious business of the Yossarians right away. He wrote his reminder to himself in a heavy and decisive hand, amplifying it sharply with a series of coded punctuation marks and underlining the whole message twice, so that it read, Yossarian! Huh? The colonel sat back when he had finished and was extremely pleased with himself for the prompt action he had just taken to meet this sinister crisis. Yossarian. The very sight of the name made him shudder. There were so many S's in it. It just had to be subversive. It was like the word subversive itself. It was like seditious and insidious, too, and like socialist, suspicious, fascist and communist. It was an odious, alien, distasteful name that just did not inspire confidence. It was not at all like such clean, crisp, honest American names as Cathcart, Peckham, and Dreedle. Colonel Cathcart rose slowly and began drifting about his office again. Almost unconsciously, he picked up a plum tomato from the top of one of the bushels and took a voracious bite. He made a wry face at once and threw the rest of the plum tomato into his wastebasket. The colonel did not like plum tomatoes, not even when they were his own, and these were not even his own. These had been purchased in different marketplaces all over Pianosa by Colonel Corn under various identities, moved up to the colonel's farmhouse in the hills in the dead of night, and transported down to group headquarters the next morning for sale to Milo, who paid Colonel Cathcart and Colonel Corn premium prices for them. Colonel Cathcart often wondered if what they were doing with the plum tomatoes was legal, but Colonel Corn said it was, and he tried not to brood about it too often. He had no way of knowing whether or not the house in the hills was legal either, since Colonel Corn had made all the arrangements. Colonel Cathcart did not know if he owned the house or rented it, from whom he had acquired it, or how much, if anything, it was costing. Colonel Corn was the lawyer, and if Colonel Corn assured him that fraud, extortion, currency manipulation, embezzlement, income tax evasion, and black market speculations were legal, Colonel Cathcart was in no position to disagree with him. 
All Colonel Cathcart knew about his house in the hills was that he had such a house and hated it. He was never so bored as when spending there the two or three days every other week necessary to sustain the illusion that his damp and drafty stone farmhouse in the hills was a golden palace of carnal delights. Officers' clubs everywhere pulsated with blurred but knowing accounts of lavish, hushed-up drinking and sex orgies there, and of secret, intimate nights of ecstasy with the most beautiful, the most tantalizing, the most readily aroused and most easily satisfied Italian courtesans, film actresses, models, and countesses. No such private nights of ecstasy or hushed-up drinking and sex orgies ever occurred. They might have occurred if either General Dreedle or General Peckham had once evinced an interest in taking part in orgies with him, but neither ever did, and the Colonel was certainly not going to waste his time and energy making love to beautiful women unless there was something in it for him. The Colonel dreaded his dank, lonely nights at his farmhouse and the dull, uneventful days. He had much more fun back at group, browbeating everyone he wasn't afraid of. However, as Colonel Corn kept reminding him, there was not much glamour in having a farmhouse in the hills if he never used it. He drove off to his farmhouse each time in a mood of self-pity. He carried a shotgun in his jeep and spent the monotonous hours there shooting it at birds and at the plum tomatoes that did grow there in untended rows and were too much trouble to harvest. Among those officers of inferior rank toward whom Colonel Cathcart still deemed it prudent to show respect, he included Major de Coverley, even though he did not want to and was not sure he even had to. Major de Coverley was as great a mystery to him as he was to Major Major and to everyone else who ever took notice of him. Colonel Cathcart had no idea whether to look up or look down in his attitude toward Major de Coverley. Major de Coverley was only a Major, even though he was ages older than Colonel Cathcart. At the same time, so many other people treated Major de Coverley with such profound and fearful veneration that Colonel Cathcart had a hunch they might know something. Major de Coverley was an ominous, incomprehensible presence who kept him constantly on edge, and of whom even Colonel Corn tended to be wary. Everyone was afraid of him, and no one knew why. No one even knew Major de Coverley's first name, because no one had ever had the temerity to ask him. Colonel Cathcart knew that Major de Coverley was away, and he rejoiced in his absence, until it occurred to him that Major de Coverley might be away somewhere conspiring against him, and then he wished that Major de Coverley were back in his squadron, where he belonged, so that he could be watched. In a little while, Colonel Cathcart's arches began to ache from pacing back and forth so much. He sat down behind his desk again and resolved to embark upon a mature and systematic evaluation of the entire military situation. With the businesslike air of a man who knows how to get things done, he found a large white pad, drew a straight line down the middle, and crossed it near the top, dividing the page into two blank columns of equal width. He rested a moment in critical rumination. Then he huddled over his desk, and at the head of the left column, in a cramped and finicky hand, he wrote, Black Eyes. At the top of the right column, he wrote, Feathers in my cap. He leaned back once more to inspect his chart admiringly from an objective perspective. After a few seconds of solemn deliberation, he licked the tip of his pencil carefully and wrote under black eyes, after intent intervals, Ferrara. Bologna, bomb line moved on map during. Skeet range. Naked man in formation, after Avenue. Then he added food poisoning, during Bologna, and moaning, epidemic of during Avignon briefing, then he added, Chaplain, hanging around officers' club every night. He decided to be charitable about the chaplain, even though he did not like him, and under feathers in my cap, he wrote, Chaplain, hanging around officers' club every night. The two chaplain entries, therefore, neutralized each other. Alongside Ferrara and Naked Man in Formation, after Avignon, he then wrote, Yosarian. Alongside Bologna, bomb line moved on map during, food poisoning during Bologna, and moaning, epidemic of during Avignon briefing, he wrote in a bold, decisive hand, question mark. Those entries labeled question mark were the ones he wanted to investigate immediately to determine if Yossarian had played any part in them. Suddenly his arm began to shake, and he was unable to write any more. 
He rose to his feet in terror, feeling sticky and fat, and rushed to the open window to gulp in fresh air. His gaze fell on the skeet range, and he reeled away with a sharp cry of distress, his wild and feverish eyes scanning the walls of his office frantically as though they were swarming with Yossarians. Nobody loved him. General Dreedle hated him, although General Peckham liked him, although he couldn't be sure, since Colonel Cargill, General Peckham's aide, undoubtedly had ambitions of his own and was probably sabotaging him with General Peckham at every opportunity. The only good colonel, he decided, was a dead colonel, except for himself. The only colonel he trusted was Colonel Modus, and even he had an in with his father-in-law. Milo, of course, had been the big feather in his cap, although having his group bombed by Milo's planes had probably been a terrible black eye for him, even though Milo had ultimately stilled all protest by disclosing the huge net profit the syndicate had realized on the deal with the enemy and convincing everyone that bombing his own men and planes had therefore really been a commendable and very lucrative blow on the side of private enterprise. The colonel was insecure about Milo because other colonels were trying to lure him away. And Colonel Cathcart still had that lousy big chief white half out in his group who that lousy lazy Captain Black claimed was the one really responsible for the bomb lines being moved during the big siege of Bologna. Colonel Cathcart liked Big Chief White half Oat because Big Chief White half Oat kept punching that lousy Colonel Moodus in the nose every time he got drunk and Colonel Moodus was around. He wished that Big Chief White half Oat would begin punching Colonel Corn in his fat face, too. Colonel Corn was a lousy smart aleck. Someone at 27th Air Force Headquarters had it in for him and sent back every report he wrote with a blistering rebuke. And Colonel Corn had bribed a clever mail clerk there named Wintergreen to try to find out who it was. Losing the plane over Ferrara the second time around had not done him any good, he had to admit, and neither had having that other plane disappear inside that cloud. Oh, that was one he hadn't even written down. He tried to recall longingly if Yossarian had been lost in that plane in the cloud and realized that Yossarian could not possibly have been lost in that plane in the cloud if he was still around now, raising such a big stink about having to fly a lousy five missions more. Maybe sixty missions were too many for the men to fly, Colonel Cathcart reasoned, if Yossarian objected to flying them. But he then remembered that forcing his men to fly more missions than everyone else was the most tangible achievement he had going for him. As Colonel Korn often remarked, the war was crawling with group commanders who were merely doing their duty, and it required just some sort of dramatic gesture, like making his group fly more combat missions than any other bomber group, to spotlight his unique qualities of leadership. Certainly none of the generals seemed to object to what he was doing, although as far as he could detect, they weren't particularly impressed either, which made him suspect that perhaps sixty combat missions were not nearly enough, and that he ought to increase the number at once to seventy, eighty, a hundred, or even two hundred, three hundred, or six thousand. Certainly he would be much better off under somebody suave like General Peckham than he was under somebody boorish and insensitive like General Dreedle, because General Peckham had the discernment, the intelligence, and the Ivy League background to appreciate and enjoy him at his full value, although General Peckham had never given the slightest indication that he appreciated or enjoyed him at all. Colonel Cathcart felt perceptive enough to realize that visible signals of recognition were never necessary between sophisticated, self-assured people like himself and General Peckham, who could warm to each other from a distance with innate mutual understanding. It was enough that they were of like kind, and he knew it was only a matter of waiting discreetly for preferment until the right time. Although it rotted Colonel Cathcart's self-esteem to observe that General Peckham never deliberately sought him out, and that he laboured no harder to impress Colonel Cathcart with his epigrams and erudition than he did to impress anyone else in earshot, even enlisted men. Either Colonel Cathcart wasn't getting through to General Peckham, or General Peckham was not the scintillating, discriminating, intellectual, forward-looking personality he pretended to be, and it was really General Dreedle who was sensitive, charming, brilliant, and sophisticated, and under whom he would certainly be much better off. And suddenly Colonel Cathcart had absolutely no conception of how strongly he stood with anyone, and began banging on his buzzer with his fist for Colonel Corn to come running into his office and assure him that everybody loved him, that Yossarian was a figment of his imagination, and that he was making wonderful progress in the splendid and valiant campaign he was waging to become a general. Actually, Colonel Cathcart did not have a chance in hell of becoming a general. 
For one thing, there was XPFC Wintergreen, who also wanted to be a general and who always distorted, destroyed, rejected, or misdirected any correspondence by, for, or about Colonel Cathcart that might do him credit. For another, there already was a general, General Dreedle, who knew that General Peckham was after his job but did not know how to stop him. General Dreedle, the wing commander, was a blunt, chunky, barrel-chested man in his early fifties. His nose was squat and red, and he had lumpy white bunched-up eyelids circling his small gray eyes like halos of bacon fat. He had a nurse and a son-in-law, and he was prone to long, ponderous silences when he had not been drinking too much. General Dreedle had wasted too much of his time in the army doing his job well, and now it was too late. New power alignments had coalesced without him, and he was at a loss to cope with them. At unguarded moments, his hard and sullen face slipped into a somber, preoccupied look of defeat and frustration. General Dreedle drank a great deal. His moods were arbitrary and unpredictable. War is hell, he declared frequently, drunk or sober, and he really meant it, although that did not prevent him from making a good living out of it or from taking his son-in-law into the business with him even though the two bickered constantly. That bastard, General Dreedle would complain about his son-in-law with a contemptuous grunt to anyone who happened to be standing beside him at the curve of the bar of the officers' club. Everything he's got he owes to me. I made him, that lousy son of a bitch. He hasn't got brains enough to get ahead on his own. He thinks he knows everything. Colonel Modus would retort in a sulking tone to his own audience at the other end of the bar. He can't take criticism, and he won't listen to advice. All he can do is give advice, General Dreedle would observe with a rasping snort. If it wasn't for me, he'd still be a corporal. General Dreedle was always accompanied by both Colonel Modus and his nurse, who was as delectable a piece of ass as anyone who saw her had ever laid eyes on. General Dreedle's nurse was chubby, short, and blonde. She had plump, dimpled cheeks, happy blue eyes, and neat, curly, turned-up hair. She smiled at everyone and never spoke at all unless she was spoken to. Her bosom was lush and her complexion clear. She was irresistible, and men edged away from her carefully. She was succulent, sweet, docile, and dumb, and she drove everyone crazy but General Dreedle. You should see her naked, General Dreedle chortled with croupy relish while his nurse stood smiling proudly right at his shoulder. Back at wing, she's got a uniform in my room made of purple silk that's so tight her nipples stand out like bing cherries. Milo got me the fabric. There isn't even room enough for panties or a brassiere underneath. I make her wear it some nights when Moodis is around... Just to drive him crazy. General Dreedle laughed hoarsely. <laughs> you should see what goes on inside that blouse of hers every time she shifts her weight. She drives him out of his mind. And the first time I catch him putting a hand on her or any other woman, I'll bust the horny bastard right down to private and put him on KP for a year. He keeps her around just to drive me crazy. Colonel Modus accused, grievedly, at the other end of the bar. Back at wing, she's got a uniform made out of purple silk that's so tight, her nipples stand out like bing cherries. There isn't even room for panties or a brassiere underneath. You should hear that rustle every time she shifts her weight. The first time I make a pass at her or any other girl, he'll bust me right down to private and put me on KP for a year. She drives me out of my mind. He hasn't got laid since we shipped overseas confided General Dreedle, and his square, grizzled head bobbed with sadistic laughter at the fiendish idea. That's one of the reasons I never let him out of my sight, just so he can't get to a woman. Can you imagine what that poor son of a bitch is going through? I haven't been to bed with a woman since we shipped overseas, Colonel Modus whimpered tearfully. Can you imagine what I'm going through? General Dreedle could be as intransigent with anyone else when displeased as he was with Colonel Moodus. He had no taste for sham, tact, or pretension, and his credo as a professional soldier was unified and concise. 
He believed that the young men who took orders from him should be willing to give up their lives for the ideals, aspirations, and idiosyncrasies of the old men he took orders from. The officers and enlisted men in his command had identity for him only as military quantities. All he asked was that they do their work. Beyond that, they were free to do whatever they pleased. They were free, as Colonel Cathcart was free, to force their men to fly 60 missions if they chose, and they were free, as Yossarian had been free, to stand in formation naked if they wanted to, although General Dreedle's granite jaw swung open at the sight, and he went striding dictatorially right down the line to make certain that there really was a man wearing nothing but moccasins waiting at attention in ranks to receive a medal from him. General Dreedle was speechless. Colonel Cathcart began to faint when he spied Yossarian, and Colonel Korn stepped up behind him and squeezed his arm in a strong grip. The silence was grotesque. A steady, warm wind flowed in from the beach, and an old cart filled with dirty straw rumbled into view on the main road, drawn by a black donkey and driven by a farmer in a flopping hat and faded brown work clothes, who paid no attention to the formal military ceremony taking place in the small field on his right. At last, General Dreedle spoke. Get back in the car, he snapped over his shoulder to his nurse, who had followed him down the line. The nurse toddled away with a smile toward his brown staff car, parked about twenty yards away at the edge of the rectangular clearing. General Dreedle waited in austere silence until the car door slammed, and then demanded, Which one is this? Colonel Mutis checked his roster. This one is y Yossarian, Dad. He gets a distinguished flying cross. Well, I'll be damned, mumbled General Dreedle, and his ruddy monolithic face softened with amusement. Why aren't you wearing clothes, Yossarian? I don't want to. What do you mean you don't want to? Why the hell don't you want to? I just don't want to, sir. Why isn't he wearing clothes? General Dreedle demanded over his shoulder of Colonel Cathcart. He's talking to you. Colonel Korn whispered over Colonel Cathcart's shoulder from behind, jabbing his elbow sharply into Colonel Cathcart's back. Why isn't he wearing clothes? Colonel Cathcart demanded of Colonel Korn with a look of acute pain, tenderly nursing the spot where Colonel Korn had just jabbed him. Why isn't he wearing clothes? Colonel Korn demanded of Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren. A, a man was killed in his plane over Avignon last week and bled all over him, Captain Wren replied. He swears he's never going to wear a uniform again. A man was killed in his plane over Avignon last week and bled all over him, Colonel Korn reported directly to General Dreedle. His uniform hasn't come back from the laundry yet. Where are his other uniforms? They're in the laundry, too. What about his underwear? General Dreedle demanded. All his underwear is in the laundry, too, answered Colonel Korn. That sounds like a lot of crap to me, General Dreedle declared. It is a lot of crap, sir, Yossarian said. Don't you worry, sir, Colonel Cathcart promised General Dreedle with a threatening look at Yossarian. You have my personal word for it that this man will be severely punished. What the hell do I care if he's punished or not, General Dreedle replied with surprise and irritation. He's just won a medal if he wants to receive it without any clothes on. What the hell business is it of yours? Those are my sentiments exactly, sir, Colonel Cathcart echoed with resounding enthusiasm and mopped his brow with a damp white handkerchief. But would you say that, sir, even in the light of General Peckham's recent memorandum on, on the subject of appropriate military attire in combat areas? Peckham? General Dreedle's face clouded. Y yes, sir, sir said Colonel Cathcart obsequiously. General Peckham even recommends that we send our men into combat in full-dress uniform so they'll make a good impression on the enemy when they're shot down. Peckham, repeated General Dreedle, still squinting with bewilderment. Just what the hell does Peckham have to do with it? Colonel Korn jabbed Colonel Cathcart sharply again in the back with his elbow. Absolutely nothing, sir. Colonel Cathcart responded sprucely, wincing in extreme pain and gingerly rubbing the spot where Colonel Korn had just jabbed him again. And that's exactly why I decided to take absolutely no action at all until I first had an opportunity to discuss it with you. Shall we ignore it completely, sir? General Dreedle ignored him completely, turning away from him in baleful scorn to hand Yossarian his medal in its case. Get my girl back from the car, 
he commanded Colonel Moodus crabbily, and waited in one spot with his scowling face down until his nurse had rejoined him. Get word to the office right away to kill that directive I just issued ordering the men to wear neckties on the combat missions, Colonel Cathcart whispered to Colonel Korn urgently out of the corner of his mouth. I told you not to do it, Colonel Korn snickered, but you just wouldn't listen to me. Shh, Colonel Cathcart cautioned. God damn it, Korn, what did you do to my back? Colonel Korn snickered again. General Dreedle's nurse always followed General Dreedle everywhere he went, even into the briefing room just before the mission to Avignon, where she stood with her asinine smile at the side of the platform and bloomed like a fertile oasis at General Dreedle's shoulder in her pink and green uniform. Yossarian looked at her and fell in love, desperately. His spirit sank, leaving him empty inside and numb. He sat gazing in clammy want at her full red lips and dimpled cheeks, as he listened to Major Danby describe in a monotonous, didactic male drone the heavy concentrations of flack awaiting them at Avignon, and he moaned in deep despair suddenly at the thought that he might never see again this lovely woman to whom he had never spoken a word and whom he now loved so pathetically. He throbbed and ached with sorrow, fear, and desire as he stared at her. She was so beautiful. He worshipped the ground she stood on. He licked his parched, thirsting lips with a sticky tongue and moaned in misery again, loudly enough this time to attract the startled, searching glances of the men sitting around him on the rows of crude wooden benches in their chocolate-covered coveralls and stitched white parachute harnesses. Nately turned to him quickly with alarm. What is it? he whispered. What's the matter? Yossarian did not hear him. He was sick with lust and mesmerized with regret. General Dreedle's nurse was only a little chubby, and his senses were stuffed to congestion with the yellow radiance of her hair and the unfelt pressure of her soft, short fingers with the rounded, untasted wealth of her nubile breasts in her army pink shirt that was opened wide at the throat and with the rolling, ripened, triangular confluences of her belly and thighs in her tight, slick, forest-green gabardine officer's pants. He drank her in insatiably from head to painted toenail. He never wanted to lose her. Oh! He moaned again, and this time the whole room rippled at his quavering, drawn-out cry. A wave of startled uneasiness broke over the officers on the dais, and even Major Danby, who had begun synchronizing the watches, was distracted momentarily as he counted out the seconds and almost had to begin again. Nately followed Yossarian's transfixed gaze down the long-frame auditorium until he came to General Dreedle's nurse. He blanched with trepidation when he guessed what was troubling Yossarian. Cut it out, will you? Nately warned in a fierce whisper. Oh, Yossarian moaned a fourth time, this time loudly enough for everyone to hear him distinctly. Are you crazy? Nately hissed vehemently. You'll get into trouble. Oh, Dunbar answered Yossarian from the opposite end of the room. Nately recognized Dunbar's voice. The situation was now out of control, and he turned away with a small moan. Oh! Oh! Dunbar moaned back at him. Oh! oh. Nately moaned out loud in exasperation when he realized that he had just moaned. Oh! oh, oh. Dunbar moaned back at him again. Oh! oh, oh. Someone entirely new chimed in from another section of the room, and Nately's hair stood on end. Yossarian and Dunbar both replied while Nately cringed and hunted about futilely for some hole in which to hide and take Yossarian with him. A sprinkling of people were smothering laughter. An elfin impulse possessed Nately, and he moaned intentionally the next time there was a lull. Another new voice answered. The flavor of disobedience was titillating, and Nately moaned deliberately again the next time he could squeeze one in edgewise. Still another new voice echoed him. The room was boiling irrepressibly into bedlam, 
An eerie hubbub of voices was rising. Feet were scuffled, and things began to drop from people's fingers. Pencils, computers, map cases, clattering steel flak helmets. A number of men who were not moaning were now giggling openly, and there was no telling how far the unorganized insurrection of moaning might have gone if General Dreedle himself had not come forward to quell it, stepping out determinedly in the center of the platform directly in front of Major Danby, who, with his earnest, persevering head down, was still concentrating on his wristwatch and saying, Twenty-five seconds, twenty, fifteen... General Dreedle's great red domineering face was gnarled with perplexity and oaken with awesome resolution. That will be all, men, he ordered tersely, his eyes glaring with disapproval and his square jaw firm, and that's all there was. I run a fighting outfit, he told them sternly, when the room had grown absolutely quiet and the men on the benches were all cowering sheepishly. And there'll be no more moaning in this group as long as I'm in command. Is that clear? It was clear to everybody but Major Danby, who was still concentrating on his wristwatch and counting down the seconds aloud. Four, three, two, one. Time, called out Major Danby and raised his eyes triumphantly to discover that no one had been listening to him and that he would have to begin all over again. Oh, he moaned in frustration. What was that? roared General Dreedle incredulously and whirled around in a murderous rage upon Major Danby, who staggered back in terrified confusion and began to quail and perspire. Who is this man? <laughs> Major Danby, sir, Colonel Cathcart stammered, my group operations officer. Take him out and shoot him, ordered General Dreedel. Sir? I said, take him out and shoot him, can't you hear? Yes, sir, Colonel Cathcart responded smartly, swallowing hard, and turned in a brisk manner to his chauffeur and his meteorologist. Take Major Danby out and shoot him. S -s sir? his chauffeur and his meteorologist stammered. I said take Major Danby out and shoot him, Colonel Cathcart snapped. Can't you hear? The two young lieutenants nodded lumpishly and gaped at each other in stunned and flaccid reluctance, each waiting for the other to initiate the procedure of taking Major Danby outside and shooting him. Neither had ever taken Major Danby outside and shot him before. They inched their way dubiously toward Major Danby from opposite sides. Major Danby was white with fear. His legs collapsed suddenly and he began to fall, and the two young lieutenants sprang forward and seized him under both arms to save him from slumping to the floor. Now that they had Major Danby, the rest seemed easy, but there were no guns. Major Danby began to cry. Colonel Cathcart wanted to rush to his side and comfort him, but did not want to look like a sissy in front of General Dreedle. He remembered that Appleby and Havermeyer always brought their forty-five automatics on the missions, and he began to scan the rows of men in search of them. As soon as Major Danby began to cry, Colonel Moodus, who had been vacillating wretchedly on the sidelines, could restrain himself no longer and stepped out diffidently toward General Dreedle with a sickly air of self-sacrifice. I think you'd better wait a minute, Dad, he suggested hesitantly. I don't think you can shoot him. General Dreedle was infuriated by his intervention. Who the hell says I can't? He thundered pugnaciously in a voice loud enough to rattle the whole building. Colonel Moodus, his face flushing with embarrassment, bent close to whisper into his ear. Why the hell can't I? General Dreedle bellowed. Colonel Moodus whispered some more. You mean I can't shoot anyone I want to? General Dreedle demanded with uncompromising indignation. He pricked up his ears with interest as Colonel Moodus continued whispering. Is that a fact? he inquired his rage tamed by curiosity. Yes, Dad, I I'm afraid it is. I guess you think you're pretty goddamn smart, don't you? General Dreedle lashed out at Colonel Moodus suddenly. Colonel Moodus turned crimson again. N no, Dad, it isn't... All right, let the insubordinate son of a bitch go. General Dreedle snarled, turning bitterly away from his son-in-law and barking peevishly at Colonel Cathcart's chauffeur and Colonel Cathcart's meteorologist. 
But get him out of this building and keep him out. And let's continue this goddamn briefing before the war ends. I've never seen so much incompetence. Colonel Cathcart nodded lamely at General Dreedle and signaled his men hurriedly to push Major Danby outside the building. As soon as Major Danby had been pushed outside, though, there was no one to continue the briefing. Everyone gawked at everyone else in oafish surprise. General Dreedle turned purple with rage as nothing happened. Colonel Cathcart had no idea what to do. He was about to begin moaning aloud when Colonel Korn came to the rescue by stepping forward and taking control. Colonel Cathcart sighed with enormous, tearful relief, almost overwhelmed with gratitude. Now, men, we're going to uh, synchronize our watches, Colonel Korn began promptly in a sharp, commanding manner, rolling his eyes flirtatiously in General Dreedle's direction. We're going to synchronize our watches one time and one time only, and if it doesn't come off in that one time, General Dreedle and I are going to want to know why. Is that clear? He fluttered his eyes toward General Dreedle again to make sure his plug had registered. Now, set your watches for 918. Colonel Korn synchronized their watches without a single hitch and moved ahead with confidence. He gave the men the colors of the day and reviewed the weather conditions with an agile, flashy versatility, casting sidelong, simpering looks at General Dreedle every few seconds to draw increased encouragement from the excellent impression he saw he was making. Preening and pruning himself effulgently and strutting vaingloriously about the platform as he picked up momentum, he gave the men the colors of the day again and shifted nimbly into a rousing pep talk on the importance of the bridge at Avignon to the war effort and the obligation of each man on the mission to place love of country above love of life. When his inspiring dissertation was finished, he gave the men the colors of the day still one more time, stressed the angle of approach and reviewed the weather conditions again. Colonel Korn felt himself at the full height of his powers. He belonged in the spotlight. Comprehension dawned slowly on Colonel Cathcart. When it came, he was struck dumb. His face grew longer and longer as he enviously watched Colonel Korn's treachery continue, and he was almost afraid to listen when General Dreedel moved up beside him and in a whisper blustery enough to be heard throughout the room demanded, Who is that man? Colonel Cathcart answered with wan foreboding, and General Dreedle then cupped his hand over his mouth and whispered something that made Colonel Cathcart's face glow with immense joy. Colonel Korn saw and quivered with uncontainable rapture. Had he just been promoted in the field by General Dreedle to full colonel? He could not endure the suspense. With a masterful flourish, he brought the briefing to a close and turned expectantly to receive ardent congratulations from General Dreedle, who was already striding out of the building without a glance backward, trailing his nurse and Colonel Moodus behind him. Colonel Korn was stunned by this disappointing sight, but only for an instant. His eyes found Colonel Cathcart, who was still standing erect in a grinning trance, and he rushed over jubilantly and began pulling on his arm. What did he say about me? he demanded excitedly in a fervor of proud and blissful anticipation. What did General Dreedle say? He wanted to know who you were. I know that. I know that. But what did he say about me? What did he say? You make him sick. Chapter 22 Milo the Mayor that was the mission on which Yossarian lost his nerve. Yossarian lost his nerve on the mission to Avignon because Snowden lost his guts. And Snowden lost his guts because their pilot that day was Hoople, who was only 15 years old. And their co-pilot was Dobbs, who was even worse, and who wanted Yossarian to join with him in a plot to murder Colonel Cathcart. Hoople was a good pilot, Yossarian knew, but he was only a kid. And Dobbs had no confidence in him either, and wrested the controls away without warning after they had dropped their bombs, going berserk in mid-air and tipping the plane over into that heart-stopping, ear-splitting, indescribably petrifying fatal dive that tore Yossarian's earphones free from their connection and hung him helplessly to the roof of the nose by the top of his head. Oh, God! 
Yossarian had shrieked soundlessly as he felt them all falling. Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! He had shrieked beseechingly through lips that could not open as the plane fell and he dangled without weight by the top of his head until Hoople managed to seize the controls back and level the plane out down inside the crazy, craggy, patchwork canyon of crashing anti-aircraft fire from which they had climbed away and from which they would now have to escape again. Almost at once there was a thud and a hole the size of a big fist in the plexiglass. Yossarian's cheeks were stinging with shimmering splinters. There was no blood. What happened? What happened? He cried and trembled violently when he could not hear his own voice in his ears. He was cowed by the empty silence on the intercom and almost too horrified to move as he crouched like a trapped mouse on his hands and knees and waited without daring to breathe until he finally spied the gleaming cylindrical jack plug of his headset swinging back and forth in front of his eyes and jammed it back into its receptacle with fingers that rattled. Oh, God! He kept shrieking with no abatement of terror as the flak thumped and mushroomed all about him. Oh, God! Dobbs was weeping when Yossarian jammed his jack plug back into the intercom system and was able to hear him again. Help him! Help him! Dobbs was sobbing. Help him! Help him! Help who? Help who? Yossarian called back. Help who? The bombardier! The bombardier! Dobbs cried. He doesn't answer. Help the bombardier. Help the bombardier. I'm the bombardier, Yossarian cried back at him. I'm the bombardier. I'm all right. I'm all right. Then help him. Help him, Dobbs wept. Help him. Help him. Help who? Help who? The radio gunner, Dobbs begged. Help the radio gunner. I'm cold, Snowden whimpered feebly over the intercom system then in a bleat of plaintive agony. Please help me. I'm cold. And Eusarian crept out through the crawlway and climbed up over the bomb bay and down into the rear section of the plane where Snowden lay on the floor, wounded and freezing to death, in a yellow splash of sunlight near the new tail gunner, lying stretched out on the floor beside him in a dead faint. Dobbs was the worst pilot in the world and knew it, a shattered wreck of a virile young man who was continually striving to convince his superiors that he was no longer fit to pilot a plane. None of his superiors would listen, and it was the day the number of missions was raised to sixty that Dobbs stole into Yossarian's tent while Orr was out looking for gaskets and disclosed the plot he had formulated to murder Colonel Cathcart. He needed Yossarian's assistance. You want us to kill him in cold blood? Yossarian objected. That's right, Dobbs agreed with an optimistic smile, encouraged by Yossarian's ready grasp of the situation. We'll shoot him to death with the Luger I brought back from Sicily that nobody knows I've got. I don't think I could do it, Yossarian concluded, after weighing the idea in silence a while. Dobbs was astonished. Why not? Look, Nothing would please me more than to have the son of a bitch break his neck or get killed in a crash or to find out that someone else had shot him to death, but I don't think I could kill him. He'd do it to you, Dobbs argued. In fact, you're the one who told me he is doing it to us by keeping us in combat so long. But I don't think I could do it to him. He's got a right to live too, I guess. Not as long as he's trying to rob you and me of our right to live. What's the matter with you? Dobbs was flabbergasted. I used to listen to you arguing that same thing with Clevenger, and look what happened to him. Right inside that cloud. Stop shouting, will you? Yossarian shushed him. I'm not shouting, Dobbs shouted louder, his face red with revolutionary fervor. His eyes and nostrils were running, and his palpitating crimson lower lip was splattered with a foamy dew. There must have been close to a hundred men in the group who had finished their fifty-five bishops when he raised the number to sixty. There must have been at least another hundred like you with just a couple more to fly. He's going to kill us all if we let him go on forever. 
We've got to kill him first! Yasarian nodded expressionlessly without committing himself. Do you think we could get away with it? I've got it all worked out. I stop shouting, for Christ's sake. I'm not shouting. I've got it. Will you stop shouting? I've got it all worked out, Dobbs whispered, gripping the side of Orr's cot with white-knuckled hands to constrain them from waving. Thursday morning, when he's due back from that goddamn farmhouse of his in the hills, I'll sneak up through the woods to that hairpin turn in the road and hide in the bushes. He has to slow down there, and I can watch the road in both directions to make sure there's no one else around. When I see him coming, I'll shove a big log out into the road to make him stop his jeep. Then I'll step out of the bushes with my luger and shoot him in the head until he's dead. I'll bury the gun, come back down through the woods to the squadron, and go about my business just like everybody else. What could possibly go wrong? Yasarian had followed each step attentively. Where do I come in? he asked in puzzlement. I couldn't do it without you, Dobbs explained. I need you to tell me to go ahead. Yasarian found it hard to believe him. Is that all you want me to do? Just tell you to go ahead? That's all I need from you, Dobbs answered. Just tell me to go ahead, and I'll blow his brains out all by myself the day after tomorrow. His voice was accelerating with emotion and rising again. I'd like to shoot Colonel Corn in the head, too, while we're at it, although I'd like to spare Major Danby, if that's all right with you. Then I'd murder Appleby and Havermeyer also, and after we finish murdering Appleby and Havermeyer, I'd like to murder McWatt. McWatt? cried Yossarian, almost jumping up in horror. McWatt's a friend of mine. What do you want from McWatt? I don't know, Dobbs confessed with an air of floundering embarrassment. I just thought that as long as we were murdering Appleby and Havermeyer, we might as well murder McWatt, too. Don't you want to murder McWatt? Yossarian took a firm stand. Look, I might keep interested in this if you stop shouting it all over the island and if you stick to killing Colonel Cathcart. But if you're going to turn this into a bloodbath, you can forget about me. All right, all right, Dobbs sought to placate him. Just Colonel Cathcart, huh? Should I do it? Tell me to go ahead. Yossarian shook his head. I don't think I could tell you to go ahead. Dobbs was frantic. I I'm willing to compromise, he pleaded vehemently. You don't have to tell me to go ahead. Just t tell me it's a good idea, okay? Is it a good idea? Yossarian still shook his head. It would have been a great idea if you had gone ahead and done it without even speaking to me. Now it's too late. I don't think I can tell you anything. Give me some more time. I, I might change my mind. Then it will be too late. Yossarian kept shaking his head. Dobbs was disappointed. He sat for a moment with a hangdog look, then spurted to his feet suddenly and stamped away to have another impetuous crack at persuading Dr. Nika to ground him, knocking over Yossarian's washstand with his hip when he lurched around and tripping over the fuel line of the stove Orr was still constructing. Dr. Nika withstood Dobbs' blustering and gesticulating attack with a series of impatient nods and sent him to the medical tent to describe his symptoms to Gus and Wes, who painted his gums purple with gentian violet solution the moment he started to talk. They painted his toes purple, too, and forced a laxative down his throat when he opened his mouth again to complain, and then they sent him away. Dobbs was in even worse shape than Hungry Joe, who could at least fly missions when he was not having nightmares. Dobbs was almost as bad as Ower, who seemed happy as an undersized grinning lark with his deranged and galvanic giggle and shivering warped buck teeth, and who was sent along for a rest leave with Milo and Yossarian on the trip to Cairo for eggs when Milo bought cotton instead and took off at dawn for Istanbul with his plane packed to the gun turrets with exotic spiders and unripened red bananas. Orr was one of the homeliest freaks Yossarian had ever encountered, and one of the most attractive. He had a raw, bulgy face with hazel eyes squeezing from their sockets like matching brown halves of marble, and thick, wavy, party-colored hair sloping up to a peak on the top of his head like a pomaded pup tent. Orr was knocked down into the water or had an engine shot out almost every time he went up, and he began jerking on Yossarian's arm like a wild man after they had taken off for Naples and come down in Sicily to find the scheming, cigar-smoking ten-year-old pimp with the two twelve-year-old virgin sisters waiting for them in town in front of the hotel in which there was room for only Milo. 
Eusarion pulled back from Orr adamantly, gazing with some concern and bewilderment at Mount Etna instead of Mount Vesuvius, and wondering what they were doing in Sicily instead of Naples, as Orr kept entreating him in a tittering, stuttering, concupiscent turmoil to go along with him behind the scheming ten-year-old pimp to his two twelve-year-old virgin sisters, who were not really virgins and not really sisters, and who were really only twenty-eight. Go with him, Milo instructed Eusarian laconically. Remember your mission. All right, Eusarian yielded with a sigh, remembering his mission. But at least let me try to find a hotel room first so I can get a good night's sleep afterward. You'll get a good night's sleep with the girls, Milo replied with the same air of intrigue. Remember your mission. But they got no sleep at all for Eusarion and Orr found themselves jammed into the same double bed with the two twelve-year-old, twenty-eight-year-old prostitutes, who turned out to be oily and obese, and who kept waking them up all night long to ask them to switch partners. Eusarion's perceptions were soon so fuzzy that he paid no notice to the beige turban the fat one crowding into him kept wearing until late the next morning, when the scheming ten-year-old pimp with the Cuban panatella snatched it off in public in a bestial caprice that exposed in the brilliant Sicilian daylight her shocking, misshapen, and denudate skull. Vengeful neighbors had shaved her hair to the gleaming bone because she had slept with Germans. The girl screeched in feminine outrage and waddled comically after the scheming ten-year-old pimp, her grisly, bleak, violated scalp slithering up and down ludicrously around the queer, darkened wart of her face, like something bleached and obscene. Eusarion had never laid eyes on anything so bare before. The pimp spun the turban high on his finger like a trophy, and kept himself skipping inches ahead of her fingertips as he led her in a tantalizing circle around the square, congested with people who were howling with laughter and pointing to Eusarion with derision, when Milo strode up with a grim look of haste and puckered his lips reprovingly at the unseemly spectacle of so much vice and frivolity. Milo insisted on leaving at once for Malta. We are sleepy, Orr whined. That's your own fault, Milo censured them both self-righteously. If you had spent the night in your hotel room instead of with these immoral girls, you'd both feel as good as I do today. You told us to go with them, Eusarian retorted accusingly. And we didn't have a hotel room. You were the only one who could get a hotel room. Well, that wasn't my fault either, Milo explained haughtily. How was I supposed to know all the buyers would be in town for the chickpea harvest? You know it, Eusarian charged. That explains why we're here in Sicily instead of Naples. You probably got the whole damned plane filled with chickpeas already. Shh! Milo cautioned sternly with a meaningful glance toward Orr. Remember your mission. The bomb bay, the rear and tail sections of the plane, and most of the top turret gunner's section were all filled with bushels of chickpeas when they arrived at the airfield to take off from Malta. Eusarian's mission on the trip was to distract Orr from observing where Milo bought his eggs, even though Orr was a member of Milo's syndicate and, like every other member of Milo's syndicate, owned a share. His mission was silly, Osarian felt, since it was common knowledge that Milo bought his eggs in Malta for seven cents apiece and sold them to the mess halls in his syndicate for five cents apiece. I just don't trust him, Milo brooded in the plane, with a backward nod toward Orr, who was curled up like a tangled rope on the low bushels of chickpeas trying torturedly to sleep. And I'd just as soon buy my eggs when he's not around to learn my business secrets. What else don't you understand? Yossarian was riding beside him in the co-pilot seat. I don't understand why you buy eggs for seven cents apiece in Malta and sell them for five cents. I do it to make a profit. But how can you make a profit? You'll lose two cents an egg. But I make a profit of three and a quarter cents an egg by selling them for four and a quarter cents an egg to the people in Malta I buy them from for seven cents an egg. Of course, I don't make the profit. The syndicate makes the profit, and everybody has a share. Yossarian felt he was beginning to understand. And the people you sell the eggs to at four and a quarter cents a piece make a profit of two and three quarter cents a piece when they sell them back to you at seven cents a piece. Is that right? Why don't you sell the eggs directly to you and eliminate the people you buy them from? Because I'm the people I buy them from, Milo explained. I make a profit of three and a quarter cents apiece when I sell them to me, and a profit of two and three quarter cents apiece when I buy them back from me. That's a total profit of six cents an egg. 
I lose only two cents an egg when I sell them to the mess halls at five cents apiece, and that's how I can make a profit buying eggs for seven cents apiece and selling them for five cents apiece. I pay only one cent apiece at the hen when I buy them in Sicily. In Malta, Yossarian corrected. You buy your eggs in Malta, not Sicily. Milo chortled proudly. I don't buy eggs in Malta, he confessed, with an air of slight and clandestine amusement that was the only departure from industrious sobriety Yossarian had ever seen him make. I buy them in Sicily for one cent apiece and transfer them to Malta secretly at four and a half cents apiece in order to get the price of eggs up to seven cents apiece when people come to Malta looking for them. Why do people come to Malta for eggs when they're so expensive there? Because they've always done it that way. Why don't they look for eggs in Sicily? Because they've never done it that way. Now I really don't understand. Why don't you sell your mess halls the eggs for seven cents apiece instead of a five cents apiece? Because my mess halls would have no need for me then. Anyone could buy seven cents apiece eggs for seven cents apiece. Why don't they bypass you and buy the eggs directly from you in Malta at four and a quarter cents apiece? Well, because I wouldn't sell it to them. Why wouldn't you sell it to them? Because then there wouldn't be as much room for profit. At least this way I can make a bit for myself as a middleman. Then you do make a profit for yourself, Yossarian declared. Of course I do. But it all goes to the syndicate, and everybody has a share. Don't you understand? It's exactly what happens with those plum tomatoes I sell to Colonel Cathcart. Buy, Yossarian corrected him. You don't sell plum tomatoes to Colonel Cathcart and Colonel Corn. You buy plum tomatoes from them. No. Sell, Milo corrected Yossarian. I distributed my plum tomatoes in markets all over Pianosa under an assumed name so that Colonel Cathcart and Colonel Corn can buy them up from me under their assumed names at four cents apiece and sell them back to me the next day for the syndicate at five cents apiece. They make a profit of one cent apiece, I make a profit of three and a half cents apiece, and everybody comes out ahead. Everybody but the syndicate, said Yossarian with a snort. The syndicate is paying five cents apiece for plum tomatoes that cost you only half a cent apiece. How does the syndicate benefit? The syndicate benefits when I benefit, Milo explained, because everybody has a share. And the syndicate gets Colonel Cathcart's and Colonel Corn's support so that they'll let me go out on trips like this one. You'll see how much profit that can mean in about fifteen minutes when we land in Palermo. Malta, Yossarian corrected him. We're flying to Malta now, not Palermo. No, we're flying to Palermo, Milo answered. There's an endive exporter in Palermo I have to see for a minute about a shipment of mushrooms to burn that were damaged by mold. Milo, how do you do it? Yossarian inquired with laughing amazement and admiration. You fill out a flight plane for one place and then you go to another. Don't the people in the control towers ever raise hell? They all belong to the syndicate, Milo said. And they know that what's good for the syndicate is good for the country because that's what makes Sammy run. The men in the control towers have a share too. And that's why they always have to do whatever they can to help the syndicate. Do I have a share? Everybody has a share. Does Orr have a share? Everybody has a share. And Hungry Joe, he has a share, too? Everybody has a share. Well, I'll be damned, mused Yossarian, deeply impressed with the idea of a share for the very first time. Milo turned toward him with a faint glimmer of mischief. I have a surefire plan for cheating the federal government out of six thousand dollars. We can make three thousand dollars apiece without any risk to either of us. Are you interested? No. Milo looked at Yossarian with profound emotion. That's what I like about you, he exclaimed. You're honest. You're the only one I know that I can really trust. That's why I wish you'd try to be of more help to me. I really was disappointed when you ran off of those two tramps in Catania yesterday. Yossarian stared at Milo in quizzical disbelief. Milo, you told me to go with them, don't you remember? Well, that wasn't my fault, Milo answered with dignity. I had to get rid of Orr some way once we reached town. It will be a lot different in Palermo. When we land in Palermo, I want you and Orr to leave with the girls right from the airport. With what girls? I radioed ahead and made arrangements with a four-year-old pimp to supply you and Orr with two eight-year-old virgins who are half Spanish. He'll be waiting at the airport in a limousine. Go right in as soon as you step out of the plane. Nothing doing, said Yossarian, shaking his head. The only place I'm going is to sleep. Milo turned livid with indignation his slim, long nose flickering spasmodically between his black eyebrows and his unbalanced orange-brown mustache like the pale, thin flame of a single candle. Yossarian, remember your mission, he reminded reverently. 
To hell with my mission, Yossarian responded indifferently. And to hell with the syndicate, too, even though I do have a share. I don't want any eight-year-old virgins, even if they are half Spanish. I don't blame you. But these eight-year-old virgins are really only thirty-two. And they're not really half Spanish, but only one-third Estonian. I don't care for any virgins. And they're not even virgins, Milo continued persuasively. The one I picked out for you was married for a short time to an elderly school teacher who slept with her only on Sundays, so she's really almost as good as new. But Orr was sleepy too, and Eusarian and Orr were both at Milo's side when they rode into the city of Palermo from the airport and discovered that there was no room for the two of them at the hotel there either, and more important, that Milo was mayor. The weird, implausible reception from Milo began at the airfield, where civilian laborers who recognized him halted in their duties respectively to gaze at him with full expressions of controlled exuberance and adulation. News of his arrival preceded him into the city, and the outskirts were already crowded with cheering citizens as they sped by in their small, uncovered truck. Yossarian and Orr were mystified and mute and pressed close against Milo for security. Inside the city, the welcome for Milo grew louder as the truck slowed and eased deeper toward the middle of town. Small boys and girls had been released from school and were lining the sidewalks in new clothes, waving tiny flags. Yossarian and Orr were absolutely speechless now. The streets were jammed with joyous throngs, and strung overhead were huge banners bearing Milo's picture. Milo had posed for these pictures in a drab peasant's blouse with a high collar, and his scrupulous paternal countenance was tolerant, wise, critical, and strong, as he stared out at the populace omnisciently with his undisciplined mustache and disunited eyes. Sinking invalids blew kisses to him from windows. Aproned shopkeepers cheered ecstatically from the narrow doorways of their shops. Tubas crumped. Here and there a person fell and was trampled to death. Sobbing old women swarmed through each other frantically around the slow-moving truck to touch Milo's shoulder or press his hand. Milo bore the tumultuous celebrations with benevolent grace. He waved back to everyone in elegant reciprocation and showered generous handfuls of foil-covered Hershey kisses to the rejoicing multitudes. Lines of lusty young boys and girls skipped along behind him with their arms linked, chanting in hoarse and glassy-eyed adoration, Milo! 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 Now that his secret was out, Milo relaxed with Eusarian and Orr and inflated opulently with a vast, shy pride. His cheeks turned flesh-colored. Milo had been elected mayor of Palermo and of nearby Carini, Monreale, Bagheria, Termini Marese, Cefalu, Mistretta, and Nicosia as well, because he had brought scotch to Sicily. Eusarian was amazed. The people here like to drink scotch that much? They don't drink any of the scotch, Milo explained. Scotch is very expensive, and these people here are very poor. Then why do you import it to Sicily if nobody drinks any? To build up a price. I move the scotch here from Malta to make more room for profit when I sell it back to me for somebody else. I created a whole new industry here. Today, Sicily is the third largest exporter of scotch in the world, and that's why they elected me mayor. How about getting us a hotel room if you're such a hot shot? Or grumbled impertinently in a voice slurred with fatigue. Milo responded contritely. That's just what I'm going to do, he promised. I'm really sorry about forgetting to radio ahead for hotel rooms for you two. Come along to my office and I'll speak to my deputy mayor about it right now. Milo's office was a barber shop, and his deputy mayor was a pudgy barber, from whose obsequious lips cordial greetings foamed as effusively as the lather he began whipping up in Milo's shaving cup. Well, Vittorio, said Milo, settling back lazily in one of Vittorio's barber chairs, how are things in my absence this time? Very sad, Signor Milo, very sad. But now that you are back, the people are all happy again. I was wondering about the size of the crowds. How come all the hotels are full? Because so many people from other cities are here to see your Signor Milo, and because we have all the buyers who have come into town for the artichoke auction. Milo's hand soared up perpendicularly like an eagle and arrested Vittorio's shaving brush. What's artichoke? he inquired. Artichoke, Signor Milo, and artichoke is a very tasty vegetable that is popular everywhere. 
You must try some artichokes while you are here, Signor Millo. We grow the best in the world. Really? said Milo. How much are artichokes selling for this year? It looks like a very good year for artichokes. The crops were very bad. Is that a fact? mused Milo, and was gone, sliding from his chair so swiftly that his striped barber's apron retained his shape for a second or two after he had gone before it collapsed. Milo had vanished from sight by the time Yossarian and Orr rushed after him to the doorway. Next, barked Milo's deputy mayor officiously. Who's the next?